Time Warner Audiobooks presents A Darkness More Than Night by Michael Connolly Narrated by Richard M. Davidson Time Warner Audiobooks presents A Darkness More Than Night Written by Michael Connolly and read by Richard M. Davidson Prologue. Bosch looked through the small square of glass and saw that the man was alone in the tank. He took his gun out of its holster and handed it to the watch sergeant. Standard procedure. The steel door was unlocked and slid open. Immediately, the smell of sweat and vomit stung Bosch's nostrils. How long has he been in here? About three hours, said the sergeant. Bosch stepped into the holding tank and kept his eyes on the prone form on the floor. All right, you can close it. Let me know. The door was slid closed with a jarring bang and jolt. The man on the floor groaned and moved only slightly. Bosch walked over and sat down on the bench nearest to him. He took the tape recorder out of his jacket pocket and put it down on the bench. He glanced up at the glass window and saw the sergeant's face move away. He used the toe of his shoe to probe the man's side. The man groaned again. Wake up, you piece of shit. The man on the floor of the tank slowly rolled his head and then lifted it. Paint flecked his hair, and vomit had caked on the front of his shirt and neck. He opened his eyes and immediately closed them against the harsh overhead lighting of the holding tank. His voice came out in a hoarse whisper. You again? Bosch nodded. Yeah, me. A little dance. A smile cut across the three-day-old whiskers on the drunk's face. Bosch saw that he was missing a tooth he hadn't been missing the last time. He reached down and put his hand on the recorder, but did not turn it on yet. Get up. It's time to talk. Forget it, man. I don't want... You're running out of time. Talk to me. Leave me the fuck alone. Bosch looked up at the window. It was clear. He looked back down at the man on the floor. Your salvation is in the truth. Now more than ever. I can't help you without the truth. Are you a priest now? You here to take my confession? Are you here to give it? The man on the floor said nothing. After a while, Bosch thought he might have fallen back asleep. He pushed the toe of his shoe into the man's side again, into the kidney. The man erupted in movement, flailing his arms and legs. Fuck you! He yelled, I don't want you, I want a lawyer. Bosch was silent a moment. He picked up the recorder and slid it back into his pocket. He then leaned forward, elbows on his knees, and clasped his hands together. He looked at the drunk and slowly shook his head. And I guess I can't help you, he said. He stood up and looked at the window for the watch sergeant. He left the man lying on the floor. Chapter One Someone's coming. Terry McCaleb looked at his wife and then followed her eyes down to the winding road below. He could see the golf cart making its way up the steep and winding road to the house. The driver was obscured by the roof of the cart. They were sitting on the back deck of the house he and Graciela had rented up on La Mesa Avenue. The view ranged from the narrow winding road below the house to the whole of Avalon and its harbor, and then out across the Santa Monica Bay to the haze of smog that marked overland. The view had been the reason they'd chosen this house to make their new home on the island. But at the moment his wife had spoken, his gaze had been on the baby in his arms, not the view. He could look no farther than his daughter's wide, blue, and trusting eyes. McCaleb saw the rental number on the side of the golf cart passing below. It wasn't a local coming. 
It was somebody who had probably come from overland on the Catalina Express. Still, he wondered about how Graciela knew that the visitor was coming to their house and not any of the others on La Mesa. He didn't ask about this. She'd had premonitions before. He just waited, and soon after the golf cart disappeared from sight, there was a knock at the front door. Graciela went to answer it and soon came back to the deck with a woman McCaleb hadn't seen in three years. Sheriff's Detective Jay Winston smiled when she saw the child in his arms. It was genuine, but at the same time, it was the distracted smile of someone who wasn't there to admire a new baby. McCaleb knew the thick green binder she carried in one hand and the video cassette in the other meant Winston was there on business, death business. Terry, how you been? she asked. Couldn't be better. You remember Graciela? Of course. And who's this? This is Cece. McCaleb never used the baby's formal name around others. He only liked to call her Cielo when he was alone with her. Cece, Winston said, and hesitated as if waiting for an explanation of the name. When none came, she said, How old? Almost four months. She's big. Wow, yeah, I can see. And the boy, where's he? Raymond, Graciela said. He's with some friends today. Terry had a charter, and so he went with friends to the park to play softball. The conversation was halting and strange. Winston either wasn't really interested or was unused to such banal talk. Would you like something to drink? McCaleb offered as he passed the baby to Graciela. No, I'm fine. I had a Coke on the boat. As if on cue, or perhaps indignant about being passed from one set of hands to another, the baby started to fuss, and Graciela said she would take her inside. She left them then, standing on the porch. McCaleb pointed to the round table and chairs where they ate most nights while the baby slept. Let's sit down. He pointed Winston to the chair that would give her the best view of the harbor. She put the green binder, which McCaleb recognized as a murder book, on the table and the video on top of it. Beautiful, she said. Yeah, she's amazing. I could watch her all. He stopped and smiled. When he realized she was talking about the view, not his child. Winston smiled, too. She's beautiful, too, Terry. She really is. You look good, too, so tan and all. I've been going out on the boat, and your health is good. Can't complain about anything other than all the pills they make me take. But I'm three years in now and no problems. I think I'm in the clear, Jay. I just have to keep taking the damn pills, and it should stay that way. He smiled, and he did appear to be the picture of health. As the sun had turned his skin dark, it had worked to the opposite effect on his hair. Close-cropped and neat, it was almost blonde now. Working on the boat had also defined the muscles of his arms and shoulders. The only giveaway was hidden under his shirt, the ten-inch scar left by transplantation surgery. That's great, Winston said. It looks like you have a wonderful setup here. New family, new home, away from everything. She was silent a moment, turning her head as if to take in all of the view in the island and McCaleb's life at once. McCaleb always thought Jay Winston was attractive in a tomboyish way. She had loose, sandy blonde hair that she kept at shoulder length. She had never worn makeup back when he worked with her. But she had sharp, knowing eyes and an easy and somewhat sad smile as if she saw the humor and tragedy and everything at once. She wore black jeans and a white T-shirt beneath a black blazer. She looked cool and tough, and McCaleb knew from experience that she was. She had a habit of hooking her hair behind her ear frequently as she spoke. He found that endearing for some unknown reason. He'd always thought that if he hadn't connected with Graciela, he might have tried to know Jay Winston better. He also sensed that Winston intuitively knew that. Makes me feel guilty about why I came, 
she said. Sort of. McCaleb nodded at the binder and the tape. You came on business. You could have just called, Jay. Saved some time, probably. No, you didn't send out any change of address or phone cards. Like maybe you didn't want people to know where you ended up. She hooked her hair behind her left ear and smiled again. Not really, he said. I just didn't think people would want to know where I was. So how did you find me? Passed around over at the marina on the mainland. Overland. They call it overland here. Overland, then. They told me in the harbor master's office that you still kept a slip there, but you moved the boat over here. I came over and took a water taxi around the harbor until I found it. Your friend was there. He told me how to get up here. Buddy. McCaleb looked down into the harbor and picked out the following sea. It was about a half mile or so away. He could see Buddy Lockridge bent over in the stern. After a few moments, he could tell that Buddy was washing off the reels with the hose from the freshwater tank. So what's this about, Jay? McCaleb said without looking at Winston. Must be important for you to go through all of that on your day off. I assume you're off on Sundays. Most of them. She pushed the tape aside and opened the binder. Now McCaleb looked over. Although it was upside down to him, he could tell the top page was a standard homicide occurrence report, usually the first page in every murder book he'd ever read. It was the starting point. His eyes went to the address box. Even upside down, he could make out that it was a West Hollywood case. I've got a case here I was hoping you'd take a look at. In your spare time, I mean. I think it might be your sort of thing. I was hoping you'd give me a read, maybe point me someplace I haven't been yet. He had known, as soon as he had seen the binder in her hands, that this was what she was going to ask him. But now that it had been asked, he felt a confusing rush of sensations. He felt a thrill at the possibility of having a part of his old life again. He also felt guilt over the idea of bringing death into a home so full of new life and happiness. He glanced toward the open slider to see if Graciella was looking out at them. She wasn't. My sort of thing, he said. If it's a serial, you shouldn't waste time. Go to the bureau, call Maggie Griffin. She'll... I did all of that, Terry. I still need you. How old is this thing? Two weeks. Her eyes looked up from the binder to his. New Year's Day? She nodded. First murder of the year, she said. For L.A. County, at least. Some people think the true millennium didn't start until this year. You think this is a millennium nut? Whoever did this was a nut of some order, I think. That's why I'm here. What did the Bureau say? Did you take this to Maggie? You haven't kept up, Terry. Maggie was sent back to Quantico. Things slowed down in the last few years out here, and behavioral sciences pulled her back. No outpost in L.A. anymore. So, yes, I talked to her. But over the phone at Quantico. She ran it through the computer and got zilched. As far as a profile goes or anything else, I'm on a waiting list. Do you know that across the country there were 34 millennium-inspired murders on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day? So they have their hands full at the moment, and the bigger departments like us were at the end of the line because the Bureau figures the smaller departments with less experience and expertise and manpower need their help more. She waited a moment while letting McCaleb consider all of this. He understood the Bureau's philosophy. It was a form of triage. I don't mind waiting a month or so until Maggie or somebody else over there can work something up for me. But my gut on this one tells me time is a consideration, Terry. If it is a serial, a month may be too long to wait. That's why I thought of coming to you. I am banging my head on the wall on this one, and you might be our last best hope of coming up with something to move on now. I still remember the cemetery man and the code killer. I know what you can do with a murder book, 
and some crime scene tape. The last few lines were gratuitous, and her only false move so far, McCaleb thought. Otherwise, he believed she was sincere in the expression of her belief that the killer she was looking for might strike again. It's been a long time for me, Jay, McCaleb began. Other than that thing with Graciela's sister, I haven't been involved in... Come on, Terry, don't bullshit me, okay? You can sit here with a baby in your lap every day of the week, and it still won't erase what you were and what you did. I know you. We haven't seen each other or talked in a long time, but I know you. And I know that not a day goes by that you don't think about cases. Not a day. She paused and stared at him. When they took out your heart, they didn't take out what makes you tick. Know what I mean? McCaleb looked away from her and backed down at his boat. Buddy was now sitting in the main fighting chair, his feet up on the transom. McCaleb assumed he had a beer in his hand, but it was too far to see that. If you're so good at reading people, what do you need me for? I may be good, but you're the best I ever knew. Hell, even if they weren't backed up till Easter in Quantico, I'd take you over any of those profilers. I mean that. You were okay, Jay. We don't need a sales pitch, okay? My ego's doing okay without all the... Then what do you need? He looked back at her. Just some time. I need to think about this. I'm here because my gut says I don't have much time. McCaleb got up and walked to the railing. His gaze was out to the sea. A Catalina Express ferry was coming in. He knew it would be almost empty. The winter months brought few visitors. The boat's coming in, he said. It's the winter schedule, Jay. You better catch it going back or you'll be here all night. I'll have dispatch send a chopper for me if I have to. Terry, all I need from you is one day at the most. One night even. Tonight. You sit down, read the book, look at the tape, and then call me in the morning, tell me what you see. Maybe it's nothing, or at least nothing that's new. But maybe you'll see something we've missed, or you'll get an idea we haven't come up with yet. That's all I'm asking. I don't think it's a lot. McCaleb looked away from the incoming boat and turned so his back leaned against the rail. It doesn't seem like a lot to you, because you're in the life. I'm not. I'm out of it, Jay. Even going back into it for a day is going to change things. I moved out here to start over and to forget all the stuff I was good at. To get good at being something else. At being a father and a husband, for starters. Winston got up and walked to the railing. She stood next to him but looked out at the view while he remained facing his home. She spoke in a low voice. If Graciela was listening from somewhere inside, she couldn't hear this. Remember with Graciela's sister what you told me? You told me you got a second shot at life and that there had to be a reason for it. Now you've built this life with her sister and her son and now even your own child. That's wonderful, Terry. I really think so. But that can't be the reason you were looking for. You might think it is, but it's not. Deep down, you know it. You were good at catching these people. Next to that, what is catching fish? McCaleb nodded slightly and was uncomfortable with himself for doing it so readily. Leave the stuff, he said. I'll call you when I can. On the way to the door, Winston looked about for Graciela, but didn't see her. She's probably in with the baby, McCaleb said. Well, tell her I said goodbye. I will. There was an awkward silence the rest of the way to the door. Finally, as McCaleb opened it, Winston spoke. So what's it like, Terry, being a father? It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. His stock answer. He then thought a moment and then added something he'd thought about but never said, not even to Graciela. It's like having a gun to your head all the time. Winston looked confused and maybe even a little concerned. How so? Because I know if anything ever happens to her, anything, then my life is over. She nodded. I think I can understand that. 
she went through the door. She looked rather silly as she left, a seasoned homicide detective riding away in a golf cart. Chapter 2 Sunday dinner with Graciela and Raymond was a quiet affair. They ate white sea bass Michaela had caught with the charter that morning on the back side of the island near the isthmus. His charters always wanted to keep the fish they caught, but then often changed their minds when they got back to the harbor. It was something about the killing instinct in men, Michaela believed. It wasn't enough just to catch their quarry. They must kill it as well. It meant fish was often served at dinner at the house on La Mesa. McCaleb had grilled the fish along with corn still in the husks on the porch barbecue. Graciela had made a salad and biscuits. They both had a glass of white wine in front of them. Raymond had milk. The meal was good, but the silence wasn't. McCaleb looked over at Raymond and realized the boy had picked up on the vibe passed between the adults and was going along with the tide. McCaleb remembered how he'd done the same thing when he was a boy, and his parents were throwing silence at each other. Raymond was the son of Graciela's sister, Gloria. His father had never been part of the picture. When Gloria died, was murdered three years before, Raymond came to live with Graciela. McCaleb met them both when he investigated the case. How was softball today? McCaleb finally asked. He was okay, I guess. Get any hits? No. You will. Don't worry. Just keep trying. Keep swinging. McCaleb nodded. The boy had wanted to go out on the charter that morning, but hadn't been allowed. The charter was for six men from Overland. With McCaleb and Buddy, that made eight on the following sea, and that was the limit the boat could carry under the rules of safety. McCaleb never broke those rules. Well, listen. Our next charter isn't until Saturday. Right now, it's only four people. In the winter season, I doubt we'll pick up anybody else. If it stays that way, you can come. The boy's dark features seemed to lighten, and he nodded vigorously as he worked his fork into the pure white meat of the fish on his plate. The fork looked big in his hand, and McCaleb felt a momentary sadness for the boy. He was exceedingly small for a boy of ten. This bothered Raymond an awful lot and he often asked McCaleb when he would grow. McCaleb always told him that it would happen soon, though privately he thought the boy would always be small. He knew that his mother had been of average size, but Graciela had told McCaleb that Raymond's father had been a very small man, in size and integrity. He had disappeared before Raymond was born. Always picked last for the team, too small to be competitive with other boys his age, Raymond had gravitated toward pastimes other than team sports. Fishing was his passion, and on off days, McCaleb usually took him out into the bay to fish for halibut. When he had a charter, the boy always begged to go, and when there was room, he was allowed to come along as second mate. It was always McCaleb's great pleasure to put a five-dollar bill into an envelope, seal it, and hand it to the boy at the end of the day. We'll need you in the tower, McCaleb said. This party wants to go down south for Marlin. It'll be a long day. Cool. McCaleb smiled. Raymond loved being the lookout in the tower, watching for black Marlin sleeping or rolling on the surface. And with a pair of binoculars, he was becoming adept at it. McCaleb looked over at Graciela to share the moment, but she was looking down at her plate. There was no smile on her face. In a few more minutes, Raymond was finished eating and asked to be excused so he could play on the computer in his room. Graciela told him to keep the sound down so as not to wake the baby. The boy took his plate into the kitchen, and then Graciela and Michaela were alone. He understood why she was silent. She knew she couldn't voice her objection to his getting involved in an investigation because it had been her own request that he investigate her sister's death that had brought them together three years before. Her emotions were caught in this irony. Graciela, Michaela began, I know you don't want me to do this, but I didn't say that. You didn't have to. I know you, 
and I can tell by the look that's been on your face ever since Jay was here that I just don't want everything to change, that's all. I understand that. I don't want anything to change either, and it won't. All I'm going to do is look at the file and the tape and tell her what I think. It won't be just that. I know you. I've seen you do this. You'll get hooked. It's what you are good at. I won't get hooked. I'll just do what she's asked and that's it. I'm not even going to do it here. I'm going to take what she gave me and go over to the boat. So it won't even be in the house, okay? I don't want it in the house. He knew he was going to do it with or without her approval, but he wanted it from her just the same. Their relationship was still so new that he seemed to always be seeking her approval. He thought about this and wondered if it was something to do with his second chance. He'd fought through a lot of guilt in the past three years, but it still came up like a roadblock every few miles. Somehow he felt as though if he could just win this one woman's approval for his existence, then it would all be okay. His cardiologist had called it survivor's guilt. He'd lived because someone else had died and must now attain some sense of redemption for it. But McCaleb thought the explanation was not as simple as that. Graciella frowned, but it didn't detract from his view of her as beautiful. She had copper skin and dark brown hair that framed a face with eyes so darkly brown that there was almost no demarcation between iris and pupil. Her beauty was another reason he sought her approval of all things. There was something purifying about the light of her smile when it was cast on him. Terry, I listened to you two on the porch, after the baby got quiet. I heard what she said about what makes you tick, and how a day doesn't go by that you don't think about it. What you used to do. Just tell me this, was she right? Michaela was silent a moment. He looked down at his empty plate and then off across the harbor to the lights in the houses going up the opposite hillside to the inn at the top of Mount Ada. He slowly nodded and then looked back at her. Yes, she was right. Then all of this, what we're doing here, the baby, it's all a lie? No, of course not. This is everything to me and I would protect it with everything I've got. But the answer is yes. I think about what I was and what I did. When I was with the Bureau, I saved lives, Graciela, plain and simple. And I took evil out of this world, made it a little less dark out there. He raised his hand and gestured toward the harbor. Now I have a wonderful life with you and Cielo and Raymond, and I... I catch fish for rich people with nothing better to do with their money. So you want both? I don't know what I want. But I know that when she was here, I was saying things to her because I knew you were listening. I was saying what I knew you wanted to hear, but I knew in my heart it wasn't what I wanted. What I wanted to do was open that book right then and go to work. She was right about me, Gracie. She hadn't seen me in three years, but she had me pegged. Graciela stood up and came around the table to him. She sat on his lap. I'm just scared for you, that's all, she said. She pulled him close. McCaleb took two tall glasses from the cabinet and put them on the counter. He filled the first with bottled water and the second with orange juice. He then began ingesting the twenty-seven pills he had lined up on the counter, intermittently taking swallows of water and orange juice to help them go down. Eating the pills, twice a day, was his ritual, and he hated it. Not because of the taste, he was long past that after three years, but because the ritual was a reminder of how dependent he was on exterior concerns for his life. The pills were a leash. He couldn't live long without them. Much of his world now was built around assuring that he would always have them. He planned around them. He hoarded them. Sometimes he even dreamed about taking pills. When he was done, McCaleb went into the living room where Graciella was reading a magazine. She didn't look up at him when he stepped into the room, another sign that she was unhappy with what was suddenly happening in her home. 
He stood there waiting for a moment, and when things didn't change, he went down the hallway into the baby's room. Cielo was still asleep in her crib. The overhead light was on a dimmer switch, and he raised the illumination just enough so that he could see her clearly. Michaela went to the crib and leaned down so he could listen to her breathe and see her and smell her baby's scent. Cielo had her mother's coloring, dark skin and hair, except for her eyes, which were ocean blue. Her tiny hands were balled in fists, as if she was showing her readiness to fight for life. McCaleb fell most in love with her when he watched her sleep. He thought about all the preparation they'd had gone through, the books and classes and advice from Graciela's friends at the hospital who were pediatric nurses. All of it so that they would be ready to care for a fragile life so dependent on them. Nothing had been said or read to prepare him for the opposite. The knowledge that came the first moment he held her, that his own life was now dependent on her. He reached down to her, the spread of his hand covering her back. She didn't stir. He could feel her tiny heart beating. It seemed quick and desperate like a whispered prayer. Sometimes he pulled the rocking chair over next to the crib and watched over her until late into the night. This night was different. He had to go. He had work to do. Blood work. He wasn't sure if he was there to simply say goodbye for the night or to somehow gain an inspiration or approval from her as well. In his mind, it didn't quite make sense. He just knew that he had to watch her and touch her before he went to his work. Caleb walked out on the pier and then down the steps to the skiff dock. He found his Zodiac among the other small boats and climbed aboard, careful to put the videotape and the murder book in the shelter of the inflatable's bow so they wouldn't get wet. He pulled the engine cord twice before it started and then headed off down the middle lane of the harbor. There were no docks in Avalon Harbor. The boats were tied to mooring buoys set in lines that followed the concave shape of the natural harbor. Because it was winter, there were few boats in the harbor, but McCaleb didn't cut between the buoys. He followed the fairways, as if driving a car on the streets of a neighborhood. You didn't cut across lawns. You stayed on the roadway. It was cold on the water, and McCaleb zipped up his windbreaker. As he approached the following sea, he could see the glow of the television behind the curtains of the salon. This meant Buddy Lockridge hadn't finished up in time to catch the last ferry and was staying over. McCaleb and Lockridge worked the charter business together. While the boat's ownership was in Graciela's name, the marine charter license and all other documentation relating to the business was in Lockridge's name. The two had met more than three years earlier, when McCaleb had docked the following sea at Cabrillo Marina in the Los Angeles Harbor, and was living aboard it while restoring it. But he was a neighbor, living on a sailboat nearby. They'd struck up a friendship that ultimately became a partnership. During the busy spring and summer season, Lockridge stayed most nights on the following sea but during the slow times he usually caught a ferry back overland to his own boat at Cabrillo. He seemed to have greater success finding female companions in the overland bars than the handful of places on the island. But Caleb assumed he would be heading back in the morning, since they didn't have a charter for another five days. But Caleb bumped the Zodiac into the fantail of the following sea. He cut the engine and got out with the tape and the binder. He tied the Zodiac off on a stern cleat and headed for the salon door. But he was there waiting, having heard the Zodiac or felt its bump on the fantail. He slid the door open. He held a paperback novel down at his side. McCaleb glanced at the television, but couldn't tell what it was he had on. What's up, Terror? Lockridge asked. Nothing. I just need to do a little work. I'm going to be using the forward bunk, okay? He stepped into the salon. It was warm. Lockridge had the space heater fired up. Sure, fine. Anything I could do to help. Nah, this isn't about the business. 
It's about that lady who came by, the sheriff's lady. McCaleb had forgotten that Winston had come to the boat first and gotten directions from Buddy. Yeah. You working a case for her? No, McCaleb said quickly, hoping to limit Lockridge's interest and involvement. I just need to look at some stuff and give her a call back. Very cool, dude. Not really. It's just a favor. What are you watching? Ah, just some shit on TV. A show about this task force that goes after computer hackers. Why, you seen it? No, but I was wondering if I could borrow the TV for a little while. McCaleb held up the videotape. Lockridge's eyes lit up. Be my guest. Pop that baby in there. Um, not up here, buddy. This is... Detective Winston asked me to do this in confidence. I'll bring the TV back up as soon as I'm done. Lockridge's face registered his disappointment, but McCaleb wasn't worried about it. He went over to the counter that separated the galley from the salon and put down the binder and tape. He unplugged the television and removed it from the locking frame that held it in place so that it wouldn't fall when the boat encountered high seas. The television had a built-in video cassette player and was heavy. McCaleb lugged it down the narrow stairway and took it to the forward stateroom, which had been partially converted into an office. Two sides of the room had been lined with twin bunk beds. The bottom berth on the left had been changed into a desk, and the two top bunks were used by McCaleb to store his old bureau case files. Graciella didn't want them in the house where Raymond might stumble upon them. The only problem was that McCaleb was sure that on occasion Buddy had gone through the boxes and looked at the files, and it bothered him. It was an invasion of some kind. McCaleb had thought about keeping the forward stateroom locked, but knew that could be a deadly mistake. The only ceiling hatch on the lower deck was in the forward room, and access to it should not be blocked in case there was ever a need for an emergency evacuation through the bow. He put the television down on the desk and plugged it in. He turned to go back up to the salon to retrieve the binder and tape when he saw Buddy coming down the stairs, holding the tape and leafing through the binder. Hey, Buddy, looks like a weird one, man. McCaleb reached out and closed the binder, then took it and the tape from his fishing partner's hands. Just taking a peek. I told you, it's confidential. Yeah, but we work good together, just like before. It was true that by happenstance Lockridge had been a great help when McCaleb had investigated the death of Graciela's sister. But that had been an act of street investigation. This was just going to be a review. He didn't need anybody looking over his shoulder. This is different, buddy. This is a one-night stand. I'm just going to take a look at this stuff, and then that will be it. Now let me get to work so I'm not here all night. Lockridge didn't say anything, and McCaleb didn't wait. He closed the door to the forward bunk and then turned to the desk. As he looked down at the murder book in his hands, he felt a sharp thrill as well as the familiar rising of dread and guilt. McCaleb knew it was time to go back to the darkness, to explore it and know it, to find his way through it. He nodded, though he was alone now. It was an acknowledgment that he had waited a long time for this moment. Chapter 3 The video was clear and steady. The lighting was good. The technical aspects of crime scene videotaping had vastly improved since McCaleb's days with the Bureau. The content hadn't changed. What the tape McCaleb watched showed was the starkly lit tableau of murder. McCaleb finally froze the image and studied it. The cabin was silent, the gentle lapping sound of the sea against the boat's hull, the only intrusion from outside. At center focus was the nude body of what appeared to be a man who had been trussed with bailing wire. His arms and legs held tightly behind his torso in such extreme that the body appeared to be in a reverse fetal position. The body was face down on an old and dirty rug. 
The focus was too tight on the body to determine in what sort of location it had been found. McCaleb judged that the victim was a man solely on the basis of body mass and musculature. For the head of the victim was not visible. A gray plastic mop bucket had been placed entirely over the victim's head. McCaleb could see that a length of the bailing wire was stretched taut from the victim's ankles, up his back and between his arms, and beneath the lip of the bucket where it wrapped around his neck. It appeared on first measure to be a ligature strangulation in which the leverage of the legs and feet pulled the wire tight around the victim's neck, causing asphyxia. In effect, the victim had been bound in such a way that he ultimately killed himself when he could no longer hold his legs folded backward in such an extreme position. He continued studying the scene. A small amount of blood had poured onto the carpet from the bucket, indicating that some kind of head wound would be found when the vessel was removed. McCaleb leaned back in his old desk chair and thought about his initial impressions. He hadn't yet opened the binder, choosing instead to watch the crime scene videotape first and study the scene as close as possible to the way the investigators had originally seen it. Already he was fascinated by what he was looking at. He felt the implication of ritual in the scene on the television screen. He also felt the trilling of adrenaline in his blood again. He pressed the button on the remote, and the video continued. The focus pulled back as Jay Winston entered the frame of the video. McCaleb could see more of the room now, and noted that it appeared to be a small, sparely furnished house or apartment. Coincidentally, Winston was wearing the same outfit she had worn when she had come to the house with the murder book and videotape. She had on rubber gloves that she'd pulled up over the cuffs of her blazer. Her detective shield hung on a black shoelace which had been tied around her neck. She took a position on the left side of the dead man while her partner, a detective McCaleb didn't recognize, moved to the right side. For the first time, there was talking on the video. The victim has already been examined by a deputy coroner and released for crime scene investigation, Winston said. The victim has been photographed in situ. We're now going to remove the bucket to make further examination. McCaleb knew that she was carefully choosing her words and demeanor with the future in mind, a future that would include a trial for an accused killer in which the crime scene tape would be viewed by a jury. She had to appear professional and objective, completely emotionally removed from what she was encountering. Anything deviating from this could be cause for a defense attorney to seek removal of the tape from evidence. Winston reached up and hooked her hair behind her ears and then placed both hands on the victim's shoulders and with her partner's help turned the body on its side, the dead man's back to the camera. The camera then came in and went over the victim's shoulder and closed in as Winston gently pulled the bucket handle from under the man's chin and proceeded to carefully lift it off the head. Okay, she said. She showed the interior of the bucket to the camera. Blood had coagulated inside it, and then placed it into an open cardboard box used for evidence storage. She then turned back and gazed down at the victim. Gray duct tape had been wrapped around the dead man's head to form a tight gag across the mouth. The eyes were open and distended, bugged. The cornea of each eye was rouged with hemorrhage. So was the skin around the eyes. C.P., the partner said, pointing to the eyes. Kurt, Winston said, we're on sound. Sorry. She was telling her partner to keep all observations to himself. Again, she was safeguarding the future. McCaleb knew that what her partner was pointing out was the hemorrhaging, or conjunctive petechia, which always came with ligature strangulation. However, the observation was one that should be made to a jury by a medical examiner, not a homicide detective. 
Blood matted the dead man's medium-length hair and had pooled inside the bucket against the left side of his face. Winston began manipulating the head and combing her fingers through the hair in search of the origin of the blood. She finally found the wound on the crown of the head. She pulled the hair back as much as possible to view it. Barney, come in close on this if you can, she said. The camera moved in. McCaleb saw a small round puncture wound that didn't appear to penetrate the skull. He knew that the amount of blood evidenced was not always in concert with the gravity of the wound. Even small, inconsequential wounds to the scalp could produce a lot of blood. He would get a formal and complete description of the wound in the autopsy report. Barn, get this! Winston said, her voice up a notch from the previous monotone. We've got writing or something on the tape, on the gag. She had noticed it while manipulating the head. The camera moved in. McCaleb could make out lightly marked letters on the tape where it crossed the dead man's mouth. The letters appeared to be written in ink, but the message was obliterated by blood. He could make out what appeared to be one word of the message. Cave, he read out loud. Cave? He then thought maybe it was only a partial word, but he couldn't think of any larger word other than cavern that contained those letters in that order. McCaleb froze the picture and just looked. He was enthralled. What he was seeing was pulling him backward in time to his days as a profiler when almost every case he was assigned left him with the same question. What dark, tortured mind did this come from? Words from a killer were always significant and put a case on a higher plane. It most often meant that the killing was a statement, a message transmitted from killer to victim and then from the investigators to the world as well. He stood up and reached to the upper bunk. He pulled down one of the old file boxes and let it drop heavily to the floor. He quickly lifted the lid and began combing through the files for a notebook with some unused pages in it. It had been McCaleb's ritual with the Bureau to start each case he was assigned with a fresh spiral notebook. He finally came across a file with only a bar form and a notebook in it. With so little paperwork in the file, he knew it was a short case and that the notebook should have a good amount of open pages. He leafed through the notebook and found it largely unused. He then took out the Bureau Assistance Request Form and quickly read the top sheet to see what case it was. He immediately remembered it because he'd handled it with one phone call. The request had come from a detective in the small town of White Elk, Minnesota, almost ten years before, when McCaleb still worked out of Quantico. The detective's report said two men had gotten into a drunken brawl in the house they shared, challenged each other to a duel, and proceeded to kill each other with simultaneous shots from ten yards apart in the backyard. The detective needed no help with the double homicide case because it was cut and dried, but he was puzzled by something else. In the course of searching the victim's house, investigators came across something strange in the basement freezer. Pushed into a corner of the freezer cabinet were plastic bags containing dozens and dozens of used tampons. They were of various makes and brands, and preliminary tests on a sampling of the tampons had identified the menstrual blood on them as having come from several different women. The case detective didn't know what he had, but feared the worst. What he wanted from the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit was an idea about what these bloody tampons could mean and how to proceed. More specifically, he wanted to know if the tampons could possibly be souvenirs kept by a serial killer or killers who had gone undiscovered until they happened to kill each other. But Caleb smiled as he remembered the case. He'd come across tampons in a freezer before. He called the detective and asked him three questions. What did the two men do for a living? 
in addition to the firearms used during the duel, were there any long weapons or a hunting license found in the apartment? And lastly, when did bear hunting season begin in the woods of northern Minnesota? The detective's answers quickly solved the tampon mystery. Both men worked at the airport in Minneapolis for a subcontractor that provided clean-out crews that prepared commercial airliners for flights. Several hunting rifles were found in the house, but no hunting license. And lastly, bear season was three weeks away. McCaleb told the detective that it appeared that the men were not serial killers, but had probably been collecting the contents from the tampon disposal receptacles in laboratories of the planes they cleaned. They were taking the tampons home and freezing them. When hunting season began, they would most likely thaw the tampons and use them to bait bear, which can pick up the scent of blood at a great distance. Most hunters use garbage as bait, but nothing is better than blood. But Caleb remembered that the detective had actually seemed disappointed that he had no serial killer or killers at hand. He had either been embarrassed that an FBI agent sitting at a desk in Quantico had so quickly solved his mystery, or he was simply annoyed that there would be no national media ride from his case. He abruptly hung up, and McCaleb never heard from him again. McCaleb tore the few pages of notes from the case out of the notebook, put them in the file with the bar form, and returned the file to its spot. He then put the lid on the box and hoisted it back up onto the shelf that had been the top bunk. He shoved the box back into place, and it banged hard on the bulkhead. Sitting back down, McCaleb glanced at the frozen image on the television screen and then considered the blank page of the notebook. Finally, he took the pen out of his shirt pocket and was about to begin writing when the door to the room suddenly opened and Buddy Lockridge stood there. You okay? What? I heard all this banging. The whole boat moved. I'm fine, Buddy. I just... Oh, shit! What the hell is that? He was staring at the TV screen. McCaleb immediately raised the remote and killed the picture. Buddy, look, I told you this is confidential and I can't... Okay, okay, I know. I was just checking to make sure you didn't keel over or something. Okay, thanks, but I'm fine. I'll be up for a little while if you need something. I won't, but thanks. You know you're using a lot of juice. You're going to have to run the generator tomorrow after I split. No problem. I'll do it. I'll see you later, buddy. Buddy pointed at the now empty television screen. That's a weird one. Goodbye, buddy, McCaleb said impatiently. He got up and closed the door while Lockridge was still standing there. This time he locked it. He returned to the seat in the notebook. He started writing, and in a few moments he had constructed a list. Scene. One. Ligature. Two. Nude. Three. Head wound. Four. Tape. Gag. Cave. Five. Bucket. He studied the list for a few moments, waiting for an idea, but nothing came through. It was too early. Instinctively, he knew the wording on the tape was a key that he wouldn't be able to turn until he had the complete message. He fought the urge to open the murder book and get to it. Instead, he turned the television back on and began running the tape from the spot he'd left off. The camera was in and tight on the dead man's mouth, and the tape stretched tightly across it. We'll leave this for the coroner, Winston said. You got what you can of this barn? I got it, said the unseen videographer. Okay, let's pull back and look at these bindings. The camera traced the bailing wire from the neck to the feet. The wire looped around the neck and passed through a slip knot. It then went down the spine to where it had been wrapped several times around the ankles, which had been pulled so far back that the victim's heels now rested on his buttocks. 
The wrists were bound with a separate length of wire which had been wrapped six times around and then pulled into a knot. The bindings had caused deep furrow marks in the skin of the wrists and ankles, indicating that the victim had struggled for a period before finally succumbing. When the videography of the body was completed, Winston told the unseen man with the camera to make a video inventory of every room in the apartment. The camera panned away from the body and took in the rest of the living room, dining room space. The home seemed to have been furnished out of a second-hand store. There was no uniformity. None of the pieces of furniture matched. The few framed pictures on the walls looked as though they could have come out of a room at a Howard Johnson's ten years before, all orange and aqua pastels. At the far end of the room was a tall china cabinet with no china in it. There were some books on a few of the shelves, but most were barren. On top of the cabinet was something McCaleb found curious. It was a two-foot-high owl that looked to be hand-painted. McCaleb had seen many of these before, especially in Avalon Harbor and Cabrillo Marina. Most often the owls were made of hollow plastic and placed at the top of masts or on the bridges of powerboats in a usually unsuccessful attempt to scare gulls and other birds away from the boats. The theory was that the owl would be seen by the other birds as a predator, and they would stay clear thereby leaving the boats unfouled by their droppings. McCaleb had also seen the owls used on the exteriors of public buildings where pigeons were a nuisance. But what interested him about the plastic owl here was that he had never seen or heard of one being used inside a private home as ornamentation or otherwise. He knew that people collected all manner of things, including owls, but he had so far seen none in the apartment other than the one positioned at center on the cabinet. He quickly opened the binder and found the victim identification report. It listed the victim's occupation as a house painter. McCaleb closed the binder and considered for a moment that perhaps the victim had taken the owl from a job or removed it from a structure while prepping it to be painted. He backed the tape up and watched again as the videographer panned from the body to the cabinet atop which the owl was perched. It appeared to McCaleb that the videographer had made a 180-degree turn, meaning the owl would have been directly facing the victim, looking down upon the scene of the murder. While there were other possibilities, McCaleb's instinct told him the plastic owl was somehow part of the crime scene. He took up the notebook, and made the owl the sixth entry on his list. The rest of the crime scene videotape fostered a little interest in McCaleb. It documented the remaining rooms of the victim's apartment, the bedroom, bathroom, and kitchen. He saw no more owls and took no more notes. When he got to the end of the tape, he rewound it and watched it all the way through once more. Nothing new caught his attention. He ejected the tape and slid it back into its cardboard slipcase. He then carried the television back up to the salon, where he locked it into its frame on the counter. Buddy was sprawled on the couch reading his paperback. He didn't say anything, and McCaleb could tell he was hurt that McCaleb had closed and locked the door to the office on him. He thought about apologizing, but decided to let it go. Buddy was too nosy about McCaleb, past and present. Maybe this rejection would let him know that. What are you reading? he asked instead. A book, Lockridge answered without looking up. But Caleb smiled to himself. Now he was sure that he had gotten to Buddy. Well, there's the TV if you want to watch the news or something. The news is over. But Caleb looked at his watch. It was midnight. He hadn't realized how much time had gone by. This had often been the case with him. While at the bureau, it was routine for him to work through lunch or late into night without realizing it when he became fully engaged in a case. He left Buddy to sulk and went back down to the office. He closed the door again loudly and locked it. Chapter 4 
After turning to a fresh page in his notebook, McCaleb opened the murder book. He snagged open the rings and pulled the documents out and stacked them neatly on the desk. It was a little quirk, but he never liked reviewing cases by turning pages in a book. He liked to hold the individual reports in his hands. He liked squaring off the corners of the whole stack. He put the binder aside and began carefully reading through the investigative summaries in chronological order. Soon he was fully immersed in the investigation. The homicide report came in anonymously to the front desk of the West Hollywood substation of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department at noon on Monday, January 1st. The mail caller said there was a dead man in apartment 2B in the Grand Royal Apartments on Sweetser near Melrose. The caller hung up without giving his name or any other message. Because the call came in on one of the non-emergency lines at the front desk, it was not recorded, and there was no caller ID function on the phone. A pair of patrol deputies were dispatched to the apartment and found the front door slightly ajar. After receiving no answer to their knocks and calls, the deputies entered the apartment and quickly determined that the anonymous caller had given correct information. A man was dead inside. The deputies backed out of the apartment, and the homicide squad was called. The case was assigned to partners Jay Winston and Kurt Mintz, with Winston as lead detective. The victim was identified in the reports as Edward Gunn, a 44-year-old itinerant house painter. He'd lived alone in the Sweetser Avenue apartment for nine years. A computer search for criminal records, or known criminal activity, determined that Gunn had a history of convictions for small-time crimes ranging from soliciting for prostitution and loitering to repeated arrests for public intoxication and drunk driving. He'd been arrested twice for drunk driving in the three months prior to his death, including the morning of December 31st. He posted bail and was released. Less than 24 hours later, he was dead. The records also show an arrest for a serious crime without subsequent conviction. Six years earlier, Gunn had been taken into custody by the Los Angeles Police Department and questioned in a homicide. He was later released, and no charges were ever filed. According to the investigative reports Winston and her partner put into the murder book, there was no apparent robbery of Gunn or his apartment, leaving the motive for his slaying unknown. Other residents in the eight-unit apartment building said that they heard no disturbances in Gunn's apartment on New Year's Eve. Any sounds that might have emanated from the apartment during the murder were likely camouflaged by the sounds of a party being held by one tenant in the apartment directly below Gunn's. The party lasted well into the morning of January 1st. Gunn, according to several party-goers who were interviewed, had not attended the party or been invited. A canvas of the neighborhood, which was primarily lined with small apartment buildings similar to the Grand Royale, found no witnesses who remembered seeing Gunn in the days leading up to his death. All indications were that the murderer had come to Gunn. The lack of damage to doors and windows of the apartment indicated that there'd been no break-in and that Gunn may have very well known his killer. To that end, Winston and Mintz interviewed all known co-workers and associates, as well as every tenant and every person who attended the party at the complex in an effort to draw out a suspect. They got nothing for their effort. They also checked all of the victim's financial records for a clue to a possible monetary motivation and found nothing. Gunn had no steady employment. He mostly loitered around a paint and design store on Beverly Boulevard and offered his services to customers on a day-work basis. He lived a hand-to-mouth existence, making just enough to pay for and maintain his apartment and a small pickup truck in which he carried his painting equipment. Gunn had one living relative, a sister who lived in Long Beach. At the time of his death, he hadn't seen her in more than a year though he happened to call her the night before his death from the holding tank of the LAPD's Hollywood Division station. He was being held there following his DUI arrest. 
The sister reported that she told her brother she could no longer keep helping him and bailing him out. She'd hung up, and she couldn't offer the investigators any useful information in regard to his murder. The incident in which Gunn had been arrested six years before was fully reviewed. Gunn had killed a prostitute in a Sunset Boulevard motel room. He'd stabbed her with her own knife when she attempted to stab and rob him, according to his statement in the report forwarded by the LAPD's Hollywood Division. There were minor inconsistencies between Gunn's original statement to responding patrol officers and the physical evidence, but not enough for the district attorney's office to seek charges against him. Ultimately, the case was reluctantly written off as self-defense and dropped. McCaleb noticed that the lead investigator on the case had been Detective Harry Bosch. Years earlier, McCaleb had worked with Bosch on a case, an investigation he still often thought about. Bosch had been abrasive and secretive at times, but still a good cop with excellent investigative skills, intuition, and instincts. They had actually bonded in some way over the emotional turmoil the case had caused them both. McCaleb wrote Bosch's name down in the notebook as a reminder to call the detective to see if he had any thoughts on the gun case. He went back to reading the summaries. With Gunn's record of prior engagement with a prostitute in mind, Winston's and Mince's next step was to comb through the murder victim's phone records as well as check and credit card purchases for indications that he might have continued to use prostitutes. There was nothing. They cruised Sunset Boulevard with an LAPD vice crew for three nights, stopping and interviewing street prostitutes. But none admitted knowing the man in the photos the detectives had borrowed from Gunn's sister. The detectives scanned the sex want ads in the local alternative papers for an advertisement Gunn might have placed. One more time, their efforts hit a wall. Finally, the detectives took the long shot of tracking the family and associates of the dead prostitute of six years before. Although Gunn had never been charged with the killing, there was still a chance someone believed he hadn't acted in self-defense, someone who might have sought retribution. But this, too, was a dead end. The woman's family was from Philadelphia. They'd lost contact years before. No family member had even come out to claim the body before it was cremated at county taxpayers' expense. There was no reason for them to seek vengeance for a killing six years old when they hadn't cared much about the killing in the first place. The case had hit one investigative dead end after another. A case not solved in the first 48 hours had a less than 50% chance of being cleared. A case unsolved after two weeks was like an unclaimed body in the morgue. It was going to sit there in the cold and the dark for a long, long time. And that was why Winston had finally come to McCaleb. He was the last resort on a hopeless case. Finished with the summaries, McCaleb decided to take a break. He checked his watch and saw it was now almost two. He opened the cabin door and went up to the salon. The lights were off. Buddy had apparently gone to bed in the master cabin without making any noise. McCaleb opened the cold box and looked in. There was a six-pack of beer left over from the charter, but he didn't want that. There was a carton of orange juice and some bottled water. He took the water and went out through the salon door to the cockpit. It was always cool on the water, but this night seemed crisper than usual. He folded his arms across his chest and looked across the harbor and up the hill to the house where he knew his family slept. A single light shone from the back porch. A momentary pang of guilt passed through him. He knew that despite his deep love for the woman and two children behind that light, he would rather be on the boat with the murder book than up there in the sleeping house. He tried to push these thoughts and the questions they raised away, but couldn't completely blind himself to the essential conclusion that there was something wrong with him, something missing. It was something that prevented him from fully embracing that which most men seem to long for. He went back inside the boat. 
he knew that immersing himself in the case reports would shut out the guilt. The autopsy report contained no surprises. The cause of death was, as McCaleb had guessed from the video, cerebral hypoxia due to compression of the carotid arteries by ligature strangulation. The time of death was estimated to have been between midnight and 3 a.m. on January 1st. The deputy medical examiner who conducted the autopsy noted that interior damage to the neck was minimal. Neither the hyoid bone or the thyroid cartilage was broken. This aspect, coupled with the multiple ligature furrows on the skin, led the examiner to conclude that Gunn suffocated slowly while desperately struggling to keep his feet behind his torso so that the wire noose wasn't pulled tight around his neck. The autopsy summation suggested that the victim could have struggled in this position for as long as two hours. McCaleb thought about this and wondered if the killer had been there in the apartment the whole time, watching the dying man struggle. Or had he set the ligature and left before his victim was dead? possibly to set some kind of alibi scheme into motion, perhaps appearing at a New Year's party so that there would be multiple witnesses able to account for him at the time of the victim's death. He then remembered the bucket and decided that the killer had stayed. The covering of the victim's face was a frequent occurrence in sexually motivated and rage killings, the attacker covering his victim's face as a means of dehumanizing the victim and avoiding eye contact. McCaleb had worked dozens of cases where he had noted this phenomena. Women who had been raped and murdered with nightgowns or pillowcases covering their faces. Children with their heads wrapped in towels. He could write a list of examples that would fill the entire notebook. Instead, he wrote one line on the page under Bosch's name. Unsub was there the whole time. He watched. The unknown subject, McCaleb thought. So we meet again. Before moving on, McCaleb looked through the autopsy report for two other pieces of information. First was the head wound. He found a description of the wound in the examiner's comments. The perimortem laceration was circular and superficial. Its damage was minimal and was possibly a defensive wound. McCaleb dismissed the possibility of it being a defensive wound. The only blood on the rug at the crime scene was that spilled from the bucket after it was placed over the victim's head. Plus, the flow of blood from the wound at the point of the crown was forward and over the victim's face. This indicated the head was bowed forward. McCaleb took all of this to mean that Gunn was already bound and on the floor when the blow had been struck to his head, and then the bucket placed over it. His instinct told him this may have been a blow delivered with the intention of hurrying the victim's demise. An impact to the head that would weaken the victim and shorten his struggle against the ligature. He wrote these thoughts down on the notebook and then went back into the autopsy report. He located the findings on the examination of the anus and penis. Swabs indicated no sexual activity had occurred in the time prior to death. Michaela wrote, no sex, down in the notebook. Beneath this, he wrote the word rage and circled it. McCaleb realized that many, if not all, of the suspicions and conclusions he was coming up with were probably already reached by Jay Winston. But this had always been his routine in analyzing murder scenes. He made his own judgments first, then looked to see how they stacked next to the primary investigator's conclusions afterward. After the autopsy, he went to the evidence analysis reports. He first looked at the recovered evidence list and noticed that the plastic owl he had seen on the videotape had not been bagged and tagged. He felt sure that it should have been and made a note of it. Also missing from the list was any mention of a weapon recovery. It appeared that whatever had been used to open up the wound on Gunn's scalp had been taken away from the scene by the killer. 
Caleb made a note of this as well, because it was another piece of information supportive of a profile of the killer as organized, thorough, and cautious. The report on the analysis of the tape used to gag the victim was folded into a separate envelope that McCaleb found in one of the binder's pockets. In addition to a computer printout and an addendum, there were several photographs that showed the full length of the tape after it had been cut and peeled away from the victim's face and head. The first set of photos documented the tape, front and back, as it was found, with a significant amount of coagulated blood obscuring the message written on it. The next set of photos showed the tape front and back after the blood had been removed with a solution of soapy water. McCaleb stared at the message for a long moment, even though he knew he would never be able to decipher it on his own. Cave, cave, dus, vidit. He finally put the photos aside and picked up the accompanying reports. The tape was found to be clear of fingerprints, but several hairs and microscopic fibers were collected from the underside adhesive. The hair was determined to have belonged to the victim. The fibers were held pending further orders for analysis. McCaleb knew this meant there was a time and cost constraint. The fibers would not be analyzed until the investigation reached a point that there were fibers from a suspect's possessions that also could be analyzed and compared. Otherwise, the costly and time-consuming analysis of the collected fibers would be for nothing. McCaleb had seen this sort of investigative prioritizing before. It was a routine in local law enforcement not to take expensive steps until necessary but he was a bit surprised that it hadn't been deemed necessary in this case. He concluded that Gunn's background as a one-time murder suspect may have dropped him into a lower class of victim, one for which the extra step is not taken. Maybe, McCaleb thought, this was why Jay Winston had come to him. She hadn't said anything about paying him for his time, not that he could accept a monetary payment anyway. He moved on to an addendum report that had been filed by Winston. She had taken a photograph of the tape and the message to a linguistics professor at UCLA who had identified the words as Latin. She was then referred to a retired Catholic priest who lived in the rectory at St. Catherine's in Hollywood and had taught Latin at the church's school for two decades until it was dropped from the curriculum in the early 70s. He easily translated the message for Winston. As McCaleb read the translation, he felt the feathery run of adrenaline rise up his spine to his neck. His skin tightened, and he felt a sensation that came close to lightheadedness. Cave, cave, dus videt. Cave, cave, dominus videt. Beware, beware, God sees. Holy shit, McCaleb said quietly to himself. It was not said as an exclamation. Rather, it was the phrase he and fellow Bureau profilers had used to informally classify cases in which religious overtures were part of the evidence. When God was discovered to be part of the probable motivation for a crime, it became a holy shit case when spoken of in casual conversation. It also changed things significantly, for God's work was never done. When a killer was out there using his name as part of the imprint of his crime, it often meant there would be more crime. It was said in the Bureau profiling offices that God's killers never stopped of their own volition. They had to be stopped. McCaleb now understood J. Winston's apprehension about letting this case gather dust. If Edward Gunn was the first known victim, then somebody else was likely in the sights of the killer right now. McCaleb scribbled down a translation of the killer's message and some other thoughts. He wrote, Victim Acquisition 
and underlined it twice. He looked back at Winston's report and noticed that at the bottom of the page containing the translation, there was a paragraph marked with an asterisk. Asterisk. Father Ryan stated that the word deus, as seen on the duct tape, was a short form of deus or dominus, primarily found in medieval Bibles as well as church carvings and other artwork. McCaleb leaned back in his chair and drank from the water bottle. He found this final paragraph the most interesting of the whole package. The information it contained could be a means by which the killer might be isolated in a small group and then found. Initially, the pool of potential suspects was huge. It would essentially include anyone who had access to Edward Gunn on New Year's Eve. But the information from Father Ryan narrowed it significantly to those who had knowledge of medieval Latin or had gotten the word deus and possibly the whole message off of something he had seen, perhaps something in a church. Chapter 5 McCaleb was too jazzed by what he had read and seen to think about sleep. It was 4.30 and he knew he would complete this night awake and in the office. It was probably too early in Quantico, Virginia, for anyone to be in the behavioral science section, but he decided to make the call anyway. He went up to the salon, got the cell phone out of the charger, and punched in the number from memory. When the general operator answered, he asked if he transferred to Special Agent Brasilia Duran's desk. There were a lot of people he could have asked for, but he decided on Duran because they'd worked well together, and often from long distances, when he'd been in the Bureau. Duran also specialized in icon identification and symbology. The call was picked up by a machine, and while listening to Duran's outgoing message, McCaleb quickly tried to decide whether to leave a message or just call back. Initially... He thought it would be better to hang up and try to catch Duran live later, because a personal call is much more difficult to deflect than a taped message. But then he decided to put faith in their former camaraderie, even if he'd been out of the Bureau for nearly five years. Brass, it's Terry McCaleb. Long time no see. Ah, uh, listen, I'm calling because I need a favor. Could you call me back as soon as you get a moment? I'd really appreciate it. He gave the number for his cell phone, thanked her, and hung up. He could take the phone with him back to the house and wait for the call there, but that would mean that Graciella might overhear the conversation with Duran, and he didn't want that. He went back down to the forward bunk and started through the murder book documents again. He checked every page again for something that stood out in its inclusion or exclusion. He took a few more notes and made a list of things he still needed to do, and no before drawing up a profile. But primarily, he was just waiting for Duran. She finally returned his call at 5.30. Long time is right, she said by way of greeting. Too long. How you doing, Brass? Can't complain because nobody listens. I heard you guys are looking for the Drano over there. You're right about that. We are clogged and flogged. You know, last year we sent half the staff to Kosovo to help in the war crimes investigations on six-week rotations. That just killed us. We are still so far behind it's getting critical. McCaleb wondered if she was giving him the woe-is-me pitch so he might not ask the favor he'd mentioned on the message. He decided to go ahead with it anyway. Well, then you aren't going to like hearing from me, he said. Oh, boy, I'm shaking in my boots. What do you need, Terry? I'm doing a favor for a friend out here. Sheriff's Homicide Squad. Taking a look at a homicide and... Did he already run it through here? It's a she. And yeah, she ran it on the Vicap box and got blanked. That's all. She got the word on how backed up you guys are on profiling and came to me instead. I sort of owe her one, so I said I'd take a look. And now you want to cut in line, right? McCaleb smiled. 
and he hoped she was as well on the other end of the line. Sort of, but I think it's a quickie. It's just one thing I want. Then out with it. What? I need an iconography baseline. I'm following a hunch on something. Okay, doesn't sound too involving. What's the symbol? An owl. An owl? Just an owl? More specifically, a plastic owl. But an owl, just the same. I want to know if it's turned up before and what it means. Well, I remember the owl on the bag of potato chips. What's that brand? Wise, I remember. It's an East Coast brand. Well, there you go. The owl is smart. He's wise. Brass, I was hoping for something a little more. I know, I know. Tell you what, I'll see what I can find. The thing to remember is symbols change. What means one thing at one time might mean something completely different at another time. You just looking for contemporary uses and examples? McCaleb thought for a moment about the message on the tape. Can you throw in the medieval time period? Sounds like you got a weird one. But ain't they all? Let me guess. A holy shit case. Could be. How'd you know that? Oh, uh, all that medieval inquisition and church stuff. Seen it before. I've got your number. I'll try to get back today. McCaleb thought about asking her to run an analysis of the message from the duct tape, but decided not to pile it on. Besides, the message must have been included on the computer run Jay Winston completed. He thanked her and was about to disconnect when she asked about his health, and he told her he was fine. You still living on that boat I heard about? Nope. I'm living on an island now, but I still have the boat. I've got a wife and new baby daughter, too. Wow! Is this the Terry TV dinner McCaleb I used to know? Same one, I guess. Well, sounds like you got your stuff together. I think I finally do. Then be careful with it. What are you doing chasing a case again? McCaleb hesitated in his reply. I'm not sure. Don't bullshit me. We both know why you're doing it. Tell you what, let me see what I can find out, and I'll call you back. Thanks, Brass. I'll be waiting. McCaleb went into the master cabin and shook Buddy Lockridge awake. His friend startled and began swinging his arms wildly. It's me, it's me. Before he calmed down, Buddy clapped McCaleb on the side of the head with a book he had fallen asleep holding. What are you doing? he exclaimed. I'm trying to wake you, man. What for? What time is it? It's almost six. I want to take the boat across. Now? Yeah, now. So get up and help me. I'll get the lines. Man, now we're going to hit the lair. Why don't you wait until it burns off? Because I don't have the time. Buddy reached up and turned on the reading lamp that was attached to the cabin wall just above the headboard. McCaleb noticed the book he was reading was called The Wire in the Blood. Something sure put a wire in your blood, man, he said as he rubbed his ear where the book had hit him. Sorry about that. Why are you in such a hurry to cross anyway? It's that case, isn't it? I'll be on top. Let's get it going. McCaleb headed out of the cabin. Buddy called after him as he expected he would. You gonna need a driver? No, buddy. You know I've been driving a couple years now. Yeah, but you might need help with the case, man. I'll be all right. Hurry up, bud. I want to get over there. McCaleb took the key off the hook next to the salon door and went out and climbed up into the bridge. The air was still chilled, and tendrils of dawn light were working their way through the morning mist. He flicked on the Loran radar and started the engines. They turned over immediately. Buddy had taken the boat over to Marina del Rey the week before to have them overhauled. McCaleb left them idling while he climbed back down and went to the fantail. He untied the stern line and then the zodiac and led it around to the bow. He tied the zodiac to the line from the mooring buoy after releasing it from the forward cleat. The boat was free now. He turned in the pulpit and looked up at the bridge just as Buddy his hair a wiry nest from sleep, slid into the pilot's seat. 
Caleb signaled that the boat was loose. Buddy pushed the throttles forward, and the following sea began to move. McCaleb picked the eight-foot gaff pole up off the deck and used it to keep the buoy off the bow as the boat made the turn into the fairway and slowly headed toward the mouth of the harbor. McCaleb stayed in the pulpit, leaning back against the railing and watching the island slip away behind the boat. He looked up once again toward his house and saw only the one light still on. It was too early for his family to be awake. He thought about the mistake he had knowingly just made. He should have gone up to the house and told Graciella what he was doing, tried to explain it. But he knew it would lose him a lot of time, and that he would never be able to explain it to her satisfaction. He decided to just go. He would call his wife after the crossing, and he would deal with the consequences of his decisions later. The cool air of the shark gray dawn had tightened the skin on his arms and neck. He turned in the bow pulpit and looked forward and across the bay to where he knew Overland lay hidden beneath the marine lair. Not being able to see what he knew to be there gave him an ominous feeling, and he looked down. The water the bow cut through was flat and as blue-black as a marlin skin. McCaleb knew he needed to get up into the bridge to help Buddy. One of them would drive while the other kept an eye on the Lawrence screen to chart a safe course to Los Angeles Harbor. Too bad, he thought, that there would be no radar for him to use once he was on land again, and trying to chart his way through the case that now gripped him. A mist of a different kind awaited him there, and these thoughts of trying to see his way through turned his mind to the thing about the case that had hooked him so deeply. Beware, beware, God sees. The words turned in his head like a newfound mantra. There was someone in the cloaking mist ahead who had written those words, someone who had acted on them in an extreme capacity at least once, and who would likely act on them again. But Caleb was going to find that person, and in doing so he wondered whose words would he be acting on. Was there a true God sending him on this journey? He felt a touch on his shoulder and startled and turned, nearly dropping the gaff pole overboard. It was Buddy. Jesus, man, don't do that! You all right? I was till you scared the hell out of me. What are you doing? You should be driving. But Caleb glanced over his shoulder to make sure they were clear of the harbor markers and into the open bay. I don't know, Buddy said. You look like Ahab standing out here with that gaff. I thought something was wrong. What are you doing? I was thinking. Do you mind? Don't sneak up on me like that, man. Well, I guess that makes us even then. Just go drive the boat, buddy. I'll be up in a minute. And check the generator. Might as well juice the batteries. As Buddy moved away, McCaleb felt his heart even out again. He stepped off the pulpit and snapped the gaff back into its clamps on the deck. As he was bent over, he felt the boat rise and fall as it went over a three- or four-foot roller. He straightened up and looked around for the origin of the wake, but he saw nothing. It had been a phantom moving across the flat surface of the bay. Chapter 6 Harry Bosch raised his briefcase like a shield and used it to push his way through the crowd of reporters and cameras gathered outside the doors of the courtroom. Let me through, please, let me through. Most of them didn't move until he used the briefcase to lever them out of the way. They were desperately crowding in and reaching tape recorders and cameras toward the center of the human knot where the defense lawyer was holding court. Bosch finally made it to the door where a sheriff's deputy was pressed against the handle. He recognized Bosch and stepped sideways so he could open the door. You know, Bosch said to the deputy, this is going to happen every day. This guy has more to say outside court than inside. You might want to think about setting up some rules so people can get in and out. As Bosch went through the door, he heard the deputy tell him to talk to the judge about it. He walked down the center aisle and then through the gate to the prosecution table. He was the first to arrive. 
He pulled the third chair out and sat down. He opened his briefcase on the table, took out the heavy blue binder, and put it to the side. He then closed and snapped the briefcase and put it down on the floor next to his chair. He was ready. He leaned forward and folded his arms on top of the binder. The courtroom was still, almost empty except for the judge's clerk and a court reporter who were getting ready for the day. Bosch liked these times, the quiet before the storm. And he knew without a doubt that a storm was surely coming. He nodded to himself. He was ready, ready to dance with the devil once more. He realized that his mission in life was all about moments like these, moments that should be savored and remembered, but that always caused the tight fisting of his guts. There was a loud metallic clacking sound, and the door to the side holding cell opened. Two deputies led a man through the door. He was young and still tan somehow, despite almost three months in lockup. He wore a suit that would easily take the weekly paychecks of the men on either side of him. His hands were cuffed at his sides to a waist chain, which looked incongruous with the perfect blue suit. In one hand he clasped an artist's sketch pad. The other held a black felt-tip pen, the only kind of writing instrument allowed in lockdown. The man was led to the defense table and positioned in front of the middle seat. He smiled and looked forward as the cuffs and the chains were removed. A deputy put a hand on the man's shoulder and pushed him down into the seat. The deputies then moved back and took positions in chairs to the man's rear. The man immediately leaned forward and opened the sketch pad and went to work with his pen. Bosch watched. He could hear the point of the pen scratching furiously on the paper. They don't allow me a charcoal, Bosch. Do you believe that? What threat could a piece of charcoal possibly be? He hadn't looked at Bosch as he said it. Bosch didn't reply. It's the little things like that that bother me the most, the man said. Better get used to it, Bosch said. The man laughed, but still did not look at Bosch. You know, somehow I knew that was exactly what you were going to say. Bosch was quiet. You see, you're so predictable, Bosch. All of you are. The rear courtroom door opened, and Bosch turned his eyes away from the defendant. The attorneys were coming in now. They were about to start. Chapter 7 By the time McCaleb got to the farmer's market, he was thirty minutes late for the meeting with J. Winston. He and Buddy had made the crossing in an hour and a half, and McCaleb had called the sheriff's detective after they tied up at Cabrillo Marina. They arranged to meet, but then he found the battery in the Cherokee dead because the car hadn't been used in two weeks. He had to get Buddy to give him a jump from his old Taurus, and that had taken up the time. He walked into Dupar's, the corner restaurant in the market, but didn't see Winston at any of the tables or the counter. He hoped she hadn't come and gone. He chose an unoccupied booth that afforded the most privacy and sat down. He didn't need to look at a menu. They had chosen the farmer's market to meet because it was near Edward Gunn's apartment and because McCaleb wanted to eat breakfast at Dupar's. He told Winston that more than anything else about Los Angeles, he missed the pancakes at Dupar's. Often when he and Graciela and the children made their once-a-month trip to Overland to buy clothing and supplies not available on Catalina, they ate a meal at Dupar's. It didn't matter whether it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner. McCaleb always ordered pancakes. Raymond did, too. But he was boysenberry, while McCaleb was traditional maple. McCaleb told the waitress he was waiting for another party, but ordered a large orange juice and a glass of water. After she brought the two glasses, he opened his leather bag and took out the plastic pill box. He kept a week's supply of his pills on the boat and another couple days' worth in the glove box of the Cherokee. He'd prepared the box after docking. Alternating gulps of orange juice and water, 
He downed the twenty-seven pills that made up his morning dosage. He knew their names by their shapes and colors and tastes. Prilosec, Demodex, Dejoxin, Bacitracin. As he methodically went through the lineup, he noticed a woman in a nearby booth watching, her eyebrows arched in wonder. He would never get rid of the pills. They were as certain for him as the proverbial death and taxes. Over the years, some would be changed, some subtracted, and new ones added. But he knew he would be swallowing pills and washing away their awful tastes with orange juice for the rest of his life. I see you ordered without me. He looked up from the last three cyclosporine pills he was about to take as Jay Winston slid into the opposite side of the booth. Sorry I'm so late. Traffic on the ten was a complete bitch. It's all right, I was late too. Dead battery. How many of those you take now? I'm down to fifty-four a day. Unbelievable. I had to turn a hallway closet into a medicine cabinet, the whole thing. Well, at least you're still here. She smiled, and McCaleb nodded. The waitress came to the table with a menu for Winston, but she said they had better order. I'll have what he's having. McCaleb ordered a large stack with melted butter. He told the waitress they would share one order of well-done bacon. Coffee? asked the waitress. She looked as though this might have been the one millionth pancake order she had taken. Yes, please, said Winston. Black. McCaleb said he was fine with the orange juice. When they were alone, McCaleb looked across the table at Winston. So, you get hold of a manager? He's going to meet us at 10.30. The place is still vacant, but it has been cleaned. After we released it, the Vic's sister came up and went through his things, took what she wanted. Yeah, I was afraid of something like that. The manager didn't think it was very much. The guy didn't have much. What about the owl? He didn't remember the owl. Frankly, I didn't either until you mentioned it this morning. It's just a hunch. I'd like to take a look at it. Well, we'll see if it's there. What else do you want to do? I hope you didn't come all the way across just to look at the guy's apartment. I was thinking about checking out the sister. And maybe Harry Bosch, too. Winston was silent, but he could tell by her demeanor she was waiting for an explanation. In order to profile an unknown subject, it's important to know the victim, his routines, personality, everything. You know the drill. The sister, and to a lesser extent, Bosch can help with that. I only asked you to look at the book and the tape, Terry. You're going to make me start feeling guilty here. McCaleb paused while the waitress brought Winston's coffee and put down two small glass pitchers containing boysenberry and maple syrup. After she went away, he spoke. You knew I'd get hooked, Jay. Beware, beware, God sees. I mean, come on. You're going to tell me you thought I'd look it all over and phone in the report? Besides, I'm not complaining. I'm here because I want to be. If you feel guilty, you can buy the pancakes. What did your wife say about it? Nothing. She knows it's something I have to do. I called her from the dock after I crossed. It was too late for her to really say anything by then anyway. She just told me to pick up a bag of green corn tamales at El Cholo before I headed back. They sell them frozen. The pancakes came. They stopped talking, and McCaleb politely waited for Winston to choose a syrup first. But she was using a fork to move her pancakes around on her plate, and he finally couldn't wait. He doused his stack with maple syrup and started eating. The waitress came back by and put a check down. Winston quickly grabbed it. The sheriff will pay for this. Tell him thanks. You know, I don't know what you expect from Harry Bosch. He told me he'd only had a handful of contacts with Gunn in the six years since the prostitution case. When were those? When he got popped? Winston nodded as she poured boysenberry syrup on her pancakes. That means he would have seen him the night before he was killed. I didn't see anything about it in the book. I haven't written it up. 
There's not much to it. The watch sergeant called him and told him Gunn was in the drunk tank on a deuce. McCaleb nodded. And? And he came in to look at the guy. That was it. He said they didn't even talk because Gunn was too blitzed. Well, I still want to talk to Harry. I worked a case with him once. He's a good cop, intuitive and observant. He might know something I could use. That is, if you can get to talk to him. What do you mean? You don't know? He's riding the prosecution table on the David Story murder case up in Van Nuys. Don't you watch the news? Ah, damn, I forgot about that. I remember reading his name in the stories after they took Story down. That was, what, in October? They're already in trial? They sure are. No delays, and they didn't need a prelim because they went through the grand jury. They started jury selection right after the first. Last I heard, they had the panel, so openers will probably be this week. Maybe even today. Shit. Yeah, good luck getting to Bosch. I'm sure this is just what he'll want to hear about. Are you saying you don't want me to talk to him? Winston shrugged her shoulders. No, I'm not saying that at all. Do whatever you want to do. I just didn't think you'd be doing so much legwork on this. I can talk to my captain about maybe getting a consulting fee for you, but don't worry about it. The sheriff's buying breakfast. That's enough. Doesn't seem like it. He didn't tell her that he'd worked the case for free, just to be back in the life for a few days. And he didn't tell her that he couldn't take any money from her anyway. If he made any official income... He'd lose his eligibility for the state medical assistance that paid for the 54 pills he swallowed every day. The pills were so expensive that if he had to pay for them himself, he'd be bankrupt inside six months, unless he happened to be drawing a six-figure salary. It was the ugly secret behind the medical miracle that had saved him. He got a second chance at life, just as long as he didn't use it to try to earn a living. It was the reason the charter business was in Buddy Lockridge's name. Officially, McCaleb was an unpaid deckhand. Buddy simply rented the boat for charter from Graciela, the rent being 60% of all charter fees after expenses. How are your pancakes? he asked Winston. The best. Damn right. Chapter 8 the Grand Royale was a two-story eyesore, a deteriorating stucco box whose attempt at style began and ended with the modish design of the letters of its name tacked over the entranceway. The streets of West Hollywood and elsewhere in the flats were lined with such banal designs, the high-density apartments that crowded out smaller bungalow courts in the fifties and sixties. They replaced true style with phony, ornamental flourishes and names that reflected exactly what they were not. McCaleb and Winston entered the second-floor apartment that had belonged to Edward Gunn with the building manager, a man named Rorschach, like the test, only spelled different. If he hadn't known where to look, McCaleb would have missed what was left of the bloodstain on the carpet where Gunn had died. The carpet had not been replaced. Instead, it had been shampooed, leaving only a small, light brown trace stain that would probably be mistaken by the next renter as the remnant of a soda or coffee spill. The place had been cleaned and ready for renting, but the furnishings were the same. McCaleb recognized them from the crime scene video. He looked across the room at the china cabinet, but it was empty. There was no plastic owl perched atop it. He looked at Winston. It's gone. Winston turned to the manager. Mr. Rorschach, the owl that was on top of that cabinet, we think it was important. Are you sure you don't know what happened to it? Rorschach spread his arms wide and then dropped them to his side. No, I don't know. You asked before and I thought, I don't remember any owl, but if you say so. He shrugged his shoulders and jutted his chin, then nodded as if reluctantly agreeing that there had been an owl on the china cabinet. McCaleb read his body language and words as the classic mannerisms of a liar. Deny the existence of the object you've stolen and you eliminate the theft. 
He assumed Winston had picked up on it as well. Jay, you have a phone? Can you call the sister to double-check? I've been holding out until the county buys me one. McCaleb had wanted to keep his phone free in case Brass Duran called back, but put his leather bag down on an overstuffed couch and dug out his phone and handed it to her. She had to get the sister's number out of a notebook in her briefcase. While she made the call, McCaleb walked slowly around the apartment, taking it all in and trying to get a vibe from the place. In the dining area, he stopped in front of the round wooden table with four straight-backed chairs placed around it. The crime scene analysis report said that three of the chairs had numerous smears, partials, and complete latent fingerprints on them, all of them belonging to the victim, Edward Gunn. The fourth chair, the one found on the north side of the table, was completely devoid of fingerprint evidence in any condition. The chair had been wiped down. Most likely, the killer had done this after handling the chair for some reason. McCaleb checked his directions and went to the chair on the north side of the table. Careful not to touch the back of it, he hooked his hand under the seat and pulled it away from the table and over to the china cabinet. He positioned it at the center and then stepped up onto the seat. He raised his arms as if placing something on top of the cabinet. The chair wobbled on its uneven legs, and McCaleb instinctively reached one hand to the top edge of the china cabinet to steady himself. Before he grabbed on, he realized something and stopped himself. He braced his forearm across the frame of one of the cabinet's glass doors instead. Steady there, Terry. He looked down. Winston was standing next to him. His phone was folded closed in her hand. I am. So does she have the bird? No, she didn't know what I was talking about. McCaleb raised himself on his toes and looked over the top edge of the cabinet. She tell you what she did take? Just some clothes and some old photos of them when they were kids. She didn't want anything else. McCaleb nodded. He was still looking up and down the top of the cabinet. There was a thick layer of dust on top. You say anything about me coming down to talk to her? I forgot. I can call her back. You have a flashlight, Jay? She dug through her purse and then handed up a small pen light. McCaleb flicked it on and held it at a low angle to the top of the cabinet. The light made the surface dust more distinct, and he now could clearly see an octagonal-shaped impression that had been left by something that had been put on top of the cabinet in the dust, the base of the owl. He next moved the light along the edges of the top board, then turned it off and got down off the chair. He handed Jay the pen light. Thanks. You might want to think about getting a print team back out here. How come? The owl's not up there, is it? McCaleb glanced at Rorschach for a moment. Nope, it's gone. But whoever put it up there used that chair. When it wobbled, they grabbed a hold. He took a pen out of his pocket and reached up and tapped the front edge of the cabinet in the area he'd seen the finger impressions. It's pretty dusty, but there might be prints. What if it was whoever took the owl? McCaleb looked pointedly at Rorschach when he answered. Same thing. There might be prints. Rorschach looked away. Can I use this again? Winston held up his phone. Go ahead. As Winston called for a print team, McCaleb dragged the chair into the middle of the living room, positioning it a few feet from the blood stain. He then sat down on it and took in the room. In this position, the owl would have looked down on the killer as well as the victim. Some instinct told McCaleb that this was the configuration the killer had wanted. He looked down at the bloodstain and imagined he was looking down at Edward Gunn, struggling for his life and slowly losing the battle. The bucket, he thought. Everything fit but the bucket. The killer had set the stage, but then couldn't watch the play. He needed the bucket so that he wouldn't see his victim's face. It bothered McCaleb that it didn't fit. Winston came over and handed him the phone. 
There's a crew just finishing a break-in on King's. They'll be here in fifteen minutes. That's lucky. Very. What are you doing? Just thinking. I think he sat here and watched, but then couldn't take it. He struck the victim on the head to maybe hurry it up. Then he got the bucket and put it on so he wouldn't have to watch. Winston nodded. Where'd the bucket come from? There was nothing in the... We think it came from under the sink in the kitchen. There's a ring, a water ring, on the shelf that fits the base of the bucket. It's on a supplemental Kurt typed up. He must have forgotten to put it in the book. McCaleb nodded and stood up. You're going to wait for the print crew, right? Yes, shouldn't be long. I'm going to take a walk. He headed for the open door. I'll go with you, Rorschach said. McCaleb turned. No, Mr. Rorschach, you need to stay here with Detective Winston. We need an independent witness to monitor what we do in the apartment. He glanced over Rorschach's shoulder at Winston. She winked, telling him she understood the phony story and what he was doing. Yes, Mr. Rorschach, please stay here, if you don't mind. Rorschach shrugged his shoulders again and raised his hands. McCaleb went down the stairs to the enclosed courtyard in the center of the apartment building. He turned in a complete circle, and his eyes traveled up the line of the flat roof. He didn't see the owl anywhere, and turned and walked out through the entrance hall to the street. Across Sweetser was the Braxton Arms, a three-story, L-shaped apartment building with exterior walkways and stairwells. McCaleb crossed and found a six-foot security gate and fence at the entrance. It was more for show than as a deterrent. He took off his windbreaker, folded it, and pushed it between two of the gate's bars. He then brought his foot up onto the gate's handle, tested it with his weight, then hoisted himself up to the top of the gate. He dropped down on the other side and looked around to see if anyone was watching him. He was clear. He grabbed his windbreaker and headed for the stairwell. He walked up to the third level and followed the walkway to the front of the building. His breathing was loud and labored from climbing the gate and then the stairs. When he got to the front, he put his hands on the safety railing and leaned forward until he'd caught his breath. He then looked across Sweetser to the flat roof of the apartment building where Edward Gunn had lived. Again, the plastic owl wasn't there. McCaleb leaned his forearms down on the railing and continued to labor for breath. He listened to the cadence of his heart as it finally settled. He could feel sweat popping on his scalp. He knew it wasn't his heart that was weak. It was him, weakened by all the drugs he took to keep his heart strong. It frustrated him. He knew that he would never be strong that he would spend the rest of his life listening to his heart the way a night burglar listens to creaks in the floor. He looked down when he heard a vehicle and saw a white van with the sheriff's seal on the driver's door pull to a stop in front of the apartment building across the street. The crew had arrived. McCaleb glanced at the roof across the street once more and then turned to head back down, defeated. He suddenly stopped. There was the owl. It was perched atop a compressor for a central air conditioning system on the roof of the L extension of the building he was in. He quickly went to the stairs and climbed up to the roof landing. He had to work his way around some furniture that was stacked and stored on the landing, but he found the door unlocked. He hurried across the flat, gravel-strewn roof to the air conditioner. He first studied the owl before touching it. It matched his memory of the owl on the crime scene tape. Its base was an octagonal stump. He knew it was the missing owl. He removed the wire that had been wrapped around the base and attached to the intake grill of the air conditioner. He noticed that the grill and metal covering of the unit were covered with old bird droppings. He surmised that the droppings were a maintenance problem, and Rorschach, who apparently managed this building as well as the one across the street, had taken the owl from Gunn's apartment to use to keep the birds away. McCaleb took the wire and looped it around the owl's neck so that he could carry it without touching it, though he doubted there would be any usable fingerprint or fiber evidence remaining on it. He lifted it off the air conditioner 
and headed back to the stairs. When McCaleb stepped back into Edward Gunn's apartment, he saw two crime scene techs getting equipment out of a toolbox. A stepladder was folded open and standing in front of the china cabinet. You might want to start with this, he said. He watched Rorschach's eyes widen as he entered the room and placed the plastic owl down on the table. You manage the place across the street, don't you, Mr. Rorschach? Ah, uh, it's okay. It's easy enough to find out. Yes, he does, Winston said, bending down to look at the owl. He was over there when we needed him on the day of the murder. He lives there. Any idea how this ended up on the roof? McCaleb asked. Rorschach still didn't answer. Guess it just flew over, right? Rorschach couldn't take his eyes off the owl. Tell you what, you can go now, Mr. Rorschach, but stay around your place. If we get a print off of the bird or the cabinet, we're going to need to take a set of yours for comparison. Now Rorschach looked at McCaleb and his eyes grew even wider. Go on, Mr. Rorschach. The building manager turned and slowly headed out of the apartment. And shut the door, please, McCaleb called after him. After he was gone and the door was shut, Winston almost burst into laughter. Terry, you're being so hard on him. He really didn't do anything wrong, you know. We cleared the place, he let the sister take what she wanted, and then what was he supposed to do, try to rent this place with this stupid owl up there? McCaleb shook his head. He lied to us. That was wrong. I almost blew a gasket climbing that building across the street. He could have just told us it was up there. Well, he's probably scared now. I think he learned his lesson. Whatever. He stepped back so one of the techs could go to work on the owl while the other climbed the ladder to work on the top of the cabinet. McCaleb studied the bird as the tech brushed on black fingerprint powder. It appeared that the owl was hand-painted. It was a dark brown and black on its wings, head and back. Its chest was a lighter brown with some yellow highlighting. Its eyes were a shiny black. Has this been outside? the tech asked. Unfortunately, McCaleb answered, remembering the rains that swept off the mainland and out to Catalina the week before. Well, I'm not getting anything. Figures. McCaleb looked at Winston, his eyes portraying renewed anger with Rorschach. Nothing up here either, the other tech said. Too much dust. Chapter 9 The trial of David Story was being held in the Van Nuys courthouse. The crime the case centered on was not remotely connected to Van Nuys or even the San Fernando Valley, but the courthouse was chosen by schedulers in the district attorney's office because Department N was available, and it was the single largest courtroom in the county. Constructed out of two courtrooms several years earlier to comfortably hold the two juries as well as the attendant media crush of the Menendez brothers' murder case. The Menendez's slaying of their parents had been one of several Los Angeles court cases in the previous decade to capture the media's and, therefore, the public's attention. When it was over, the DA's office didn't bother deconstructing the huge courtroom. Somebody there had the foresight to realize that in L.A. there would always be a case that could fill Department N. And at the moment, it was the David Story case. The 38-year-old film director, known for films that push the limits of violence and sexuality within an R rating, was charged with the murder of a young actress he'd taken home from the premiere of his most recent film. The 23-year-old woman's body was found the next morning in the small Nichols Canyon bungalow she shared with another would-be actress. The victim had been strangled, her nude body arranged in her bed in a pose investigators believed to be part of a careful plan by her killer to avoid discovery. The case's elements, power, celebrity, sex and money, and the added Hollywood connection served to bring the case maximum media attention. David's story worked on the wrong side of the camera to be a fully realized celebrity himself, but his name was known, and he wielded the awesome power of a man who had delivered seven box office hits in as many years. 
The media was drawn to the story trial in the way young people are drawn by the dream of Hollywood. The advance coverage clearly delineated the case as a parable on unchecked Hollywood avarice and excess. The case also had a degree of secrecy not usually seen in criminal trials. The prosecutors assigned to the case took their evidence to a grand jury in order to seek charges against Story. The move allowed them to bypass a preliminary hearing where most of the evidence accumulated against the defendant is usually made public. Without that fount of case information, the media was left to mine its sources in both the prosecution and defense camps. Still, little about the case was leaked to the media other than the generalities. The evidence the prosecution would use to tie story to the murder remained cloaked, and all the more cause for the media frenzy around the trial. It was just that frenzy that convinced the district attorney to move the trial to the large Department N courtroom in Van Nuys. The second jury box would be used to accommodate more media members in the courtroom, while the unused deliberation room would be converted into a media room where the video feed could be watched by the second and third tier journalists. The move, which would give all media, from the National Enquirer to the New York Times, full access to the trial and its players, guaranteed the proceedings would become the first full-blooded media circus of the new century. In the center ring of this circus, sitting at the prosecution table, was Detective Harry Vosch, the lead investigator of the case. All the pretrial media analysis came down to one conclusion. The charges against David Story would rise and fall with Bosch. All evidence in support of the murder charge was said to be circumstantial, and that the foundation of the case would come from Bosch. The one solid piece of evidence that had been leaked to the media was that Bosch would testify that in a private moment, with no other witnesses or devices at hand to record the statement, Story had smugly admitted to him that he had committed the crime and boasted that he would surely get away with it. McCaleb knew all of this as he walked into the Van Nuys courthouse shortly before noon. He stood in line to go through the metal detector and felt a reminder of all that had changed in his life. When he'd been a bureau agent, all he needed to do was hold his badge up and walk around the line. Now he was just a citizen. He had to wait. The fourth-floor hallway was crowded with people milling about. McCaleb noticed that many clutched stacks of eight-by-ten black-and-white glossies of the movie stars they hoped would be attending the trial, either as witnesses or as spectators in support of the defendant. He walked to the double-door entrance to Department N, but one of the two sheriff's deputies posted there told him the courtroom was at full capacity. The deputy pointed to a long line of people standing behind a rope. He said it was the line for people waiting to go in. Every time one person left the courtroom, another could go in. McCaleb nodded and stepped away from the doors. He saw that further down the hallway was an open door with people milling about it. He recognized one man as a reporter on a local television news program. He guessed it was the media room and headed that way. When he got to the open door, he could look in and see two large televisions mounted high up in either corner above the room where there were several people crowded around a large jury table. Reporters. They were typing on laptop computers, taking notes on pads, eating sandwiches from to-go bags. The center of the table was crowded with plastic coffee and soda cups. He looked up at one of the televisions and saw that court was still in session, though it was now past noon. The camera focused on a wide angle, and he recognized Harry Bosch sitting with a man and woman at the prosecution table. It didn't look like he was paying attention to the proceedings. A man McCaleb recognized stood at the lectern between the prosecution and defense tables. He was J. Reason Folks, the lead defense attorney. At the table to his left sat the defendant, David Story. McCaleb couldn't hear the audio feed, but he knew that Folks wasn't delivering his opening statement. He was looking up at the judge, not in the direction of the jury box. 
Most likely, last-minute motions were being argued by the attorneys before openers began. The twin television screen switched to a new camera, this angle directly on the judge who began speaking, apparently delivering his rulings. McCaleb noted the nameplate in front of the judge's bench. It said Superior Court Judge John A. Houghton. Agent McCaleb! McCaleb turned from the television to see a man he recognized but couldn't immediately place standing next to him. Just McCaleb, Terry McCaleb. The man perceived his difficulty and held out his hand. Jack McAvoy! I interviewed you once. It was pretty brief. It was about the poet investigation. Oh, right, I remember now. That was a while back. McCaleb shook his hand. He did remember McAvoy. He had become entwined in the poet case and then wrote a book about it. McCaleb had had a very peripheral part in the case when the investigation had shifted to Los Angeles. He never read McAvoy's book, but was sure he hadn't added anything to it and likely wasn't mentioned in it. I thought you were from Colorado, he said, recalling that McAvoy had worked for one of the papers in Denver. And they sent you out to cover this? McAvoy nodded. Good memory. I was from there, but I live out here now. I work freelance. McCaleb nodded, wondering what else there was to say. Who are you covering this for? I've been writing a weekly dispatch on it for the New Times. Do you read it? McCaleb nodded. He was familiar with the New Times. It was a weekly tabloid with an anti-authority, muckraking stance. It appeared to subsist mostly on entertainment ads, ranging from movies to the escort services that filled its back pages. It was free and Buddy always seemed to leave issues lying around the boat. McCaleb looked at it from time to time, but hadn't noticed McAvoy's name before. I'm also doing a general rap for Vanity Fair, McAvoy said. You know, a more discursive, dark side of Hollywood piece. I'm thinking about another book, too. What brings you here? Are you involved with this in some... Me? No. I was in the area, and I have a friend involved. I was hoping I might be able to get a chance to say hello to him. As he told the lie, McCaleb looked away from the writer and back through the door to the televisions. The full courtroom camera angle was now being shown. It looked like Bosch was gathering things into a briefcase. Harry Bosch? McCaleb looked back at him. Yeah, Harry. We worked a case together before, and... Uh... What's going on in there now, anyway? Final motions before they start. They started with a closed session, and they're just doing some housekeeping. Not worth being in there. Everybody thinks the judge will probably finish before lunch and then give the lawyers the rest of the day to work on openers. They start tomorrow at ten. You think things are crowded here now? Wait till tomorrow. McCaleb nodded. Oh, well, okay, then. Uh, nice seeing you again, Jack. Good luck with the story. And the book, if it comes to that. You know, I would have liked to have written your story. You know, with the heart and everything. McCaleb nodded. Well, I owed Keisha Russell one, and she did a good job with it. McCaleb noticed people start to push their way out of the media room. Behind them, he could see on the television screens that the judge had left the bench. Court was out of session. I'd better go down the hall and see if I can catch Harry. Good to see you again, Jack. McCaleb offered his hand, and McAvoy shook it. He then followed the other reporters down to the courtroom doors. The main doors to Department N were opened by the two deputies, and out flowed the crowd of lucky citizens who had gotten seats during the session that had most likely been mind-numbingly boring. Those who hadn't made it inside pushed up close for a glimpse of a celebrity, but they were disappointed. The celebrities wouldn't start showing until tomorrow. Opening statements were like the opening credits of a film. That's where they would want to be seen. At the tail end of the crowd came the lawyers and staff. Story had been returned to lockup, but his attorney strode right to the semicircle of reporters and began giving his view of what had transpired inside. 
a tall man with jet-black hair, a deep tan, and ever-shifting green eyes took a position directly behind the lawyer to cover his back. He was striking, and McCaleb thought he recognized him, but he couldn't think of from where. He looked like one of the actors Story normally put in his films. The prosecutors came out and soon had their own knot of reporters to deal with. Their answers were shorter than the defense lawyers. They often declined to comment when asked questions about the evidence they would present. McCaleb watched for Bosch and finally saw him slip out last. He skirted the crowd by staying close to the wall and headed toward the elevators. One reporter moved in on him, but he held up his hand and waved her away. She stopped and moved back like a loose molecule to the pack standing around J. Reason folks. McCaleb followed Bosch down the hall and caught him when he stopped to wait for an elevator. Hey, Harry Bosch. Bosch turned, already putting on his no-comment face. When he saw it, it was McCaleb. Hey, McCaleb. He smiled. The men shook hands. Looks like the world's worst eight-by-ten case, McCaleb said. You're telling me. What are you doing here? Don't tell me you're writing a book on this thing. What? All these ex-bureau guys writing books nowadays. Nah, that's not me. Actually, though, I was hoping I could maybe buy you lunch. There's something I wanted to talk to you about. Bosch looked at his watch and was deciding something. Edward Gunn. Bosch looked up at him. Jay Winston? McCaleb nodded. She asked me to take a look. The elevator came and they stepped onto it with a crowd of people that had been in the courtroom. They all seemed to be looking at Bosch while trying not to show it. McCaleb decided not to continue until they were off. On the first floor, they headed toward the exit. I told her I'd profile it, a quick one. To do it, I need to get a handle on gun. I thought maybe you could tell me about that old case and about what kind of guy he was. It was a scumbag. Look, I have about 45 minutes max. I need to get on the road. I'm running down wits today, making sure everybody's ready to go after open us. I'll take the 45 if you can spare it. Any place to eat around here? Forget the cafeteria here. It's awful. There's a uh, Cupid's up on Victory. You cops always eat it the best. It's why we do what we do. Chapter 10 They ate their hot dogs at an outdoor table without an umbrella. Though it was a mildly warm winter day, McCaleb found himself sweating. On any given day, the valley could be counted on to be 15 to 20 degrees warmer than Catalina, and he wasn't used to the change. His internal heating and cooling systems had never been normal since the transplant, and he was prone to quick chills and sweats. He began with some small talk about Bosch's current case. You ready to become Hollywood Harry with this case? Yeah, no thanks, Bosch said between bites of what was billed as a Chicago dog. I think I'd rather be on midnight shift in the 77th. Well, you think you got it together? You got him? Never know. The DA's office hasn't won a big one since Disco. I don't know how it'll go. The lawyers all say it depends on the jury. I always thought it was the quality of the evidence, but I'm just a dumb detective. John Reason brought in O.J.'s jury consultant, and they're acting pretty happy with the twelve in the box. Shit. John Reason. See, I'm even calling the guy by the name the reporters use. It shows how good he is at controlling things, sculpting things. He shook his head and took another bite of his lunch. Who's the big guy I saw him with? McCaleb asked. The guy standing behind him like Lurch. Rudy Valentino, his investigator. That's his name? No, it's Rudy Taffero. He's former LAPD. He worked Hollywood detectives until a few years back. People in the Bureau called him Valentino because of his looks. He got off on it. Anyway, he went private. Has a bail bonds license. 
Don't ask me how, but he started getting security contracts with a lot of Hollywood people. He showed up on this one right after we popped Story. In fact, Rudy brought Story to folks. Probably got a nice finder's fee for that. And how about the judge? How's he going to be? Bosch nodded as if he had found something good in the conversation. Shootin' hootin'? He's no second chance Lance. He's no bullshit. He'll slap folks down if he needs to. At least we have that going for us. Shootin' hootin'? Under that black robe he's usually strapped, or at least most people think so. About five years ago he had a Mexican mafia case, and when the jury came in guilty, a bunch of the defendant's buddies and family in the audience got mad and nearly started a riot in the courtroom. Houghton pulled his Glock and put a round into the ceiling. It quieted things down pretty quick. Ever since, he's been re-elected by the highest percentage of any incumbent judge in the county. Go in the courtroom and check the ceiling. The bullet hole's still there. He won't let anybody fix it. Bosch took another bite and looked at his watch. He changed the subject, talking with his mouth full. Nothing personal, but I take it they've hit the wall on gun if they're going to outside help already. McCaleb nodded. Something like that. He looked down at the chili dog in front of him and wished he had a knife and fork. What's wrong? We didn't have to go here. Nothing. I was just thinking. Between pancakes at Dupar's this morning and this, I might need another heart by dinner. You want to stop your heart. Next time you go to Dupar's, top it off with a stop at Bob's Donuts. Right there in the farmer's market. Raised glaze. A couple of those and you'll feel your arteries harden and snap like icicles hanging off a house. They never came up with one suspect, right? Right. Nothing. So what makes you so interested? Same as Jay. Something about this one. We think whoever it was might be just starting. Bosch just nodded. His mouth was full. McCaleb appraised him. His hair was shorter than McCaleb had remembered it, more gray, but that was to be expected. He still had the mustache and the eyes. They reminded him of Graciela's, so dark there was almost no delineation between iris and pupil. But Bosch's eyes were weary and slightly hooded by wrinkles at the corners. Still, they were always moving, observing. He sat leaning slightly forward, as if ready to move. McCaleb remembered that there had always been a spring-loaded feel to Bosch. He felt as though at any moment or for any reason Bosch could put the needle into the red zone. Bosch reached inside his suit coat and took out a pair of sunglasses and put them on. McCaleb wondered if that had been in response to realizing that McCaleb had been studying him. He bent down raised up his chili dog, and finally took a bite. It tasted delicious and deadly at the same time. He put the dripping mess back on the paper plate and wiped his hand on a napkin. So tell me about Gunn. You said he was a scumbag. What else? What else? That's about it. He was a predator. Used women, bought women. He murdered that girl in that motel room, no doubt in my mind but the D.A. kicked the case. Yeah, Gunn claimed self-defense. He said some things that didn't add up, but not enough to add up to charges. He claimed self-defense, and there wasn't going to be enough to go against that in a trial. So they no build it. End of story. On to the next case. Did he ever know you didn't believe him? Oh, sure, he knew. Did you try to sweat him at all? Bosch gave him a look that McCaleb could read through the sunglasses. The last question went to Bosch's credibility as an investigator. I mean, McCaleb said quickly, what happened when you tried to sweat him? Actually, the truth is we never really got the chance. There was a problem. See, we did set it up. We brought him in and put him in one of the rooms. 
My partner and I were planning to leave him there a while, let him percolate a little and think about things. We were going to do all the paper, put it in a book, and then take a run at him, try to break his story. We never got the chance. I mean, to do it right. What happened? Me and Edgar, that's my partner, Jerry Edgar. We went down the hall to get a cup of coffee and talk about how we were going to play it. While we were down there, the squad lieutenant sees Gunn sitting in the interview room and doesn't know what the fuck he's doing there. He takes it upon himself to go in and make sure the guy's been properly advised of his rights. But Caleb could see the anger working its way into Bosch's face, even six years after the fact. You see, Gunn had come in as a witness and ostensibly as the victim of a crime. He said she came at him with the knife and he turned it on her, so he didn't need to advise him. The plan was to go in there, shake his story down, and get him to make a mistake. Once we had that, then we were going to advise him. But this dipshit lieutenant didn't know any of this, and he just went in and advised the guy. After that, we were dead. He knew we were coming after him. He asked for a lawyer as soon as we walked into the room. Bosch shook his head and looked out in the street. McCaleb followed his eyes. Across Victory Boulevard was a used car lot with red, white, and blue pennants flapping in the wind. To McCaleb, Van Nuys was always synonymous with car lots. They were all over, new and used. So what did you say to the lieutenant? he asked. Say? I didn't say anything. I just shoved him through the window of his office. I got a suspension out of it. Involuntary stress leave. Jerry Edgar eventually took the case into the D.A., and they sat on it a while and then finally kicked it. Bosch nodded. His eyes rested on his empty paper plate. I sort of blew it, he said. Yeah. I blew it. McCaleb waited a moment before speaking. A gust of wind blew Bosch's plate off the table, and the detective watched it skitter across the picnic area. He made no move to chase it down. You still working for that lieutenant? Nope. He's no longer with us. Not too long after that, he went out one night and didn't come home. They found him in his car, up in the tunnel in Griffith Park near the observatory. What? He killed himself? No, somebody did it for him. It's still open, technically. Bosch looked back at him. McCaleb dropped his eyes and noticed that Bosch's tie-tack was a tiny pair of silver handcuffs. What else can I tell you? Bosch said. None of this had anything to do with gun. He was just a fly in the ointment. The ointment being the bullshit they call the justice system. Doesn't sound like you had time to do much background on him. None, actually. All of that I told you took place in the span of eight or nine hours. Afterward, with what happened, I was off the case and the guy walked out the door. But you didn't give up. Jay told me you visited him in the drunk tank the night before he got himself killed. Yeah, he got popped on a deuce while cruising whores on sunset. He was in the tank, and I got a call. I went in to take a look, maybe jerk his chain a little, see if he was ready to talk. But the guy was pissed drunk, just lying there on the floor in the puke. So that was it. You could say that we didn't communicate. Bosch looked at McCaleb's unfinished chili dog and then his watch. Sorry, but that's all I got. You gonna eat that, or can we go? Couple more bites, couple more questions. Don't you want to have a smoke? I quit a couple of years ago. I only smoke on special occasions. Don't tell me. It was the Marlboro Man Gone Impotent sign on Sunset. Nah, my wife wanted us both to quit. We did. Your wife? Harry, you're full of surprises. Don't get excited. She's come and gone. But at least I don't smoke anymore. I don't know about her. But Caleb just nodded, feeling he had stepped too far into the other man's personal world. 
He got back to the case. So any theories on who killed him? McCaleb took another bite while Bosch answered. My guess is he probably met up with somebody just like himself, somebody who crossed a line somewhere. Don't get me wrong. I hope you and Jay get the guy. But so far, whoever he or she is hasn't done anything I'm too upset about. Know what I mean? It's funny you mentioned a she. You think it could have been a woman? I don't know enough about it, but like I said, he preyed on women. Maybe one of them put a stop to it. But Caleb just nodded. He couldn't think of anything else to ask. Bosch had been a long shot anyway. Maybe he knew it would come to this, and he just wanted to reconnect with Bosch for other reasons. He spoke with his eyes down on his paper plate. You still think about the girl on the hill, Harry? He didn't want to say out loud the name Bosch had given her. Bosch nodded. From time to time, I do. It sticks with me. They all do, I guess. McCaleb nodded. Yeah. So nothing? Nobody ever made a claim on her? Nope. And I tried with Seguin one last time, went up to see him at Kew last year, about a week before he got the juice. Tried one more time to find out from him, but he just smiled at me. It was like he knew it was the last thing he could hold over me or something. He enjoyed it, I could tell. So I got up to leave, and I told him to enjoy himself in hell, and know he said to me? He said, I hear it's a dry heat. Bosch shook his head. Fucker. I drove up and back on my day off, twelve hours in the car, and the air conditioner didn't work. He looked directly at McCaleb, and even through the shades, McCaleb again felt the bond he had known so long ago with this man. Before he could say anything, he heard his phone begin to chirp from the pocket of his windbreaker, which was folded on the bench next to him. He struggled with the jacket to find the pocket, and got to the phone before the collar hung up. It was Brass Duran. I have some stuff for you. Not a lot, but maybe a start. You someplace I can call you back in a few minutes? Actually, I'm in the central conference room. We're about to brainstorm a case, and I'm the leader. It could be a couple hours before I'm free. You could call me at home tonight if you... No, hold on. He held the phone down and looked at Bosch. I better take this. I'll talk to you later if anything comes up, okay? Sure. Bosch started getting up. He was going to carry his coke with him. Thanks, McCaleb said, extending his hand. Good luck with the trial. Bosch shook his hand. Thanks. We'll probably need it. McCaleb watched him walk out of the picnic area and to the sidewalk leading back to the courthouse. He brought the phone back up then. Brass? Here. Okay, you were talking about owls in general, right? You don't know the specific kind or breed, right? Right. It's just a generic owl, I think. What color is it? Uh, it's brown, mostly. Like on the back and the wings. As he spoke, he took a couple of folded pages of notebook paper and a pen out of his pockets. He shoved his half-eaten chili dog out of the way and got ready to take notes. Okay, modern iconography is what you expected. The owl is the symbol of wisdom and truth, denotes knowledge, the view of the greater picture as opposed to the small detail. The owl sees in the night. In other words, seeing through the darkness is seeing the truth. It's learning the truth, therefore, knowledge. And from knowledge comes wisdom, okay? McCaleb didn't need to take notes. What Duran had said was obvious, but just to keep his head in it, he wrote down a line. Seeing in the dark equals wisdom. He then underlined the last word. Okay, fine, what else? That's basically what I have as far as contemporary application. But when I go backward, it gets pretty interesting. Our friend the owl has totally rejuvenated his reputation. He used to be a bad guy. Tell me, Brass. Get your pencil out. 
The owl is seen repeatedly in art and religious iconography from early medieval through late Renaissance periods. It's found often depicted in religious allegorical displays, paintings, church panels, and stations of the cross. The owl was okay, brass. But what did it mean? I'm getting to that. Its meaning could be different from depiction to depiction, and according to species depicted. But essentially, its depiction was the symbol of evil. Michaela wrote the word down. Evil. Okay. I thought you'd be more excited. You can't see me. I'm standing on my hands here. What else you have? Let me run down the list of hits here. These are taken from the extracts, the critical literature of the art of the period. References to depictions of owls come up as the symbol of, and I quote, doom, the enemy of innocence, the devil himself, heresy, folly, death, and misfortune, the bird of darkness, and finally, the torment of the human soul in its inevitable journey to eternal damnation. Nice, huh? I like that last one. I guess they didn't sell too many bags of potato chips with owls on them back in the 1400s. McCaleb didn't answer. He was busy scribbling down the description she had read to him. Read that last one again. She did and he wrote it down verbatim. Now, there is more, Duran said. There's also some interpretation of the owl as being the symbol of wrath as well as the punishment of evil. So it obviously was something that meant different things at different times and to different people. The punishment of evil, McCaleb said as he wrote it down. He looked at the list he'd written. Anything else? Isn't that enough? Probably. Was there anything about books showing some of this stuff? Or the names of artists or writers who use the so-called bird of darkness in their work? McCaleb heard some pages turning over the phone, and Duran was silent for a few moments. I don't have a lot here. No books, but I can give you the name of some of the artists mentioned, and you could probably get something over the Internet or maybe the library at UCLA. All right. I have to do this quickly. We're about to go here. Give it to me. All right. I have an artist named Bruegel who painted a huge face as the gateway to hell. A brown owl was nesting in the nostril of the face. She started laughing. Don't ask me, she said. I'm just giving you what I found. Fine, McCaleb said, writing the description down. Go on. Okay. Two others noted for using the owl as the symbol of evil were Van Ostenen and Dürer. I don't have specific paintings. He heard more pages turning. He asked for spellings of the artist's names and wrote them down. Okay, here it is. This last guy's work is supposedly replete with owls all over the place. I can't pronounce his first name. It's spelled H-I-E-R-O-N-Y-M-U-S. He was Netherlandish, part of the Northern Renaissance. I guess owls were big up there. McCaleb looked at the paper in front of him. The name she had just spelled seemed familiar to him. You forgot his last name. What's his last name? Oh, sorry, it's Bosch, like the spark plugs. McCaleb sat frozen. He didn't move, he didn't breathe. He stared at the name on the page, unable to write the last part that Duran had just given him. Finally, he turned his head and looked out of the picnic area to the spot on the sidewalk where he had last seen Harry Bosch walking away. Terry, you there? He came out of it. Yeah. That's really all I have, and I have to go. We're starting here. Anything else on Bosch? Not really, and I'm out of time. Okay, Brass, listen, thanks a lot. I owe you one for this, and I'll collect one day. Let me know how it all comes out, okay? You got it. And send me a photo of that little girl. I will. 
She hung up, and McCaleb slowly closed his phone. He wrote a note at the bottom of the page reminding him to send Brass a photo of his daughter. It was just an exercise in avoiding the name of the painter he had written down. Shit, he whispered. He sat with his thoughts for a long time. The coincidence of receiving the eerie information just minutes after eating with Harry Bosch was unsettling. He studied his notes for a few more moments, but knew they didn't contain the immediate information he needed. He finally reopened the phone and called 213 Information. A minute later, he called the personnel records of the Los Angeles Police Department. A woman answered after nine rings. Yes, I'm calling on behalf of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. I need to contact a particular LAPD officer. Only I don't know where he works. I only have his name. He hoped the woman wouldn't ask what he meant by on behalf of. There was what seemed to be a long silence, and then he heard the sound of typing on a keyboard. Last name? Uh, it's Bosch. He spelled it and then looked down at his notes, ready to spell the first name. And the first name... Never mind. There's only one. Hire Ronnie Muss. Is that it? I can't pronounce it, I don't think. Hieronymus. Yes, that's it. He spelled the name and asked if it was a match. It was. Well, he's a detective third grade and he works in Hollywood Division. Do you need that number? McCaleb didn't answer. Sir, do you need... No, I have it. Thank you very much. He closed the phone, looked at his watch, and then reopened the phone. He called Jay Winston's direct number and she picked up right away. He asked if she'd gotten anything back from the lab on the examination of the plastic owl. Not yet. It's only been a couple hours, and one of them was lunch. I'm going to give it until tomorrow before I start knocking on their door. Do you have time to make a few calls and do me a favor? What calls? He told her about the icon search Brass Duran conducted, but left out any mention of Hieronymus Bosch. He said that he wanted to talk with an expert on Northern Renaissance painting, but thought the arrangements could be made more quickly and cooperation would be more forthcoming if the request came from an official homicide detective. I'll do it, Winston said. Where should I start? I'd try the Getty. I'm in Van Nuys now. If somebody will see me, I could be there in a half hour. I'll see what I can do. You talk to Harry Bosch? Yeah. Anything new? Not really. I didn't think so. Hang tight. I'll call you back. McCaleb dumped what was left of his lunch into one of the trash barrels and headed back toward the courthouse, where he'd left the Cherokee parked on a side street by the state parole offices. As he walked, he thought about how he'd lied by omission to Winston. He knew he should have told her about the Bosch connection or coincidence, whichever it was. He tried to understand what it was that made him hold it back. He found no answer. His phone chirped just as he got to the Cherokee. It was Winston. You have an appointment at the Getty at two. Ask for Lee Alistair Scott. He's an associate curator of paintings. McCaleb got out his notes and wrote the name down, using the front hood of the Cherokee, after asking Winston to spell it. That was quick, Jay, thanks. We aim to please. I spoke directly to Scott and he said if he couldn't help you, he would find someone who could. You mentioned the owl? No, it's your interview. Right. McCaleb knew he had another chance to tell her about Hieronymus Bosch, but again, he let it pass. I'll call you later, okay? See ya. He closed the phone and unlocked the car. He looked over the roof at the parole offices and saw a large white banner with blue lettering hanging across the facade above the building's entrance. Welcome back, Thelma. He got into the car wondering whether the Thelma being welcome back was a convict or an employee. He drove off in the direction of Victory Boulevard. He'd take it to the 405 and then head south.
Chapter 11 As the freeway rose to cross the Santa Monica Mountains in the Sepulveda Pass, McCaleb saw the Getty rise in front of him on the hilltop. The structure of the museum itself was as impressive as any of the great artworks housed within it. It looked like a castle sitting atop a medieval hill. He saw one of the double trams slowly working its way up the side of the hill, delivering another group to the altar of history and art. By the time he parked at the bottom of the hill and caught his own tram ride up, McCaleb was fifteen minutes late for his appointment with Lee Alistair Scott. After getting directions from a museum guard, McCaleb hurried across the Travertine Stone Plaza to a security entrance. After checking in at the counter, he waited on a bench until Scott came for him. Scott was in his early fifties and spoke with an accent McCaleb placed as originating in either Australia or New Zealand. He was friendly and happy to oblige the L.A. County Sheriff's Office. We have had occasion to offer our help and expertise to detectives in the past, usually in regard to authenticating artwork or offering historical background to specific pieces, he said as they walked down a long hallway to his office. Detective Winston indicated this would be different. You need some general information on the Northern Renaissance? He opened the door and ushered McCaleb into a suite of offices. They stepped into the first office past the security counter. It was a small office with a view through a large window across the Sepulveda Pass to the hillside homes of Bel Air. The office felt crowded because of the bookshelves lining two walls and the cluttered work table. There was just room for two chairs. Scott pointed McCaleb to one while he took the other. Actually, things have changed a bit since Detective Winston spoke to you, McCaleb said. I can be more specific about what I need now. I've been able to narrow down my questions to a specific painter of that period. If you can tell me about him and maybe show me some of his work, that would be a big help. And what is his name? I'll show it to you. McCaleb took out his folded notes and showed them. Scott read the name aloud with obvious familiarity. He pronounced the first name Hieronymus. I thought that was how you said it. Rhymes with anonymous. His work is actually quite well known. You're not familiar with it? No, I never did much studying of art. Does the museum have any of his paintings? And none of his works are in the Getty collection, but there is a descendant piece in the conservation studio. It's undergoing heavy restoration. Most of his verified works are in Europe, the most significant representations in the Prado. Others scattered about. I am not the one you should be talking to, however. McCaleb raised his eyebrows in way of a question. Since you have narrowed your query to Bosch specifically, there is someone here you would be better advised to talk to. She is a curatorial assistant. She also happens to be working on a catalogue raisonné on Bosch, a rather long-term project for her, a labour of love, perhaps. Is she here? Can I speak to her? Scott reached for his phone and pushed the speaker button. He then consulted an extensions list, taped to the table next to it, and punched in three digits. A woman answered after three rings. Lola Walter, can I help you? Lola, it's Mr. Scott. Is Penelope available? She's working on hell this morning. Oh, I see. We'll go to her there. Scott hit the speaker button, disconnecting the call, and headed toward the door. You're in luck, he said. Hell? Michaela asked. It's the Descendant painting. If you'll come with me, please. Scott led the way to an elevator, and they went down one floor. Along the way, Scott explained that the museum had one of the finest conservation studios in the world. Consequently, works of art from other museums and private collections were often shipped to the Getty for repair and restoration. At the moment, a painting believed to have come from a student of Bosch's or a painter from his studio was being restored for a private collector. The painting was called Hell. 
The conservation studio was a huge room partitioned into two main sections. One section was a workshop where frames were restored. The other section was dedicated to the restoration of paintings and was broken into a series of work bays that ran along a glass wall with the same views Scott had in his office. McCaleb was led to the second bay where there was a woman standing behind a man seated before a painting attached to a large easel. The man wore an apron over a dress shirt and tie and a pair of what looked like jeweler's magnifying glasses. He was leaning toward the painting and using a paintbrush with a tiny brush head to apply what looked like silver paint to the surface. Neither the man nor the woman looked at McCaleb and Scott. Scott held his hands up in a hold-here gesture while the seated man completed his paint stroke. McCaleb looked at the painting. It was about four feet high and six feet wide. It was a dark landscape depicting a village being burned to the ground in the night while its inhabitants were being tortured and executed by a variety of otherworldly creatures. The upper panels of the painting, primarily depicting the swirling night sky, were spotted with small patches of damage and missing paint. McCaleb's eyes caught on one segment of the painting below this which depicted a nude and blindfolded man being forced up a ladder to a gallows by a group of bird-like creatures with spears. The man with the brush completed his work and placed the brush down on the glass top of the work table to his left. He then leaned back toward the painting to study his work. Scott cleared his throat. Only the woman turned around. Penelope Fitzgerald, this is Detective McCaleb. He is involved in an investigation and needs to ask about Hieronymus Bosch. He gestured toward the painting. I told him you would be the most appropriate member of staff to speak with. McCaleb watched her eyes register surprise and concern, a normal response to a sudden introduction to the police. The seated man did not even turn around. This was not a normal response. Instead, he picked up his brush and went back to work on the painting. McCaleb held his hand out to the woman. Actually, I'm not officially a detective. I've been asked by the sheriff's department to help out with an investigation. They shook hands. I don't understand, she said. Has a Bosch painting been stolen? No, nothing like that. This is a Bosch? He gestured toward the painting. Not quite. It may be a copy of one of his pieces. If so, then the original is lost and this is all we have. The style and design are his, but it's generally agreed to be the work of a student from his workshop. It was probably painted after Bosch was dead. As she had spoken, her eyes never left the painting. They were sharp and friendly eyes that easily betrayed her passion for Bosch. He guessed that she was about sixty, and had probably dedicated her life to the study and love of art. She had surprised him. Scott's brief description of her as an assistant working on a catalog of Bosch's work had made McCaleb think she would be a young art student. He silently chastised himself for making the assumption. The seated man put his brush down again and picked up a clean white cloth off the work table to wipe his hands. He swiveled in his chair and looked up when he noticed McCaleb and Scott. It was then that McCaleb knew he had made a second error of assumption. The man had not been ignoring them. He just hadn't heard them. The man flipped the magnifiers up to the top of his head while reaching beneath the apron to his chest and adjusted a hearing aid control. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't know we had visitors. He spoke with a hard German accent. Dr. Derek Foskuller, this is Mr. McCaleb, Scott said. He's an investigator, and he needs to steal Mrs. Fitzgerald away from you for a short while. I understand. This is fine. Dr. Foskuller is one of our restoration experts, Scott volunteered. Foskuller nodded and looked up at McCaleb and studied him in the way he might study a painting. 
he made no move to extend his hand. An investigation in regard to Hieronymus Bosch, is it? In a peripheral way, I just want to learn what I can about him. I'm told Mrs. Fitzgerald is the expert. McCaleb smiled. No one is an expert on Bosch, Foskuller said without a smile. Tortured soul, tormented genius. How will we ever know what is truly in a man's heart? McCaleb just nodded. Foskuller turned and appraised the painting. What do you see, Mr. McCaleb? McCaleb looked at the painting and didn't answer for a long moment. A lot of pain. Foskuller nodded approvingly. Then he stood and looked closely at the painting. Flipping the glasses down and leaning close to the upper quarter panel, his lenses just inches from the night sky above the burning village. Bosch knew all of the demons, he said, without turning from the painting. The darkness. A long moment went by. A darkness more than night. There was another long moment of silence until Scott abruptly punctuated it by saying he needed to get back to his office. He left then. And after another moment, Foskuller finally turned from the painting. He didn't bother flipping up the glasses when he looked at McCaleb. He slowly reached into his apron and switched off sound to his ears. I, too, must go back to work. Good luck with your investigation, Mr. McCaleb. McCaleb nodded as Foskuller sat back in his swivel chair and picked up his tiny brush again. We can go to my office, Fitzgerald said. I have all the plate books from our library there. I can show you Bosch's work. That would be fine. Thank you. She headed toward the door. McCaleb delayed a moment and took one last look at the painting. His eyes were drawn to the upper panels toward the swirling darkness above the flames. Penelope Fitzgerald's office was a six-by-six six pod in a room shared by several curatorial assistants. She pulled a chair into the tight space from a nearby pod where no one was working and told McCaleb to sit down. Her desk was L-shaped with a laptop computer set up on the left side and a cluttered workspace on the right. There were several books stacked on the desk. Michaela noticed that behind one stack was a color print of a painting very much in the same style as the painting Foskuller was working on. He pushed the books a half foot to the side and bent down to look at the print. It was in three panels, the largest being the centerpiece. Again, it was a ramble. Dozens and dozens of figures spread across the panels, Scenes of debauchery and torture. Do you recognize it? Fitzgerald said. I don't think so, but it's Bosch, right? His signature piece, the triptych called The Garden of Earthly Delights. It's in the Prado in Madrid. I once stood in front of it for four hours. It wasn't enough time to take it all in. Would you like some coffee or some water or anything, Mr. McCaleb? No, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, you can call me Terry if you want. And you can call me Nep. McCaleb put a quizzical look on his face. Childhood nickname, he nodded. Now, she said, in these books I can show you every piece of Bosch's identified work. Is it an important investigation? McCaleb nodded. I think so. It's a homicide. Are you some kind of consultant? I used to work for the FBI here in L.A. The sheriff's detective assigned to the case asked me to look at it and see what I think. It led me here, to Bosch. I'm sorry, but I can't get into the details of the case, and I know that will probably be frustrating to you. I want to ask questions, but I can't really answer any from you. Darn, she smiled. It sounds really interesting. Tell you what, if there is ever a point I can tell you about, I will. Fair enough, McCaleb nodded. From what Dr. Foskuller said, I take it there isn't a lot known about the man behind the paintings. Fitzgerald nodded. Hieronymus Bosch is certainly considered an enigma, 
and he probably always will be. McCaleb unfolded his notepaper on the table in front of him and started taking notes as she spoke. He had one of the most unconventional imaginations of his time, or any time for that matter. His work is quite extraordinary and still subject these five centuries later to restudy and reinterpretation. However, I think you will find that the majority of the critical analysis to date holds that he was a doomsayer. His work is informed with the portents of doom and hellfire, of warnings of the wages of sin. To put it more succinctly, his paintings primarily carried variations on the same theme, that the folly of humankind leads us all to hell as our ultimate destiny. McCaleb was writing quickly, trying to keep up. He wished he'd brought a tape recorder. Nice guy, huh? Fitzgerald said. Sounds like it. He nodded to the print of the triptych. Must have been fun on a Saturday night. She smiled. Exactly what I thought when I was in the Prado. Any redeeming qualities? He took in orphans, was nice to dogs, changed flat tires for old ladies, anything? You have to remember his time and place to fully understand what he was doing with his art. While his work is punctuated with violent scenes and depictions of torture and anguish, this was a time when those sort of things were not unusual. He lived in a violent time. His work clearly reflects that. The paintings also reflect the medieval belief in the existence of demons everywhere. Evil lurks in all of the paintings. The Owl? She stared blankly at him for a moment. Yes, the owl is one symbol he used. I thought you said you were unfamiliar with his work. I am unfamiliar with it. It was an owl that brought me here. But I shouldn't go into that, and I shouldn't have interrupted you. Please, go on. I was just going to add that it's telling when you consider that Bosch was a contemporary of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Yet, if you were to look at their works side by side, you would have to believe Bosch, with all the medieval symbols and doom, was a century behind. But he wasn't. She shook her head as though she felt sorry for Bosch. He and Leonardo da Vinci were born within a year or two of each other. By the end of the fifteenth century, da Vinci was creating pieces that were full of hope and celebration of human values and spirituality, while Bosch was all gloom and doom. That doesn't make you feel sad, does it? She put her hands on the top book in the stack, but didn't open it. It was simply labeled Bosch on the spine, and there was no illustration on the black leather binding. I can't help but think about what could have been if Bosch had worked side by side with da Vinci or Michelangelo. What could have happened if he had used his skill and imagination in celebration rather than damnation of the world? She looked down at the book and then back up at him. But that is the beauty of art and why we study and celebrate it. Each painting is a window to the artist's soul and imagination, no matter how dark and disturbing, his vision is what sets him apart and makes his paintings unique. What happens to me with Bosch is that the paintings serve to carry me into the artist's soul, and I sense the torment. He nodded, and she looked down and opened the book. The world of Hieronymus Bosch was as striking to Macaleb as it was disturbing. The landscapes of misery that unfolded in the pages Penelope Fitzgerald turned were not unlike some of the most horrible crime scenes he'd witness. But in these painted scenes, the players were still alive and in pain. The gnashing of teeth and the ripping of flesh were active and real. His canvases were crowded with the damned, human beings tormented for their sins by visible demons and creatures given image by the hand of a horrible imagination. At first he studied the color reproductions of the paintings in silence, taking it all in the way he would first observe a crime scene photograph. But then a page was turned, and he looked at a painting that depicted three people gathered around a sitting man. 
One of those standing used what looked like a primitive scalpel to probe a wound on the crown of the sitting man's head. The image was depicted in a circle. There were words painted above and below the circle. What is this one? he asked. It's called the stone operation, Fitzgerald said. It was a common belief at the time that stupidity and deceit could be cured by the removal of a stone from the head of the one suffering the malady. McCaleb leaned over her shoulder and looked closely at the painting, specifically at the location of the surgery wound. It was in a comparable location to the wound on Edward Gunn's head. Okay, you can go on. Owls were everywhere. Fitzgerald didn't have to point them out most of the time. Their positions were that obvious. She did explain some of the attendant imagery. Most often in the paintings, when the owl was depicted in a tree, the branch upon which the symbol of evil perched was leafless and gray. Dead. She turned the page to a three-panel painting. This is called The Last Judgment, with the left panel subtitled The Fall of Mankind, and the right panel simply and obviously called Hell. He liked painting Hell. But Nip Fitzgerald didn't smile. Her eyes studied the book. The left panel of the painting was a Garden of Eden scene, with Adam and Eve at center taking the fruit from the serpent in the apple tree. On a dead branch of a nearby tree, an owl watched the transaction. On the opposite panel, hell was depicted as a dark place where bird-like creatures disemboweled the damned, cut their bodies up, and placed them in frying pans to be slid into fiery ovens. All of this came from this guy's head, McCaleb said. I don't... He didn't finish because he was unsure what he was trying to say. A tormented soul, Fitzgerald said and turned the page. The next painting was another circular image with seven separate scenes depicted along the outer rim with a portrait of God at center. In a circle of gold surrounding the portrait of God and separating him from the other scenes were four Latin words McCaleb immediately recognized. Beware, beware, God sees. Fitzgerald looked up at him. You obviously have seen this before, or you just happen to know fifteenth-century Latin. This must be one strange case you're working on. It's getting that way. But I only know the words, not the painting. What is it? It's actually a tabletop, probably created for a church rectory or a holy person's house. It's the eye of God. He is at center, and what he sees as he looks down are these images, the seven deadly sins. McCaleb nodded. By looking at the distinct scenes, he could pick out some of the more obvious of the sins, gluttony, lust, and pride. And now his masterpiece, his tour guide said as she turned the page. She came to the same triptych she had pinned to the wall of the pod. The Garden of Earthly Delights. McCaleb studied it closely now. The left panel was a bucolic scene of Adam and Eve being placed in the garden by the Creator. An apple tree stands nearby. The center panel, the largest, showed dozens of nudes coupling and dancing in uninhibited lust, riding horses and beautiful birds and wholly imagined creatures from the lake in the foreground. And then the last panel, the dark one, was the payoff. Hell, a place of torment and anguish administered by monster birds and other ugly creatures. The painting was so detailed and enthralling that McCaleb understood how someone might stand before it, the original, for four hours and still not see everything. I am sure you are grasping the ideas of Bosch's often repeated themes by now. Fitzgerald said, but this is considered the most coherent of his works, as well as the most beautifully imagined and realized. McCaleb nodded and pointed to the three panels as he spoke. You have Adam and Eve here, the good life until they eat that apple. 
Then in the center you have what happens after the fall from grace. Life without rules. Freedom of choice leads to lust and sin. And where does all of this go? Hell. Very good. And if I could just point out a few specifics that might interest you. Please. She started with the first panel. The earthly paradise. You are correct in that it depicts Adam and Eve before the fall. This pool and fountain at center represent the promise of eternal life. You already noted the fruit tree at left center. Her finger moved across the plate to the fountain structure, a tower of what looked like flower petals that somehow delivered water in four distinct trickles to the pool below. Then he saw it. Her finger stopped below a small, dark entrance at the center of the fountain structure. The face of an owl peered from the darkness. You mentioned the owl before. Its image is here. You see, all is not right in this paradise. Evil lurks, and as we know, will ultimately win the day. According to Bosch. Then going to the next panel, we see the imagery again and again. She pointed out two distinct representations of owls and two other depictions of owl-like creatures. Caleb's eyes held on one of the images. It showed a large brown owl with shiny black eyes being embraced by a nude man. The owl's coloring and eyes matched that of the plastic bird found in Edward Gunn's apartment. Do you see something, Terry? He pointed to the owl. This one. I can't really go into it with you, but this one. It matches up with the reason I'm here. A lot of symbols are at work in this panel. That is one of the obvious ones. After the fall, man's freedom of choice leads him to debauchery, gluttony, folly, and avarice, the worst sin of all in Bosch's world being lust. Man wraps his arms around the owl. He embraces evil. McCaleb nodded. And then he pays for it. Then he pays for it. As you notice in the last panel, this is a depiction of hell without fire. Rather, it is a place of myriad torments and endless pain, of darkness. McCaleb stared silently for a long time, his eyes moving across the landscape of the painting. He remembered what Dr. Foskula had said. A darkness more than night. Chapter 12 Bosch cupped his hands and held them against the window next to the front door of the apartment. He was looking into the kitchen. The counters were spotless. No mess, no coffee maker, not even a toaster. He started to get a bad feeling. He stepped over to the door and knocked once more. He then paced back and forth, waiting. He looked down and saw an outline on the pavement of where a welcome mat had once been. Damn, he said. He reached into his pocket and took out a small leather pouch. He unzipped it and removed two small steel picks he had made from hacksaw blades. He looked around and saw no one. He was in a shielded alcove of a large apartment complex in Westwood. Most residents were probably still at work. He stepped up to the door and went to work with the picks on the deadbolt. Ninety seconds later, he had the door open and he went inside. He knew the apartment was vacant as soon as he stepped in, but he covered every room anyway. All of them were empty. Hoping for an empty prescription bottle, he even checked the bathroom medicine cabinet. There was a used razor made of pink plastic on a shelf. Nothing else. He walked back into the living room and took out his cell phone. He had just put Janice Langweiser's cell phone on the speed dial the day before. She was co-prosecutor on the case, and they had worked on Bosch's testimony throughout the weekend. His call found her still in the trial team's temporary office in the Van Nuys courthouse. Listen, I don't want to rain on the parade, but Annabelle Crow is gone. What do you mean, gone? I mean gone, baby, gone. I'm standing in what was her apartment. It's empty. Shit! 
We really need her, Harry. When did she move out? I don't know. I just discovered she was gone. Did you talk to the apartment manager? Not yet. But he's not going to know much more than how long ago she split. If she's running from the trial, she wouldn't be leaving any forwarding addresses with the management. Well, when did you talk to her last? Thursday. I called her here. But that line is disconnected today. No forwarding number. Shit. I know. You said that. She got the subpoena, right? Yeah, she got it Thursday. That's why I called, to make sure. Okay. Then maybe she'll be here tomorrow. Bosch looked around the empty apartment. I wouldn't count on it. He looked at his watch. It was after five. Because he had been so sure about Annabelle Crow, she had been the last witness he was going to check on. There had been no hint that she was going to split. Now he knew he would be spending the night trying to run her down. What can you do? Langweiser asked. I've got some information on her I can run down. She's got to be in town. She's an actress. Where else is she going to go? New York? That's where real actors go. She's a face. She'll stay here. Find her, Harry. We'll need her by next week. I'll try. There was a moment of silence while they both considered things. You think Story got to her? Langweiser finally asked. I'm wondering. He could have gotten to her with what she needs, a job, a part, a paycheck. When I find her, I'll be asking that. Okay, Harry, good luck. If you get her tonight, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the morning. Right. Bosch closed the phone and put it down on the kitchen counter. From his jacket pocket, he took out a thin stack of three-by-five cards. Each card had the name of one of the witnesses he was responsible for vetting and preparing for trial. Home and work addresses, as well as phone numbers and pager numbers, were noted on the cards. He checked the card assigned to Annabelle Crow and then punched her pager number into his phone. He got a recorded message that said the pager was no longer in service. He clapped the phone closed and looked at the card again. He had the name and number of Annabelle Crow's agent listed at the bottom. He decided that the agent might be the one tie she wouldn't sever. He put the phone and cards back into his pockets. This was one inquiry he was going to make in person. Chapter 13 McCaleb made the crossing by himself, the following sea arriving at Avalon Harbor just as darkness did. Buddy Lockridge had stayed behind at Cabrillo Marina because no new charters had come up and he wouldn't be needed until Saturday. As he arrived at the island, McCaleb radioed the harbor master's boat on Channel 16 and got help mooring the boat. The added weight of the two heavy books he had bought at Dutton's bookstore in Brentwood, plus the smaller cooler filled with frozen tamales, made the walk up the hill to his house exhausting. He had to stop twice on the side of the road to rest. Each time he sat down on the cooler and took one of the books out of his leather bag so that he could once more study the dark work of Hieronymus Bosch even in the shadows of evening. Since his visit to the Getty, the images in the Bosch paintings were never far from his thoughts. Nep Fitzgerald had said something at the end of the meeting in her office. Just before closing the book on the plates reproducing the Garden of Earthly Delights, she looked at him with a small smile, as if she had something to say, but was hesitant. What? he said. Nothing, really, just an observation. Go ahead and make it. I'd like to hear it. I was just going to mention that a lot of the critics and scholars who view Bosch's work see corollaries to contemporary times. That's the mark of a great artist, if his work stands the test of time, if it has the power to connect to people and... and maybe influence them. McCaleb nodded. He knew she wanted him to tell her what he was working on. I understand what you're saying. I'm sorry, but at the moment I can't tell you about this. Maybe someday I will, or someday you will just know what it was, but thank you. You have helped a lot, I think. I don't know for sure yet. Sitting on the cooler now, McCaleb remembered the conversation. 
Corollaries to contemporary times, he thought, and crimes. He opened the larger of the two books he had bought and opened it to a color illustration of Bosch's masterpiece. He studied the owl with black eyes, and all of his instincts told him he was on to something significant, something very dark and dangerous. When he got home, Graciella took the cooler from him and opened it on the kitchen counter. She took three of the green corn tamales out and put them on a plate for defrosting in the microwave. I'm making chili relenos, too, she said. It's a good thing you called from the boat, or we would have gone ahead and eaten without you. McCaleb let her vent. He knew she was angry about what he was doing. He walked over to the table where Cielo was propped in a bouncing chair. She was staring up at the ceiling fan. She was moving her hands in front of her, getting used to them. McCaleb bent down and kissed both of them, and then her forehead. Where's Raymond? In his room, on the computer. Why did you only get ten? He looked over at her as he slid into a chair next to Cielo. She was putting the other tamales into a plastic Tupperware container for freezing. I took the cooler in and told them to fill it. That's how many it fit, I guess. She shook her head, annoyed with him. We'll have one extra. Then throw it out or invite one of Raymond's friends over for dinner next time. Who cares, Graciela? It's a tamale. Graciela turned and looked at him with dark, upset eyes that immediately softened. You're sweaty. I just walked up the hill. The shuttle was closed for the night. She opened an overhead cabinet and took out a plastic box holding a thermometer. There was a thermometer in every room in the house. She took this one out and shook it and came over to him. Open? Let's use the electronic. No, I don't trust them. She put the end of the thermometer under his tongue and then used her hand to gently bring his jaw up and close his mouth. Very professional. She had been an emergency room nurse when he'd met her. She was now the school nurse and an office clerk at Catalina Elementary. She had just gone back to work after the Christmas holiday. McCaleb sensed that she wanted to be a full-time mother, but they couldn't afford it, so he never brought it up directly. He hoped that in a couple years the charter service would be more established, and they would have the choice then. Sometimes he wished they had kept a share of the money for the book and movie deal, but he also knew that their decision to honor Graciela's sister by not making money off what happened had been the only choice. They gave half the money to the Make-A-Wish Foundation and put the other half in a trust fund for Raymond. It would pay for college if he wanted that. Graciela held his wrist and checked his pulse while he sat silently watching her. You're high, she said, dropping his wrist. Open. He opened his mouth and she took out the thermometer and read it. She went to the sink and washed it, then returned it to its case and the cabinet. She didn't say anything, and McCaleb knew that meant his temperature was normal. You wish I had a fever, don't you? Are you crazy? Yes, you do. That way you could tell me to stop this. What do you mean, tell you to stop it? Last night you said it was just going to be last night. Then this morning you said it was just going to be today. What are you telling me now, Terry? He looked over at Cielo and held out a finger for her to grasp. It's not over. He now looked back at Graciela. Some things came up today. Some things? Whatever they are, give them to Detective Winston. It's her job. It's not your job to be doing this. I can't. Not yet. Not until I'm sure. Graciela turned and walked back to the counter. She put the plate with the tamales on it into the microwave and set it for defrost. Will you take her in and change her? It's been a while. And she'll need a bottle while I make dinner. McCaleb carefully raised his daughter out of the bouncing seat and put her on his shoulder. She made some fussing noises, and he gently patted her back to calm her. He walked over to Graciela's back, put his arm around the front of her, and pulled her backward into him. He kissed the top of her head and held his face in her hair. It'll all be over soon, and we'll be back to normal. I hope so. She touched his arm, which crossed her body beneath her breasts. The touch of her fingertips was the approval he sought. It told him this was a rough spot, but they were okay. 
He held her tighter, kissed the back of her neck, and then let her go. Cielo watched the slowly moving mobile that hung over the changing table as he put a new diaper on her tiny body. Cardboard stars and half-moons hung from threads. Raymond had made it with Graciela as a Christmas present. An air current from somewhere in the house gently turned it, and Cielo's dark blue eyes focused on it. Michaela bent down and kissed her forehead. After wrapping her in two baby blankets, he took her out to the porch and gave her the bottle while gently moving in the rocking chair. Looking down at the harbor, he noticed he had left on the instrument lights on the following sea's bridge. He knew he could call the harbor master on the pier, and whoever was working nights could just motor over and turn them off. But he knew he'd be going back to the boat after dinner. He would get the lights then. He looked down at Cielo. Her eyes were closed, but he knew she was awake. She was working the bottle forcefully. Graciela had stopped full-time breastfeeding when she had gone back to work. Bottle feedings were new, and he found them to be perhaps the single most pleasurable moments of being a new father. He often whispered to his daughter during these times, promises mostly, promises that he would always love her and be with her. He told her never to be afraid or feel alone. Sometimes, when she would suddenly open her eyes and look at him, he sensed that she was communicating the same things back to him, and he felt a kind of love he had never known before. Terry! He looked up at Graciela's whisper. Dinner's ready! He checked the bottle and saw it was almost empty. I'll be there in a minute, he whispered. After Graciela left them, he looked down at his daughter. The whispering had made her open her eyes. She stared up at him. He kissed her on the forehead and then just held her gaze. I have to do this, baby, he whispered. The boat was cold inside. McCaleb turned on the salon lights and then positioned the space heater in the center of the room and turned it on low. He wanted to warm up, but not too much, for then he might get sleepy. He was still tired from the exertions of the day. He was down in the front cabin going through his old files when he heard the cell phone start to chirp from his leather bag up in the salon. He closed the file he was studying and took it with him as he bounded up the stairs to the salon and grabbed the phone out of his bag. It was Jay Winston. So how'd it go at the Getty? I thought you were going to call me back. Oh, well, it ran late and I wanted to get back to the boat and get across before dark. I forgot to call. You're back on the island? She sounded disappointed. Yeah, I told Graciela this morning I'd be back, but don't worry, I'm still working on a few things. What happened at the Getty? Nothing much, he lied. I talked to a couple people and looked at some paintings. You see any owls that match ours? She laughed as she asked the question. A couple close ones. I got some books I want to look through tonight. I was going to call you, see if maybe we could get together tomorrow. When? I've got a meeting in the morning at ten and another at eleven. I was thinking the afternoon, anyway. There's something I have to do in the morning myself. He didn't want to tell her that he wanted to watch the opening statements in the story trial. He knew they'd be carried live on court TV, which he got up at the house with the satellite dish. Well, I could probably get a chopper to take me out there, but I'll have to check with Arrow first. No, I'll be coming back over. You will? Great. You want to come here? No, I was thinking about something more quiet and private. How come? I'll tell you tomorrow. Getting mysterious on me. This isn't a scam to get the sheriffs to pay for pancakes again, is it? They both laughed. No scam. Any chance you could come out to Cabrillo and meet me at my boat? I'll be there. What time? He made the appointment for three o'clock, thinking that would give him plenty of time to prepare a profile and figure out how he would tell her what he had to say. It would also give him enough time to be ready for what he hoped she would allow him to do that night. Anything on the owl? he asked once they had the meeting arranged. Very little. None of it good. Inside there are manufacturing markings. The plastic mold was made in China. The company ships them to two distributors over here, one in Ohio and one in Tennessee. From there, they probably go all over. 
It's a long shot and a lot of work. So you're going to drop it? No, I didn't say that. It's just not a priority. It's on my partner's plate. He's got calls out. We'll see what he gets from the distributors, evaluate, and decide where to go from there. McCaleb nodded. Prioritizing investigative leads and even investigations themselves was a necessary evil, but it still bothered him. He was sure the owl was a key, and knowing everything about it would be useful. Okay, so we're all set? she asked. About tomorrow? Yeah, we're set. We'll see you at three. We? Kurt and I, my partner. You haven't met him yet. Uh, look, tomorrow could it just be me and you? Nothing against your partner, but I'd just like to talk to you tomorrow, Jay. There was a moment of silence before she responded. Terry, what's going on with you? I just want to talk to you about this. You brought me in. I want to give what I have to you. If you want to bring your partner in on it after, that's fine. There was another pause. I'm getting a bad vibe from all of this, Terry. I'm sorry, but that's the way I want it. I guess you have to take it or leave it. His ultimatum made her go silent even longer this time. He waited for her. All right, ma'am, she finally said. It's your show. I'll take it. Thanks, Jay. I'll see you then. They hung up. He looked at the old case file he'd pulled and still held in his hand. He put the phone down on the coffee table and leaned back on the couch and opened the file. Chapter 14 At first they called it the little girl lost case because the victim had no name. The victim was thought to be about 14 or 15 years old, a Latina, probably Mexican, whose body was found in the bushes and among the debris below one of the overlooks off of Mulholland Drive. The case belonged to Bosch and his partner at the time, Frankie Sheehan. This was before Bosch worked homicide out of Hollywood Division. He and Sheehan were a robbery homicide team, and it had been Bosch who had contacted McCaleb at the Bureau. McCaleb was newly returned to Los Angeles from Quantico. He was setting up an outpost for the Behavioral Sciences Section and Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. The little girl lost case was one of the first submitted to him. Bosch came to him, bringing the file and the crime scene photos to his tiny office on the 13th floor of the Federal Building in Westwood. He came without Sheehan because the partners had disagreed on whether to bring the Bureau in on the case. Cross-agency jealousies at work. But Bosch didn't care about all of that. He cared about the case. He had haunted eyes. The case was clearly working on him as much as he worked on it. The body had been found nude and violated in many ways. The girl had been manually strangled by her killer's gloved hands. No clothes or purse were found on the hillside. Fingerprints matched no computerized records. The girl matched no description on an active missing persons case anywhere in Los Angeles County or on national crime computer systems. An artist's rendering of the victim's face put on the TV news and in the papers brought no calls from a loved one. Sketches faxed to 500 police agencies across the Southwest and to the state judicial police in Mexico drew no response. The victim remained unclaimed and unidentified her body reposing in the refrigerator at the coroner's office while Bosch and his partner worked the case. There was no physical evidence found with the body. Aside from being left without her clothes or any identifying property, the victim had apparently been washed with an industrial-strength cleaner before being dumped late at night off of Mulholland. There was only one clue with the body, an impression in the skin of the left hip, Postmortem lividity indicated the blood in the body had settled on the left half, meaning the body had been lying on its left side in the time between the stilling of the heart and the dropping of the body down the hillside where it came to rest face down on a pile of empty beer cans and tequila bottles. The evidence indicated that during the time that the blood settled, the body had been lying on top of the object that left the impression on the hip. The impression consisted of the number one, the letter J, and part of a third letter that could have been the upper left stem of an H, a K, or an L. 
It was a partial reading of a license plate. Bosch formed the theory that whoever had killed the girl with no name had hidden the body in the trunk of a car until it was time to dump it. After carefully cleaning the body, the killer put it into the trunk of his car, mistakenly putting it down on part of a license plate that had been taken off the car and also placed in the trunk. Bosch's theory was that the license plate had been removed and possibly replaced with a stolen plate as one more safety measure that would help the killer avoid detection if his car happened to be spotted by a suspicious passerby at the Mulholland Overlook. Though the skin impression gave no indication of what state issued the license plate, Bosch went with the percentages. From the State Department of Motor Vehicles, he obtained a list of every car registered in Los Angeles County that carried a plate beginning 1JH, 1JK, and 1JL. The list contained over 3,000 names of car owners. He and his partner cut 40% of it by discounting the female owners. The remaining names were slowly fed into the National Crime Index computer, and the detectives came up with a list of 46 men with criminal records ranging from minor to the extreme. It was at this point that Bosch came to McCaleb. He wanted a profile of the killer. He wanted to know if he and Sheehan were on the right track in suspecting that the killer had a criminal history, and he wanted to know how to approach and evaluate the 46 men on the list. McCaleb considered the case for nearly a week. He looked at each of the crime scene photos twice a day, first thing in the morning and last thing before going to sleep, and studied the reports often. He finally told Bosch that he believed they were on the right course. Using data accumulated from hundreds of similar crimes and analyzed in the Bureau's VICAP program, he was able to provide a profile of a man in his late twenties with a history of having committed crimes of an escalating nature and likely including offenses of a sexual nature. The crime scene suggested the work of an exhibitionist, a killer who wanted his crime to be public and to instill horror and fear in the general population. Therefore, the location of the body dump site would have been chosen for these reasons as opposed to reasons of convenience. In comparing the profile to the list of 46 names, Bosch narrowed the possibilities to two suspects, a Woodland Hills office building custodian who had a record of arson and public indecency, and a stage builder who worked for a studio in Burbank and had been arrested for the attempted rape of a neighbor when he was a teenager. Both men were in their late twenties. Bosch and Sheehan leaned toward the custodian because of his access to industrial cleaner, like what had been used to wash the victim's body. However, McCaleb liked the stage builder as a suspect because the attempted rape of the neighbor in his youth indicated an impulsive action that was more in tune with the profile of the current crime's perpetrator. Bosch and Sheehan decided to informally interview both men and invited McCaleb along. The FBI agent stressed that the men should be interviewed in their own homes so that he would have the opportunity to study them in their own environment as well as look for clues in their belongings. The stage builder was first. His name was Victor Seguin. He seemed shell-shocked by the three men at his door and the explanation Bosch gave for their visit. Nevertheless, he invited them in. As Bosch and Sheehan calmly asked questions, McCaleb sat on a couch and studied the clean and neat furnishings of the apartment. Within five minutes, he knew they had the right man and nodded to Bosch, their prearranged signal. Victor Seguin was informed of his rights and arrested. He was placed in the detective's car and his small home under the landing zone of Burbank Airport was sealed until a search warrant could be obtained. Two hours later, when they re-entered with the search warrant, they found a 16-year-old girl bound and gagged, but alive, in a soundproof, coffin-like crawl space constructed by the stage builder beneath a trap door hidden under his bed. Only after the excitement and adrenaline high of having broken a case and saved a life began to subside, did Bosch finally ask McCaleb how he knew they had their man. McCaleb walked the detective over to the living room bookcase where he pointed out a well-worn copy of a book called The Collector, a novel about a man who abducts several women. Seguin was charged with the unidentified girl's murder 
and the kidnapping and rape of the young woman the investigators rescued. He denied any guilt in the murder and pressed for a deal by which he would plead guilty to the kidnapping and rape of the survivor only. The DA's office declined any deal and proceeded to trial with what they had, the survivor's gut-wrenching testimony and the license plate impression on the dead girl's hip. The jury convicted on all counts after less than four hours' deliberation. The DA's office then floated a possible deal to Seguin, a promise not to go for the death penalty during the second phase of the trial if the killer agreed to tell investigators who his first victim was and from where he'd abducted her. To take the deal, Seguin would have to drop his pose of innocence. He passed. The DA went for the death penalty and got it. Bosch never learned who the dead girl was, and McCaleb knew it haunted him that no one apparently cared enough to come forward. It haunted McCaleb, too. On the day he came to the penalty phase of the trial to testify, he had lunch with Bosch and noticed that a name had been written on the tabs of his files on the case. What's that? McCaleb asked excitedly. You I her? Bosch looked down and saw the name on the tabs and turned the files over. No, no ID yet. Well, what's that? Just a name. I sort of gave her a name, I guess. Bosch looked embarrassed. McCaleb reached over and turned the files back over to read the name. Cielo Azul? Yeah, she was Spanish. I gave her a Spanish name. It means blue sky, right? Yeah, blue sky. I, uh... McCaleb waited. Nothing. What? Well, I'm not that religious, you know what I mean. Yes. But I sort of figured if nobody down here wanted to claim her, then hopefully maybe there's somebody up there that will. Bosch shrugged his shoulders and looked away. McCaleb could see his face turning red in the upper cheeks. It's hard to find God's hand in what we do, what we see. Bosch just nodded, and they didn't speak about the name again. McCaleb lifted the last page of the file marked Cielo Azul and looked at the inside rear flap of the manila folder. It had become his habit over time at the Bureau to jot notes on the back flap where they wouldn't readily be seen because of the attached file pages. These were notes he made about the investigators who submitted the cases for profiling. McCaleb had come to realize that insights about the investigator were sometimes as important as the information in the case file. For it was through the investigator's eyes that McCaleb first viewed many aspects of the crimes. His case with Bosch had come up more than ten years earlier, before he began his more extensive profiling of the investigators as well as the cases. On this file, he had written Bosch's name, and just four words beneath it. Thorough, smart, M-M-A-A. -A. He looked at the last two notations now. It had been part of his routine to use abbreviations and shorthand when making notes that needed to be kept confidential. The last two notations were his reading on what motivated Bosch. He'd come to believe that homicide detectives a breed of cop unto themselves, called upon deep inner emotions and motivations to accept and carry out the always difficult task of their job. They were usually of two kinds, those who saw their jobs as a skill or a craft, and those who saw it as a mission in life. Ten years ago, he'd put Bosch into the latter class. He was a man on a mission. This motivation in detectives could then be broken down even further as to what gave them this sense of purpose or mission. To some, it was seen as almost a game. They had some inner shortage that caused them to need to prove they were better, smarter, and more cunning than their quarry. Their lives were a constant cycle of validating themselves by, in effect, invalidating the killers they sought by putting them behind bars. Others, while carrying a degree of that same inner shortage, also saw themselves with the additional dimension of being speakers for the dead. There was a sacred bond cast between victim and cop that formed at the crime scene and could not be severed. It was what ultimately pushed them into the chase and enabled them to overcome all obstacles in their path. 
McCaleb classified these cops as avenging angels. It had been his experience that these cop angels were the best investigators he ever worked with. He also came to believe that they traveled closest to that unseen edge, beneath which lies the abyss. Ten years before, he'd classified Harry Bosch as an avenging angel. He now had to consider whether the detective had stepped too close to that edge. He had to consider that Bosch may have gone over. He closed the file and pulled the two art books out of his bag. Both were simply titled Bosch. The larger one with full-color reproductions of the paintings was authored by R. H. Marinison and P. Rifolari. The second book, which appeared to carry more analysis of the paintings than the other, was written by Eric Larson. McCaleb started with the smaller book and began scanning through the pages of analysis. He quickly learned that, as Penelope Fitzgerald had said, there were many different and even competing views of Hieronymus Bosch. The Larson book cited scholars who called Bosch a humanist and even one who believed him to be part of a heretical group that believed that the earth was a literal hell ruled over by Satan. There was dispute among the scholars of the intended meanings of some of the paintings, whether some paintings could actually be attributed to Bosch, whether the painter had ever traveled to Italy and viewed the work of his Renaissance contemporaries. Finally, McCaleb closed the book when he realized that, at least for his purposes, the words about Hieronymus Bosch might not be important. If the painter's work was subject to multiple interpretations, then the only interpretation that mattered would be that of the person who killed Edward Gunn. What mattered was what that person saw and took from the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch. He opened the larger book and began to slowly study the reproductions. His viewing of reproduction plates of the paintings at Begetti had been hurried and encumbered by his not being alone. He put his notebook on the arm of the couch with the plan to keep a tabulation of the number of owls he saw in the paintings, as well as descriptions of each individual bird. He quickly realized that the paintings were so minutely detailed in the smaller-scale reproductions that he might be missing things of significance. He went down to the forward cabin to find the magnifying glass he'd always kept in his desk at the bureau for use while examining crime scene photos. As he was bent over a box full of office supplies he'd cleared out of his desk five years before, McCaleb felt a slight bump against the boat and straightened up. He had tied the Zodiac up on the fantail, so it couldn't have been his own skiff. He was considering this when he felt the unmistakable up-and-down movement of the boat indicating that someone had just stepped aboard. His mind focused on the salon door. He was sure he had left it unlocked. He looked down into the box he'd just been sorting through and grabbed the letter opener. As he came up the steps into the galley, McCaleb surveyed the salon and saw no one and nothing amiss. It was difficult seeing past the interior reflection on the sliding door, but outside in the cockpit, silhouetted by the streetlights on Crescent Street, there was a man. He stood with his back to the salon as if admiring the lights of the town going up the hill. McCaleb moved quickly to the slider and pulled it open. He held the letter opener at his side, but with the point of the blade up. The man standing in the cockpit turned around. McCaleb lowered his weapon as the man stared at it with wide eyes. Mr. McCaleb, I... It's all right, Charlie. I just didn't know who it was. Charlie was the night man in the harbor office. McCaleb didn't know his last name. But he knew that he often visited Buddy Lockridge on nights Buddy stayed over. McCaleb guessed that Buddy was a soft touch for a quick beer every now and then on the long nights. That was probably why he'd rowed his skiff over from the pier. I saw the lights and thought maybe Buddy was here, he said. I was just paying a visit. No, Buddy's overland tonight. He probably won't be back till Friday. Okay, then. I'll just be going, then. Everything all right with you? The missus isn't making you sleep on the boat, is she? No, Charlie. Everything's fine. Just doing a little work. He held up the letter opener as if that explained what he was doing. All right, then. I'll be heading back. Good night, Charlie. Thanks for checking on me. He went back inside and down to the office. 
He found the magnifying glass with a light attachment at the bottom of the box of office supplies. For the next two hours, he went through the paintings, the eerie landscapes of phantasmic demons surrounding human prey enthralled him once again. As he studied each work, he marked particular findings such as the owls with yellow post-its so that he could easily return to them. McCaleb had amassed a list of sixteen direct depictions of owls in the paintings and another dozen portrayals of owl-like creatures or structures. The owls were darkly painted and lurking in all the paintings like sentinels of judgment and doom. He looked at them and couldn't help but think of the analogy of the owl as detective. Both creatures of the night, both watchers and hunters, first-hand observers of the evil and pain humans and animals inflict upon each other. The single most significant finding McCaleb made during his study of the paintings was not an owl. Rather, it was the human form. He made the discovery as he used the lighted glass to examine the center panel of a painting called The Last Judgment. Outside the depiction of Hell's Oven where sinners are thrown, there were several bound victims waiting to be dismembered and burned. Among this grouping, McCaleb found the image of a nude man bound with his arms and legs behind him. The sinner's extremities had been stretched into a painful reverse fetal position. The image closely reflected what he'd seen at center focus in the crime scene videotape and photos of Edward Gunn. McCaleb marked the finding with a post-it and closed the book. When the cell phone on the couch next to him chirped just then, he bolted upright with a start. He checked his watch before answering and saw it was exactly midnight. The caller was Graciella. I thought you were coming back tonight. I am. I just finished and I'm on my way. You took the cart down, right? Yeah. So I'll be fine. Okay. See you soon. Yes, you will. McCaleb decided to leave everything on the boat, thinking that he needed to clear his mind of everything before the next day. Carrying the files and the heavy books would only remind him of the heavy thoughts he carried within. He locked the boat and took the Zodiac to the skiff dock. At the end of the pier, he climbed into the golf cart. He rode through the deserted business district and up the hill toward home. Despite his efforts to deflect them, his thoughts were of the abyss a place where creatures with sharp beaks and claws and knives tormented the fallen in perpetuity. He knew one thing for sure at this point. The painter Bosch would have made a good profiler. He knew his stuff. He had a handle on the nightmares that rattle around inside most people's minds, as well as those that sometimes get out. Chapter 15 Opening statements in the trial of David's story were delayed while the attorneys argued over final motions behind closed doors with the judge. Bosch sat at the prosecution table and waited. He tried to clear his mind of all extraneous diversions, including his fruitless search for Annabelle Crow the night before. Finally, at 10.45, the attorneys came into the courtroom and moved to their respective tables. Then the defendant today wearing a suit that looked like it would cover three deputies' paychecks, was led into court from the holding cell, and finally Judge Houghton took the bench. It was time to begin, and Bosch felt the tensions in the courtroom ratchet up a considerable notch. Los Angeles had raised, or perhaps lowered, the criminal trial to the level of worldwide entertainment, but it was never seen that way by the players in the courtroom. They were playing for keeps, and in this trial, perhaps more than most, there was a palpable sense of the enmity between the two opposing camps. The judge instructed the deputy sheriff, who acted as his bailiff, to bring in the jury. Bosch stood with the others and turned and watched the jurors file in silently and take their seats. He thought he could see excitement in some of their faces. They'd been waiting through two weeks of jury selection and motions for things to start. Bosch's eyes rose above them to the two cameras mounted on the wall over the jury box. They gave a full view of the courtroom, except for the jury box. After everyone was seated, Houghton cleared his throat and leaned forward to the bench microphone while looking at the jurors. Ladies and gentlemen, how are you this morning? There was a murmured response, and Houghton nodded. 
I apologize for the delay. Please remember that the justice system is in essence run by lawyers. As such, it runs slowly. There was polite laughter in the courtroom. Bosch noticed that the attorneys, prosecution, and defense dutifully joined in, a couple of them overdoing it. It had been his experience that while in open court, a judge couldn't possibly tell a joke that the lawyers did not laugh at. Bosch glanced to his left, past the defense table, and saw the other jury box was packed with members of the media. He recognized many of the reporters from television newscasts and press conferences in the past. He scanned the rest of the courtroom and saw the public observation benches were densely packed with citizens, except for the row directly behind the defense table. There sat several people with ample room on either side and who looked like they spent the morning in a makeup trailer. Bosch assumed they were celebrities of some sort, but it wasn't a realm he was familiar with and he couldn't identify any of them. He thought about leaning over to Janice Langweiser and asking, but then thought better of it. We needed to clean up some last-minute details in my chambers, the judge continued to the jury. But now we're ready to start. We'll begin with opening statements, and I need to caution you that these are not statements of fact, but rather statements about what each side thinks the facts are and what they will endeavor to prove during the course of the trial. These statements are not to be considered by you to contain evidence. All of that comes later on. So listen closely, but keep an open mind, because a lot is still coming down the pipe. Now we're going to start off with the prosecution, and as always, give the defendant the last word. Mr. Kretzler, you may begin. The lead prosecutor stood and moved to the lectern position between the two lawyers' tables. He nodded to the jury and identified himself as Roger Kretzler, deputy district attorney assigned to the special crimes section. He was a tall and gaunt prosecutor with a reddish beard beneath short, dark hair and rimless glasses. He was at least forty-five years old. Bosch thought of him as not being particularly likable, but nevertheless very capable of his job. And the fact that he was still in the trenches prosecuting cases when others his age had left for the higher-paying corporate or criminal defense worlds made him all the more admirable. Bosch suspected he had no home life. On nights before the trial, when a question about the investigation would come up and Bosch would be paged, the callback number was always Kretzler's office line, no matter how late it was. Kretzler identified his co-prosecutor as Janice Langweiser, also of the Special Crimes Unit, and the lead investigator as LAPD Detective 3rd Grade Harry Bosch. I am going to make this short and sweet, so... All the sooner we will be able to get to the facts, as Judge Houghton has correctly pointed out. Ladies and gentlemen, the case you will hear in this courtroom certainly has the trappings of celebrity. It has event status written all over it. Yes, the defendant, David N. Story, is a man of power and position in this community, in this celebrity-driven age we live in. But if you strip away the trappings of power and glitter from the facts... As I promise, we will do over the next few days. What you have here is something as basic as it is all too common in our society. A simple case of murder. Kretzler paused for effect. Bosch checked the jury. All eyes were fastened on the prosecutor. The man you see seated at the defense table, David N. Story went out with a 23-year-old woman named Jody Kremitz on the evening of last October 12th. And after an evening that included the premiere of his latest film and a reception, he took her to his home in the Hollywood Hills, where they engaged in consensual sexual intercourse. I don't believe you will find argument from the defense table about any of this. We're not here about that. But what happened during or after the sex is what brings us here today. On the morning of October 13th, the body of Jody Kremens was found strangled and in her own bed in the small home she shared with another actress. Kretzler flipped a page up on the legal pad on the lectern in front of him, even though it seemed clear to Bosch and probably everyone else that his statement was memorized and rehearsed. In the course of this trial, the state of California will prove beyond a reasonable doubt 
that it was David Story who took Jody Cremens' life in a moment of brutal sexual rage. He then moved or caused to be moved the body from his home to the victim's home. He arranged the body in such a way that the death might appear accidental. And following this, he used his power and position in an effort to thwart the investigation of the crime by the Los Angeles Police Department. Mr. Story, who you will learn has a history of abusive behavior toward women, was so sure that he would walk away untouched from his crime that in a moment of... Kretzler chose this moment to turn from the lectern and look down upon the seated defendant with a disdainful look. Story stared straight ahead unflinchingly, and the prosecutor finally turned back to the jury. Shall we say candor? He actually boasted to the lead investigator on the case, Detective Bosch, that he would do just that, walk away from his crime. Kretzler cleared his throat, a sign he was ready to bring it all home. We are here, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, to find justice for Jody Kremens, to make it our business that her murderer not walk away from his crime. The state of California asks, and I personally ask, that you listen carefully during the trial and weigh the evidence fairly. If you do that, we can be sure that justice will be served for Jody Cremens, for all of us. He picked the pad up off the lectern and turned to move back to his seat. But then he stopped, as if a second thought had just occurred to him. Bosch saw it as a well-practiced move. He thought the jury would see it that way as well. I was just thinking that we all know it has been part of our recent history here in Los Angeles to see our police department put on trial in these high-profile cases. If you don't like the message, then by all means shoot the messenger. It's a favorite from the defense bar's bag of tricks. I want you all to promise yourselves that you will remain vigilant and keep your eyes on the prize. That prize being truth and justice. Don't be fooled. Don't be misdirected. Trust yourself on the truth and you'll find the way. He stepped over to his seat and sat down. Bosch noticed Langweiser reaching over and gripping Kretzler's forearm in a congratulatory gesture. It, too, was part of the well-practiced play. The judge told the jurors that in light of the brevity of the prosecution's address, the trial would proceed to the defense statement without a break. But then the break came soon enough anyway, when folks stood and moved to the lectern and proceeded to spend even less time than Kretzler addressing the jury. You know, ladies and gentlemen, all this talk about shoot the messenger, don't shoot the messenger, well, let me tell you something about that. Those fine words you got from Mr. Kretzler there at the end. Well, let me tell you, every prosecutor in this building says those at the start of every trial in this place. I mean, they must have them printed up on cards they carry in their wallets, it seems to me. Kretzler stood and objected to what he called such wild exaggeration. And Houghton admonished folks, but then advised the prosecutor that he might make better use of his objections. Folks moved on quickly. If I was out of line, I'm sorry. I know it's a touchy thing with prosecutors and police, but all I'm saying, folks, is that where there's smoke, there's usually fire. And in the course of this trial, we're going to find our way through the smoke. We may or may not come upon a fire, but one thing I do know for sure we will come upon is the conclusion that this man... He turned and pointed strongly at his client. This man, David N. Story, is without a shadow of a doubt not guilty of the crime he's charged with. Yes, he is a man of power and position, but remember, it is not a crime to be so. Yes, he knows a few celebrities, but last time I checked People magazine, this too was not yet a crime. Now, I think you may find elements of Mr. Story's personal life and appetites to be offensive to you. I know I do. But remember that these do not constitute crimes that he is charged with in these proceedings. The crime here is murder. 
Nothing less and nothing more. It's a crime for which David Story is not guilty. Uh, no matter what Mr. Kretzler and Ms. Langweiser and Detective Bosch and their witnesses tell you, there's absolutely no evidence of guilt in this case. After folks bowed to the jury and sat down, Houghton announced the trial would break for an early lunch before testimony began in the afternoon. Bosch watched the jury file out through the door next to the box. A few of them looked back over their shoulders at the courtroom. The juror, who was last in line, a black woman of about fifty, looked directly at Bosch. He lowered his eyes and then immediately wished he hadn't. When he looked back up, she was gone. Chapter 16 McCaleb turned off the television when the trial broke for lunch. He didn't want to hear all the analysis of the talking heads. He thought the best point had been scored by the defense. Folks had made a smooth move telling the jury that he, too, found his client's personal life and habits offensive. He was telling them that if he could stand it, so could they. He was reminding them that the case was about taking a life, not about how one lived a life. He went back to preparing for his afternoon meeting with Jay Winston. He'd gone back to the boat after breakfast and gathered up his files and books. Now with a pair of scissors and some tape, he was putting together a presentation he hoped would not only impress Winston, but convince her of something McCaleb was having a difficult time believing himself. In a way, Putting together the presentation was a dress rehearsal for putting on a case. In that respect, McCaleb found the time he labored over what he would show and say to Winston very useful. It allowed him to see logic holes and prepare answers for the questions he knew Winston would ask. While he considered exactly what he would say to Winston, she called on his cell phone. We might have a break on the owl. Maybe, maybe not. What is it? The distributor in Middleton, Ohio, thinks he knows where it came from. A place right here in Carson called Bird Barrier. Why does he think that? Because Kurt faxed photos of our bird, and the man he was dealing with in Ohio noticed that the bottom of the mold was open. Okay, what's it mean? Well... Apparently, these are shipped with the base enclosed so the base can be filled with sand so the bird stands up in wind and rain and whatever. I understand. Well, they have one sub-distributor who orders the owls with the bottom of the base punched out. Bird barrier. They take them with the open base because they fit the owls on top of some kind of gizmo that shrieks. What do you mean, shrieks? You know. Like a real owl. I guess it helps really scare birds away. You know what Bird Barrier's slogan is? Number one when it comes to birds going number two. Cute, huh? That's how they answer the phone there. McCaleb's mind was churning too quickly to register humor. He didn't laugh. This place is in Carson? Right, not far from your marina. I've got to go to a meeting now but I was going to drop by before coming to see you. You want to meet there instead? Can you make it over in time? That would be good. I'll be there. She gave him the address, which was about 15 minutes from Cabrillo Marina, and they agreed to meet there at two. She said that the company's president, a man named Cameron Riddell, had agreed to see them. Are you bringing the owl with you? Michaela asked. Guess what, Terry? I've been a detective going on twelve years now. And I've had a brain even longer. Sorry. See you, too. After clicking off the phone, McCaleb took a leftover tamale out of the freezer, cooked it in the microwave, and then wrapped it in foil and put it in his leather bag for eating while crossing the bay. He checked on his daughter, who was in the family room, sleeping in the arms of their part-time nanny, Mrs. Perez. He touched the baby's cheek and left. Bird Barrier was located in a commercial and upscale warehouse district that hugged the eastern side of the 405 freeway, just below the airfield where the Goodyear blimp was tethered. 
The blimp was in its place, and McCaleb could see the leashes that held it straining against the afternoon wind coming down out of the mountains. When he pulled into the bird barrier lot, he noticed an LTD with commercial hubs that he knew had to be Jay Winston's car. He was right. She was sitting in a small waiting room when he came in through a glass door. On the floor next to her chair was a briefcase and a cardboard box sealed at the top with red tape marked Evidence. She immediately got up and went to a reception window through which McCaleb could see a seated young man wearing a telephone headset. Can you tell Mr. Riddell we're both here? The young man, who was apparently on a call, nodded to her. A few minutes later, they were ushered into Cameron Riddell's office. McCaleb carried the box. Winston made the introductions, calling McCaleb her colleague. It was the truth, but it also concealed his badgeless status. Riddell was a pleasant-looking man in his mid-thirties who seemed anxious to help in the investigation. Winston put on a pair of latex gloves from her briefcase, then ran a key along the red tape on the box and opened it. She removed the owl and placed it on Riddell's desk. What can you tell us about this, Mr. Riddell? Riddell remained standing behind his desk and leaned across to look at the owl. I can't touch it? Tell you what. Why don't you put these on? Winston opened her briefcase and took out another pair of gloves from the cardboard dispenser and handed them to Riddell. Michaela just watched, having decided that he would not jump in unless Winston asked him or she made an obvious omission during the interview. Riddell struggled with the gloves, slowly putting them on. Sorry, Winston said. They're medium. You look like a large... Once he had the gloves on, Riddell picked the owl up with both hands and studied the underside of the base. He looked up into the hollow plastic mold and then held the bird directly in front of him, seemingly studying the painted eyes. He then placed it down on the corner of the desk and went back around to his seat. He sat down and pressed a button on an intercom. Monique, it's Cameron. Can you go to the back and get one of the screeching owls off the line and bring it in to me? I need it now, too. On my way. Riddell took off the gloves and flexed his fingers. He then looked at Winston. Having sensed that she was the important one, he gestured to the owl. Yes, it's one of ours, but it's been... I don't know what the word you would use would be. It's been changed. Modified? We don't sell them like this. How so? Well, Monique's getting us one so you can see, but essentially this one has been repainted a little bit and the screeching mechanism has been removed. Also, we have a proprietary label we attach here at the base, and that's gone. He pointed to the rear of the base. Let's start with the painting, Winston said. What was done? Before Riddell answered, there was a single knock on the door, and a woman came in carrying another owl which was wrapped in plastic. Riddell told her to put it down on the desk and remove the plastic. Michaela noticed that she made a face when she saw the painted black eyes of the owl Winston had brought. Riddell thanked her, and she left the office. Michaela studied the side-by-side -side owls. The evidence owl had been painted darker. The bird barrier owl had five colors on its feathers, including white and light blue, as well as plastic eyes with pupils rimmed in a reflective amber color. Also, the new owl was sitting atop a black plastic base. As you can see, the owl you brought has been repainted, Riddell said, especially the eyes. When you paint over them like that, you lose a lot of the effect. These are called foil reflect eyes. The layer of foil in the plastic catches light and gives the eyes the appearance of movement. So the birds think it is real. Exactly. You lose that when you paint them like this. We don't think the person that painted this was worried about birds. What else is different? Riddell just shook his head. Just that the plumage has been darkened quite a bit. You can see that. Yes. 
Now, you said the mechanism has been removed. What mechanism? We get these from Ohio, and then we paint them and attach one of two mechanisms. What you see here is our standard model. Riddell picked the owl up and showed them the underside. The black plastic base swiveled as he turned it. It made a loud screeching sound. Hear the screech? Yes, that's enough, Mr. Riddell. Sorry, but you see, the owl sits on this base and reacts to the wind. As it turns, it emits the screech and sounds like a predator. Works well, as long as the wind is blowing. We also have a deluxe model with an electronic insert in the base. It contains a speaker that emits recorded sounds of predator birds like the hawk. No reliance on wind. Can you get one without either one of the inserts? Yes, you can purchase a replacement that fits over one of our proprietary bases in case the owl is damaged or lost. With exposure, particularly in marine settings, the paint lasts two to three years, and after that the owl might lose some of its effectiveness. You have to repaint or simply get a new owl. The reality is the mold is the least expensive part of the ensemble. Winston looked over at McCaleb. He had nothing to add or ask in the line of questioning she was pursuing. He simply nodded at her, and she turned back to Riddell. Okay, then. I think we want to see if there's a method of tracing this owl from this point to its eventual owner. Riddell looked at the owl for a long moment, as if it might be able to answer the question itself. Well, that could be difficult. It's a commodity item. We sell several thousand a year. We ship to retail outlets as well as sell through mail order catalogs and an internet website. He snapped his fingers. There is one thing that will cut it down some, though. What's that? They changed the mold last year in China. They did some research and decided the horned owl was considered a higher threat to other birds than the roundhead. They changed to the horns. I'm not quite following you, Mr. Riddell. He held up a finger, as if to tell her, wait a moment. He then opened a desk drawer and dug through some paperwork. He came out with a catalog and quickly started turning pages. McCaleb saw that Bird Barrier's primary business was not plastic owls, but large-scale bird deterrent systems that encompassed netting and wire coils and mesh. Riddell found the page showing the plastic owls and turned the catalog so that Winston and McCaleb could view it. This is last year's catalog, he said. You see the owl has the round head. The manufacturer changed last June about seven months ago. Now we have these guys. He pointed to the two owls on the table. The feathering turns up into the two points or ears on the top of the head. The sales rep said these are called horns and that these types of owls are sometimes called devil owls. Winston glanced at McCaleb, who raised his eyebrows momentarily. So you're saying this owl we have was ordered or bought since June, she said to Riddell. More like since August or maybe September. They changed in June, but we probably didn't start receiving the new mold until late July. We also would have sold off our existing supplies of the roundhead first. Winston then questioned Riddell about sales records and determined that information from mail order and website purchases were kept complete and current on the company's computer files. But point-of-purchase sales from shipments to major hardware and home and marine products retailers would obviously not be recorded. He turned to the computer on his desk and typed in a few commands. He then pointed to the screen, though McCaleb and Winston were not at angles where they could see it. All right, I asked for sales of those part numbers since August 1, he said. Part numbers? Yes, for the standard and deluxe models, and then the replacement molds. We show we self-shipped 414 total. We also shipped 600 even to retailers. And what you're telling us 
is that we can only trace, through you at least, the 414. Correct. You have the names of buyers and the addresses the owls were shipped to there? Yes, we do. And are you willing to share this information with us without need of a court order? Riddell frowned as if the question was absurd. You said you're working on a murder, right? Right. We don't require a court order. If we can help, we want to help. That's very refreshing, Mr. Riddell. They sat in Winston's car and reviewed the computer printouts Riddell had given them. The evidence box containing the owl was between them on the seat. There were three printouts divided by orders for the deluxe, standard, or replacement owls. McCaleb asked to see the replacement list because his instincts told him the owl in Edward Gunn's apartment had been bought for the express purpose of playing a part in the murder scene, and therefore no attached mechanisms were needed. Additionally, the replacement owl was the least expensive. We better find something here, Winston said as her eyes scanned the list of purchasers of the standard owl model. Because chasing down buyers through the Home Depots and other retailers is going to mean court orders and lawyers and... Hey, the Getty's on here. They ordered four. McCaleb looked over at her and thought about that. Finally, he shook his shoulders and went back to his list. Winston moved on as well, continuing her listing of the difficulties they would face if they had to go to the retail outlets where the horned owl was sold. McCaleb tuned her out when he got to the third to the last name on his list. He traced his finger from a name he recognized along a line on the printout, detailing the address the owl was shipped to, method of payment, origin of purchase order, and the name of the person receiving it if different from purchaser. His breath must have caught, because Winston picked up on his vibe. What? I got something here. He held the printout across the seat to her and pointed to the line. This buyer, Jerome Van Aken, he had one shipped the day before Christmas to Gunn's address and apartment number. The order was paid for by a money order. She took the printout from him and started reading the information. Shipped to the Sweetser address, but to a Lubert Das, care of Edward Gunn. Lubert Das. Nobody named Lubert Das came up in the investigation. I don't remember that name on the residence list of that building, either. I'll call Rorschach to see if Gunn ever had a roommate with that name. Don't bother. Lubert Das never lived there. She looked up from the pages and over at him. You know who Lubert Das is? Sort of. Her brow creased deeply. Sort of? Sort of? What about Jerome Van Aken? He nodded. Winston dropped the pages on the box between them. She looked at him with a face that imparted both curiosity and annoyance. Well, Terry, I think it's about time you started telling me what you know. McCaleb nodded again and put his hand on the door handle. Why don't we go over to my boat? We can talk there. Why don't we talk right here, right fucking now? McCaleb tried a small smile on her. Because it's what you'd call an audiovisual demonstration. He opened the door and got out, then looked back in at her. I'll see you over there, okay? She shook her head. You better have one hell of a profile worked out for me. Then he shook his head. I don't have a profile ready for you yet, Jay. Then what do you have? A suspect. He closed the door then, and he could hear her muffled curses as he walked to his car. As he crossed the parking lot, a shadow fell over him and everything else. He looked up to see the Goodyear blimp cross overhead, totally eclipsing the sun. Chapter 17
They reconvened fifteen minutes later on the following sea. But Caleb got out some cokes and told Winston to sit on the stuffed chair at the end of the coffee table in the salon. In the parking lot, he had told her to bring the plastic owl with her to the boat. He now used two paper towels to remove it from its box and place it on the table in front of her. Winston watched him, her lips tight with annoyance. McCaleb told her he understood her anger at being manipulated on her own case, but added that she would be back in control of things as soon as he presented his findings. All I can say, Terry, is that this better be fucking good. He remembered that he had once noted on the inside file flap on the first case he ever worked with her that she was prone to using profanity when under stress. He'd also noted that she was smart and intuitive. He hoped now that those observations hadn't changed. He stepped over to the counter where he had his presentation file waiting. He opened it and took the top sheet over to the coffee table. He pushed the bird barrier printout aside and put the sheet down at the base of the plastic owl. What do you think? This our bird? Winston leaned forward to study the color image he had put down. It was an enlarged detail from the Bosch painting The Garden of Earthly Delights, showing the nude man embracing the dark owl with shining black eyes. He had cut it and other details from the Marinison book. He watched as Winston's eyes moved back and forth between the plastic owl and the detail from the painting. I'd say it's a match, she finally said. Where'd you get this, the Getty? You should have told me about this yesterday, Terry. What the fuck is going on? McCaleb raised his hands in a calming gesture. I'll explain everything. Just let me show you this stuff the way I want to. Then I'll answer any question you ask. She waved a hand, indicating he could go on. He went over to the counter and got the second sheet and brought it over. He put it down in front of her. Same painter, different painting. She looked. It was a detail from the Last Judgment depicting the sinner bound in the reverse fetal position, waiting to be delivered to hell. Don't do this to me. Who painted these? I'll tell you in a minute. He went back to the counter and the file. Is this guy still alive? She called after him. He walked the third sheet over and put it down on the table next to the other two. He's been dead about five hundred years. Jesus! She picked up the third sheet and looked closely at it. It was the full copy of the Seven Deadly Sins tabletop. That's supposed to be God's eye seeing all the sins of the world, McCaleb explained. You recognize the words in the center, running around the iris? Beware. Beware. She whispered the translation. Oh, God. We've got a real nut here. Who is this? One more. This one really falls into place now. He went back to the file for the fourth time and came back with another reproduction of a painting from the Bosch book. He handed it to her. It's called the Stone Operation. In medieval times, it was believed by some that an operation to remove a stone from the brain was a cure for stupidity and deceit. Note the location of the incision. I noted, I noted, just like our guy. What's all of this around here? She traced the exterior of the circular painting with a finger. In the outer black margin were words that were once ornately painted in gold, but which had deteriorated over time to almost be indecipherable. The translation is, Master, cut out the stone. My name is Lubert Doss. The critical literature on the painter who created this piece notes that in his time the name Lubert was a derisive name, applied to those who were perverted or stupid. Winston put the sheet down on top of the others and raised her hands, palms out. All right, Terry, enough. Who is the painter and who is this suspect you say you've come up with? 
Caleb nodded. It was time. The painter's name was Jerome Van Aken. He was Netherlandish, considered to be one of the greats of the Northern Renaissance, but his paintings were dark, full of monsters and phantasmic demons. Owls, too. Lots of owls. The literature suggests the owls found in his painting symbolized everything from evil to doom to the fall of mankind. He sorted through the sheets on the coffee table and held up the detail of the man embracing the owl. This kind of says it all about him. Man's embracing of evil, the devil owl, to use Mr. Riddell's description, leads to the inevitable destiny of hell. Here's the whole painting. He went back to the file and brought to her the full copy of the Garden of Earthly Delights. He watched her eyes as she studied the images. He saw repulsion as well as fascination. He pointed out the four owls he had found in the painting, including the detail he'd already shown her. She suddenly pulled the sheet aside and looked at him. Wait a minute. I know I've seen this before. In a book or maybe an art class I took at CSUN. But I never heard of this Van Aken, I don't think. He painted this? McCaleb nodded. The Garden of Earthly Delights. Van Aken painted it. But you never heard of him because he wasn't known by his real name. He used the Latin version of Jerome and took the name of his hometown for a last name. He was known as Hieronymus Bosch. She just looked at him for a long moment, as it all clicked together. The images he had shown her, the names on the printout, her knowledge of the Edward Gunn case. Bosch, she said, almost as an expulsion of breath. Is Hieronymus? She didn't finish. McCaleb nodded. Yeah, that's Harry's real name. They were both pacing in the salon now, heads down but careful not to collide, talking in sprints, a bad but fast-moving jazz in their blood. This is too far out there, McCaleb. Do you know what you are saying? I know exactly what I'm saying, and don't think that I didn't think long and hard about it before I said it. I consider him to be a friend, Jay. There was... I don't know. At one time, I thought we were a lot alike. But look at this stuff. Look at the connections, the parallels. It fits. It all fits. He stopped and looked at her. She kept pacing. He's a cop. A homicide cop, for God's sake. What? Are you going to tell me it's beyond the realm because he's a cop? This is Los Angeles, the modern garden of earthly delights. With all the same temptations and demons. You don't even have to go beyond the city limits for examples of cops crossing the line, dealing drugs, robbing banks, even murder. Does the word rampart ring a bell with you? I know, I know. It's just that... She didn't finish. At minimum, it fits well enough that you know we have to take a good hard look. She stopped and looked back at him. We... Forget it, Terry. I asked you to take a look at the book, not run down the leads. You're out after this. Look, if I didn't run some of this down, you'd have nothing. This owl would still be sitting on top of that guy Rorschach's other building. I'll give you that, and thank you very much. But you're a civilian. You're out. I'm not walking away, Jay. If I'm the one who puts Bosch under the glass, that I'm not walking away from it. Winston sat down heavily in the chair. All right. Can we talk about that when and if we come to it? I'm still not sold on this. Good, I'm not either. Well, you sure made a nice show of giving me the pictures and building your case. All I'm saying is that Harry Bosch is connected to this, and that cuts two ways. One, he did it. Two, he's been set up. He's been a cop a long time. Twenty-five, thirty years. The list of people he's put in the penitentiary has got to be a yard long, and the ones who have been in and out is probably half the list. It'll take a fucking year to run all of them down. 
Caleb nodded. And don't think he didn't know that. She looked up sharply at him. He started pacing again, his head down. After too long a silence, he glanced up and saw her staring at him. What? You really like Bosch for this, don't you? You know something else. No, I don't. I'm trying to stay open. All avenues of possibility need to be pursued. Bullshit. You're driving down one avenue. McCaleb didn't answer. He felt enough guilt about it without Winston having to apply more. Okay, she said. Then why don't you step it out for me? And don't worry, I'm not going to hold it against you when you end up wrong. He stopped and looked at her. Come on, step it out for me. But Caleb shook his head. I'm not all the way there yet. All I know is that what we have here is way, way beyond the realm of coincidence, so there has to be an explanation. So tell me the explanation involving Bosch. I know you. You've been thinking about it. All right. But remember, it's all theory at this point. I'll remember. Go. First of all, you start with Detective Hieronymus Bosch believing, no, make that knowing, that this guy, Edward Gunn, walked on a homicide. Okay. Then you have Gunn turn up strangled and looking like a figure out of a picture by the painter, Hieronymus Bosch. You throw in one plastic owl and at least a half dozen other connection points between the two Boshes, let alone the name, and there it is. What's there? Those connections don't mean it was Bosch who did it. You said it yourself. Someone could have set this up for us to find and put on Bosch. I don't know what it is. Gut instinct, I guess. There's something about Bosch. Something off the page. He remembered how Foscular described the paintings. A darkness more than night. What's that supposed to mean? McCaleb waved off the question. He reached over and picked up the detail of the owl embraced by the man. He held it up in front of her face. Look at the darkness there in the eyes. There's something about Harry that is the same. Now you're getting downright spooky, Terry. What are you saying? In a previous life, Harry Bosch was a painting? I mean, listen to what you are saying here. He put the sheet back down and stepped away from her, shaking his head. I don't know how to say it, he said. There's just something there, a connection of some kind between them that's more than the name. He made a motion of waving away the thought. All right, then let's move on, Winston said. Why now, Terry? If it is Bosch, why now? And why Gunn? He walked away from him six years ago. It's interesting that you say walked away from him and not justice. I didn't mean anything by it. You just like to take, why now? Who knows? But there was that re-encounter the night before in the drunk tank, and before that, there was the time in October, and it goes further back. Whenever this guy ended up in the can, Bosch was there. But on that last night, Gunn was too drunk to talk. Says who? She nodded. They only had Bosch's account of the drunk tank encounter. All right, fine. But why gun? I mean, I don't want to put a qualitative judgment on a murderer or his victims, but come on. The guy stabbed a prostitute in a Hollywood hot sheet hotel. We all know that some count more than others, and this one couldn't have counted for much. If you read the book, you saw her own family didn't even care about her. Then there's something missing. Something else that we don't know because Harry cared. I don't think he's the kind who ever counts one case, one person more important than another anyway. But there's something about Gunn we don't know yet. There has to be. Six years ago, it was enough for Harry to shove his lieutenant through a window and take a suspension for it. It was enough for him to visit Gunn every time he got hooked up and put in a cell. McCaleb nodded to himself. We need to find the trigger, the stressor. 
the thing that forced the action now as opposed to a year ago, two years ago, whenever. Winston abruptly stood up. Would you stop saying we? And you know, there is something you are conveniently missing here. Why would this man, this veteran cop and homicide detective, kill this guy and leave all of these clues leading back to himself? It makes no sense. Not with Harry Bosch. He'd be too smart for that. Only from this side of it. These things may only seem obvious now that we've discovered them. And you're forgetting the act of murder itself is evidence of aberrant thinking, of a dissembling personality. If Harry Bosch has veered off the path and crashed into the ditch, into the abyss, then we can't assume anything about his thinking or planning of a murder. His leaving of these markers could be symptomatic. She waved off his explanation. That's the Quantico dance there. Too much mumbo-jumbo. Winston picked the copy of The Garden of Earthly Delights off the table and studied it. I talked to Harry about this case two weeks ago, she said. You talked to him yesterday. He wasn't exactly climbing the walls and foaming at the mouth. And look at this trial he's riding now. He's cool, calm, and he has his shit together. Know what some of the guys in the office call him, the ones who know him? The Marlboro Man. Yeah, well, he stopped smoking. And maybe this story case was the stressor. A lot of pressure. It's got to come out someplace. But Caleb could tell she wasn't listening. Her eyes had caught on something in the painting. She dropped the sheet and picked up the detail of the dark owl embraced by the nude man. Let me ask you something, she said. If our guy sent the owl directly from that warehouse to our victim, then how the fuck did it get this nice custom paint job? McCaleb nodded. Good question. He must have painted it right there in the apartment. Maybe while watching Gunn try to stay alive. There was no paint like this found in the apartment, and we checked the building's dumpster, too. I saw no paint. He took it with him. Got rid of it somewhere else. Or maybe plans to use it again on the next one. She paused and thought for a long moment. McCaleb waited. So what do we do? She finally asked. So it's we now. For now. I changed my mind. I can't take this inside. Too dangerous. If it's wrong, I could kiss everything goodbye. McCaleb nodded. Do you and your partner have other cases? We've got three open files, including this one. Well, put them on one of the others while you work this one, with me. We work on Bosch until we have something solid, one way or the other, that you can take in and make official. And what do I do? Call up Harry Bosch and tell him I need to talk to him because he's a suspect in a murder? I'll take Bosch first. It will be less obvious if I make the first run. Let me get a feel for him, and who knows? Maybe my current instincts will be wrong. Or maybe I'll find the trigger. That's easier said than done. We move too close, and he'll know. I don't want this blowing up in our faces. My face, in particular. That's where I can be an advantage. Yeah, how so? I'm not a cop. I'll be able to get closer to him. I need to get inside his house, see how he lives. Meantime, you... Wait a minute. You're not talking about breaking into his house. I can't be a party to that. No, nothing illegal. Then how are you going to get in? Knock on the door. Good luck. What were you going to say? Meantime, I do what? You work the outside line, the obvious stuff. Trace down the money order for the owl. Find out more about Gunn and the murder six years ago. Find out about the incident between Harry and his old lieutenant. And find out about the lieutenant. Harry said the guy went out one night and ended up dead in a tunnel. Damn, I remember that. That was related to Gunn? I don't know. But Bosch made some kind of elliptical reference to it yesterday. I can pull stuff on it and I can ask questions about the other stuff. 
but any one of these moves could get back to Bosch. McCaleb nodded. He thought it was a risk that had to be taken. You know anybody who knows him? He said. She shook her head in annoyance. Look, don't you remember? Cops are a paranoid people. The minute I ask one question about Harry Bosch, people are going to know what we are doing. Not necessarily. Use the story case. It's high profile. Maybe you've been watching the guy on TV and he doesn't look so good. Is he all right? What's going on with him like that? Make it like you're gossiping. She didn't look mollified. She stepped over to the sliding door and looked out across the marina. She leaned her forehead against the tinted glass. I know his former partner, she said. There's an informal group of women who get together once a month. We all work homicide from all the local departments. About a dozen of us. Harry's old partner, Kiz Ryder, just got moved from Hollywood to robbery homicide, the big time. But I think they were close. He was kind of a mentor. I might be able to hit on her, if I use a little finesse. McCaleb nodded and thought of something. Harry told me he was divorced. I don't know how long ago, but you could ask Ryder about him, like, you know, you're interested and what's he like, that sort of thing. You ask like that and she might give you the real lowdown. Winston looked away from the slider and back at McCaleb. Yeah, that will make us good friends when she finds out it was all bullshit and I was setting up on her ex-partner, her mentor. If she's a good cop, she'll understand. You had to either clear him or bag him. And either way, you wanted to do it as quietly as possible. Winston looked back out the door. I'm going to need deniability on this. Meaning? Meaning if we do this, and you go in there and it all blows up, I need to be able to walk away. McCaleb nodded. He wished she hadn't said it, but he could see her need to protect herself. I'm just telling you up front, Terry. If it all goes to hell, it's going to look like you overstepped, that I asked you to take a look at the book and you went off on your own. I'm sorry, but I have to protect myself here. I understand, Jay. I can live with it. I'll take my chances. Chapter 18 Winston was silent for a long time while she stared out the salon's door. McCaleb sensed that she was building up to something and just waited. I'll tell you a story about Harry Bosch, she finally said. The first time I ever met him was about four years ago. It was a joint case. Two kidnapped murders. The one in Hollywood was his, the one in West Hollywood was mine. Young women. Girls, really. Physical evidence tied the cases together. We were basically working them separately, but would meet for lunch every Wednesday to compare notes. Did you profile it? Yeah. This was when Maggie Griffin was still out here in the Bureau. She worked something up for us. The usual. Anyway, things heated up when a third one disappeared. A 17-year-old this time. The evidence from the first two indicated the doer was keeping them alive four or five days before he got tired of them and killed them. So we had a big clock on us. We got reinforcements and we were running down common denominators. McCaleb nodded. It sounded as though they were going by the book on tracking a serial. A long shot came up, she said. All three of the victims used the same dry cleaner on Santa Monica near La Cienega. The latest, the girl, had a summer job at Universal and took her uniforms in for dry cleaning. Anyway, before we even went in there to the management, we went into the employee parking lot and took down tags to run, just in case we got something before we had to go in and announce ourselves. And we got a hit. The manager himself. He'd gotten popped about ten years before on a public indecency. We pulled the jacket, and it was a garden-variety flasher case. 
He pulled up in a car next to a bus stop and opened the door so the woman on the bench could get a look at his Johnson. Turned out she was an undercover. They knew a wagger was working the neighborhood and put out decoys. Anyway, he got probation and counseling. He lied about it on his application at the job and over the years worked his way up to manager of the shop. Higher job, higher stress, higher level of offense. That's what we thought, but we didn't have any evidence. So Bosch had an idea. He said all of us, me, him, and our partners, would go see this guy. His name was Hagen at his home. He said an FBI agent once told him to always brace a suspect at home if you get the chance because sometimes you get more from the surroundings than you get from their mouths. McCaleb suppressed a smile. It had been a lesson he learned on the Cielo Azul case. So we followed Hagen home. He lived over in Los Feliz in a big old rundown house off Franklin. This was the fourth day of the third woman's disappearance, so we knew we were running out of time. We knocked on his door, and the plan was to act like we didn't know about his record, and that we were just there to enlist his help in checking out employees in the shop. You know, to see how he reacted, or if he made a slip. Right. Well, we were in there in this guy's living room, and I was doing most of the talking because Bosch wanted to see how the guy took it. You know, a woman in control. And we weren't there but five minutes when Bosch suddenly stood up and said, It's him. She's here somewhere. And when he said that, Hagen up and bolted for the door. He didn't get far. Was it a bluff or part of the plan? Neither. Bosch just knew. On this little table next to the couch was one of those baby monitor things, you know. Bosch saw that, and he just knew. It was the wrong end. It was the transmitter part. It meant the receiver was somewhere else. If you have a kid, it's the other way around. You listen in the living room for noise from the baby room, but this was backwards. The profile from Griffin said this guy was a controller, that he likely used verbal coercion on his victim. Bosch saw that transmitter and something just clicked. This guy had her somewhere and got off on talking to her. He was right, dead on. We found her in the garage in an unplugged freezer with three air holes drilled in it. It was like a coffin. The receiver part of the monitor was in there with her. She later told us that he talked to her incessantly whenever he was in the house. He sang to her, too, top forties. He'd change the words and sing about raping and killing her. McCaleb nodded. He wished he'd been there on the case, for he knew what Bosch had felt, that sudden moment of coalescing when the atoms smashed together. When you just knew. A moment as thrilling as it was dreadful. The moment every homicide detective privately lives for. The reason I tell this story is because of what Bosch did and said after. Once we had Hagen in the back seat of one of the cars and started searching the house, Bosch stayed in the living room with that baby monitor. He turned it on and he spoke to her. He never stopped until we found her. He said, Jennifer, we're here, it's all right. Jennifer, we're coming. You're safe and we're coming for you. Nobody's going to hurt you. He never stopped talking to her, soothing her like that. She stopped for a long moment, and McCaleb saw her eyes were on the memory. After we found her, we all felt so good. It was the best high I've ever had on this job. I went to Bosch and said, you must have kids. You spoke to her like she was one of your own. And he just shook his head and said no. He said, I just know what it's like to be alone and in the dark. Then he sort of walked away. She looked from the door back at McCaleb. You're talking about darkness reminded me of that. He nodded. 
what do we do if we come to a point that we know flat out that it was him? She asked, her face turned back to the glass. McCaleb answered quickly so that he wouldn't have to think about the question. I don't know, he said. After Winston had put the plastic owl back in the evidence box, gathered all of the pages he had shown her, and left, McCaleb stood at the sliding door and watched her make her way up the ramp to the gate. He checked his watch and saw there was a lot of time before he needed to get ready for the night. He decided he would watch some of the trial on court TV. He looked back out the door and saw Winston putting the evidence box into the trunk of her car. Behind him, somebody cleared his throat. McCaleb abruptly turned, and there was Buddy Lockridge in the stairwell, looking up at him from the lower deck. He had a pile of clothes clasped in his arms. Buddy, what the hell are you doing? Man, that's one weird case you're working on. I said, what the hell are you doing? I was going to do laundry, and I came over here because half my stuff was down in the cabin. Then you two showed up, and when you started talking, I knew I couldn't come up. He held the pile of clothes in his arms up as proof of his story. So I just sat down there on the bed and waited. And listened to everything we said. It's a crazy case, man. What are you going to do? I've seen that Bosch guy on court TV. He kind of looks like he's wound a little too tight. I know what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to talk about this with you. He pointed to the glass door. Leave, buddy, and don't tell a word of this to anybody. You understand me? Sure, I understand. I was just leaving. Sorry, man. So am I. McCaleb opened the slider and Lockridge walked out like a dog with his tail between his legs. McCaleb had to hold himself back from kicking him in the rear. Instead... He angrily slid the door closed, and it banged loudly in its frame. He stood there looking out through the glass until he saw Lockridge make it all the way up the ramp and over to the facilities building where there was a coin laundry. His eavesdropping had compromised the investigation. McCaleb knew he should page Winston immediately and tell her, see how she wanted to handle it. But he let it go. The truth was he didn't want to make any move that might take him out of the investigation. Chapter 19 After putting his hand on the Bible and promising the whole truth, Harry Bosch took a seat in the witness chair and glanced up at the camera mounted on the wall above the jury box. The eye of the world was upon him, he knew. The trial was being broadcast live on court TV and locally on Channel 9. He tried to give no appearance of nervousness, but the fact was that more than the jurors would be studying him and judging his performance and personality. It was the first time in many years of testifying in criminal trials that he didn't feel totally at ease. Being on the side of the truth was not a comfort when he knew the truth had to run a treacherous obstacle course set before it by a wealthy, connected defendant and his wealthy, connected attorney. He put the blue binder, the murder book, down on the front ledge of the witness box and pulled the microphone toward him, creating a high-pitched squeal that hurt every set of ears in the courtroom. Detective Bosch, please don't touch the microphone, Judge Houghton intoned. Sorry. A deputy sheriff who acted as the judge's bailiff came over to the witness box, turned the microphone off, and adjusted its location. When Bosch nodded at its new position, the bailiff turned it back on. The judge's clerk then asked Bosch to state his full formal name and spell it for the record. Very well the judge said after Bosch finished. Ms. Langweiser? Deputy District Attorney Janice Langweiser got up from the prosecution table and went to the attorney's lectern. She carried a yellow legal tablet with her questions on it. She was second seat at the prosecution table, but had worked with the investigators since the start of the case. 
it was decided that she would handle Bosch's testimony. Langweiser was a young, up-and-coming lawyer in the DA's office. In the span of a few short years, she had risen from a position of filing cases for more experienced lawyers in the office to handle to taking them all the way to court herself. Bosch had worked with her before on a politically sensitive and treacherous case known as the Angel's Flight Murders. The experience resulted in his recommendation of her as second chair to Kretzler. Since working together again, Bosch had found his earlier impressions were well-founded. She had complete command and recall of the facts of the case. While most other lawyers would have to shift through evidence reports to locate a piece of information, she would have the information and its location in the reports memorized. But her skill was not focused on the minutia of the case. She never took her eyes off the big picture. The fact that all their efforts were focused on putting David's story away for good. Good afternoon, Detective Bosch. She began. Could you please tell the jury a bit about your career as a police officer? Bosch cleared his throat. Yes, I've been with the Los Angeles Police Department 28 years. I have spent more than half of that time investigating homicides. I'm a Detective Three assigned to the Homicide Squad of the Hollywood Division. What does Detective Three mean? It means Detective Third Grade. It's the highest detective rank, equivalent to sergeant, but there are no detective sergeants in the LAPD. From Detective Three, the next rank up would be Detective Lieutenant. How many homicides would you say you've investigated in your career? I don't keep track. I would say at least a few hundred in 15 years. A few hundred? Langweiser looked over at the jury when she stressed the last word. Give or take a few. And as a Detective Three, you are currently a supervisor on the Homicide Squad? I have some supervisory duties. I am also the lead officer on a three-person team that handles homicide investigations. As such, you were in charge of the team that was called to the scene of a homicide on October 13th of last year, correct? That is correct. Bosch glanced over at the defense table. David Story had his head down and was using his felt-tip pen to draw on the sketch pad. He'd been doing it since jury selection began. Bosch's eyes traveled to the defendant's attorney and locked on those of J. Reason folks. Bosch held the stare until Langweiser asked her next question. This was the murder of Donatella Spears? Bosch looked back over at Langweiser. Correct. That was the name she used. It was not her real name? Bosch glanced out into the gallery seating and saw the victim's mother seated in the front row behind the prosecution table. She had come down from Fresno the night before. It was her stage name, I guess you would call it. She was an actress. She changed her name. Her real name was Jody Kremens. The judge interrupted and asked Bosch to spell the names for the court reporter. Then Langweiser continued. Tell us the circumstances of the call-out. Walk us through it, Detective Bosch. Where were you? What were you doing? How did this become your case? Bosch cleared his throat and had reached to the microphone to pull it closer when he remembered what happened the last time. He left the microphone where it was and leaned forward to it. My two partners and I were eating lunch at a restaurant called Musso and Frank's on Hollywood Boulevard. It was Friday, and we usually eat there if we have the time. At 11.48, my pager went off. I recognized the number as belonging to my supervisor, Lieutenant Grace Billets. 
While I was calling her, the pagers of my partners, Jerry Edgar and Kisman Ryder, also went off. At that point, we knew we'd probably drawn a case. I got a hold of Lieutenant Billets, and she directed my team to 1001 Nichols Canyon Road, where patrol officers had earlier responded along with paramedics to an emergency call at that location. They reported a young woman was found dead in her bed under suspicious circumstances. You then went to the address? No. I had driven all three of us to Moose House. So I drove back to the Hollywood station, which is a few blocks away, and dropped off my partners so they could get their own vehicles. Then all three of us proceeded separately to the address. You never know where you might have to go from a crime scene. It's good procedure for each detective to have his or her own car. At this time, did you know who the victim was or what the suspicious circumstances of her death were? No, I did not. What did you find when you got there? It was a small two-bedroom house overlooking the canyon. Two patrol cars were on the scene. The paramedics had already left once it was determined the victim was dead. Inside the house were two patrol officers and a patrol sergeant. In the living room, there was a woman seated on the couch. She was crying. She was introduced to me as Jane Gilly. She shared the house with Ms. Cremens. Bosch stopped there and waited for a question. Langweiser was bent over the prosecution table, whispering to her co-prosecutor, Roger Kretzler. Ms. Langweiser, does that conclude your questioning of Detective Bosch? Judge Houghton asked. Langweiser jerked upright, having not noticed that Bosch had stopped. No, Your Honor. She moved back to the lectern. Go on, Detective Bosch. Tell us what happened after you entered the house. I spoke to Sergeant Kim, and he informed me that there was a young woman who was deceased in her bed in the bedroom to the right rear of the house. He introduced the woman on the couch, and he said that his people had backed out of the bedroom without disturbing anything once the paramedics determined that the victim was dead. I then went down the short hallway to the bedroom and entered. What did you find in there? I saw the victim in the bed. She was a white female of slim build and blonde hair. Her identification would later be confirmed as Jody Cremens, age 23. Langweiser asked permission to show a set of photographs to Bosch. Houghton allowed it and he identified the police evidence photos as being that of the victim in situ, as the body had been seen at first by police. The body was face up. The bedclothes were pulled to the side to reveal the body to be nude, with the legs spread about two feet apart at the knees. The large breasts held their full shape despite the body being in a horizontal position, an indication of breast implants. The left arm was extended over the stomach. The palm of the left hand covered the pubic region. Two fingers of the left hand penetrated the vagina. The victim's eyes were closed, and her head rested on a pillow, but at a sharp angle to her neck. Wrapped tightly around her neck was a yellow scarf with one end looped up and over the top crossbar of the bed's headboard. The end of the scarf came off of the crossbar and extended to the victim's right hand on the pillow above her head. The end of the silk scarf was wrapped several times around the hand. The photographs were in color. A purplish red bruise could be seen on the victim's neck where the scarf had tightened against the skin. There was a rouge-like discoloration in and around the eye sockets. There was also a bluish discoloration running down the complete left side of the body, including the left arm and leg. 
After Bosch identified the photographs as being that of Jody Kremens in situ, Langweiser asked that they be shown to the jury. Jay Reason folks objected, stating that the photos would be highly inflammatory and prejudicial for jurors to see. The judge overruled the objection but told Langweiser to choose just one photo which would be representative of the lot. Langweiser chose the photo taken closest to the victim, and it was handed to a man who sat in the first seat of the jury. While the photo was slowly passed from juror to juror and then to the alternates, Bosch watched their faces tighten with shock and horror. He pushed back on his seat and drank from a paper cup of water. After he drained it, he caught the eye of the sheriff's deputy and signaled for a refill. He then pulled himself back close to the microphone. After the photo made its way through the jury, it was delivered to the clerk. It would be returned to the jurors, along with all other exhibits presented during the trial, during deliberation of a verdict. Bosch watched Langweiser return to the lectern to continue the questioning. He knew she was nervous. They'd had lunch together in the basement cafeteria of the other court building, and she had voiced her concerns. Though she was second seat to Kretzler, it was a big trial with potential career-enhancing or destroying aspects for both of them. She checked her legal pad before going on. Detective Bosch... Did there come a time after you had inspected the body that you declared the death to be subject to a homicide investigation? Right away, before my partners even got there. Why is that? Did it not appear to be an accidental death? No, it... Ms. Langweiser, Judge Houghton interrupted. One question at a time, please. Sorry, Your Honor. Detective, did it not appear to you that the woman may have accidentally killed herself? No, it did not. It appeared to me that someone attempted to make it look that way. Langweiser looked down at her pad for a long moment before going on. Bosch was pretty sure the pause was planned, now that the photograph and his testimony had secured the full attention of the jury. Detective, are you familiar with the term autoerotic asphyxia? Yes, I am. Could you please explain it to the jury? Folks stood up and objected. Yana, Detective Bosch may be a lot of things, but there has been no proffer made to the court that he is an expert in human sexuality. There was a murmur of quiet laughter in the courtroom. Bosch saw a couple of the jurors suppress smiles. Houghton hit his gavel once and looked at Langweiser. What about that, Ms. Langweiser? Your Honor, I can make a proffer. Proceed. Detective Bosch, you said you have worked hundreds of homicides. Have you investigated deaths that turned out not to be caused by homicide? Yes, probably hundreds of those as well. Accidental deaths, suicides, even deaths by natural causes. It is routine for a homicide detective to be called out to a death scene by patrol officers to help in making a determination as to whether a death should be investigated as a homicide. This is what happened in this case. The patrol officers and their sergeant weren't sure what they had. They called it in as suspicious, and my team got the call out. Have you ever been called out or investigated a death that was ruled either by you or the medical examiner's office an accidental death by autoerotic asphyxia? Yes. Folks stood up again. Same objection, Your Honor. This is leading to an area where Detective Bosch is not an expert. Your Honor, Langweiser said. 
It has clearly been established that Detective Bosch is an expert in the investigation of death. That would include all kinds. He has seen this before. He can testify to it. There was a note of exasperation in her voice. Bosch thought it was intended for the jury, not Houghton. It was a subliminal way of communicating to the Twelve that she wanted to get at the truth while others wanted to block the way. I tend to agree, Mr. Folks, Houghton said after a slight pause. Objections to this line of questioning are overruled. Proceed, Ms. Langweiser. Thank you, Your Honor. So then, Detective Bosch, are you familiar with cases of autoerotic asphyxia? Yes. I have worked on three or four. I've also studied the literature on the subject. It's referenced in books on homicide investigation techniques. I have also read summaries of in-depth studies conducted by the FBI and others. Was this before this case occurred? Yeah, before. What is autoerotic asphyxia? How does it occur? Ms. Langweiser, the judge began. Sorry, Your Honor, restating. What is autoerotic asphyxia, Detective Bosch? Bosch took a drink of water, using the time to draw his thoughts together. They had gone over these questions during lunch. It's an accidental death. It occurs when the victim attempts to increase sexual sensations during masturbation by cutting off or disrupting the flow of arterial blood to the brain. This is usually done with a form of ligature around the neck. The tightening of the ligature results in hypoxia, the diminishing of oxygenation of the brain. It's believed by people who... Uh, practice this, that hypoxia, the lightheadedness that ensues, heightens masturbatory sensations. However, it can lead to accidental death if the victim goes too far, to the point where he damages the carotid arteries and or passes out with the ligature still tightly in place, and asphyxiates. You said he, detective. But in this case, the victim is a woman. This case does not involve autoerotic asphyxia. The cases I have seen and investigated involving this form of death all involved male victims. Are you saying that in this case the death was made to look like autoerotic asphyxia? Yes, that was my immediate conclusion. It remains so today. Langweiser nodded and paused. Bosch sipped some water. As he brought the cup up to his mouth, he glanced at the jury. Everyone in the box seemed to be paying close attention. Walk us through it, detective. What led you to that conclusion? Can I refer to my reports? Please. Bosch opened the binder in front of him. The first four pages were the OIR, the Original Incident Report. He turned to the fourth page, which included the lead officer's summary. The report had actually been typed out by Kiz Ryder, though Bosch was the L.O. on the case. He quickly scanned the summary to refresh his mind, then looked up at the jury. Several things contradicted the death being an accident caused by autoerotic asphyxia. First off, I was immediately concerned because statistically it's rare that this occurs with female victims. It is not 100% males, but it's close. This knowledge made me pay very close attention to the body and the crime scene. Would it be fair to say you were immediately skeptical of the crime scene? Yes, that would be fair. Okay. Go on. What else concerned you? The ligature. 
in almost all cases involving this that I have been aware of firsthand or through the literature on the subject, the victim uses some sort of padding around the neck to prevent bruising or the breaking of the skin. Most often a piece of heavy clothing like a sweater or a towel is wrapped around the neck. The ligature is then wrapped around this padding. It prevents the ligature from making a contusion line running around the neck. In this case, there was no padding. And what did that mean to you? Well, it didn't make sense if you looked at it from the victim's viewpoint. I mean, if you were to assume that she had engaged in this activity, then the scene didn't make sense. It would mean that she didn't use any kind of padding because she didn't mind having the bruises on her neck. This, to me, was a contradiction between what we had there at the scene and common sense. Add in that she was an actress, which I knew right away because she had a stack of headshots on the bureau, and the contradiction was even greater. She relied on her physical presence and attributes while seeking acting work. That she would knowingly engage in an activity, sexual or otherwise, that would leave visible bruises on her neck, I just didn't buy it. That and other things led me to conclude the scene was a setup. Bosch looked over at the defense table. Story still had his head down and was working on the sketch pad as though he were sitting on a bench in a park somewhere. Bosch noticed Folks was writing on a legal tablet. Harry wondered if he had said something in his last answer that could somehow be turned against him. He knew Folks was an expert in taking phrases of testimony and giving them new meaning when taken out of context. What other things added to this conclusion? Langweiser asked him. Bosch looked at the OIR summary page again. The biggest single thing was the indication from post-mortem lividity that the body had been moved. In layman's terms, detective, what does post-mortem lividity mean? When the heart ceases to pump blood through the body... The blood then settles in the lower half of the body, depending on the position of the body. Over time, it creates a bruising effect on the skin. If the body is moved, the bruising remains in the original position because the blood has coagulated. Over time, the bruising becomes more apparent. What happened in this case? In this case, there was clear indication that the blood had settled in the left side of the body, meaning the victim's body had been lying on the left side at or shortly after the time of death. However, that was not the way the body was found, correct? That is correct. The body was found in the supine position, lying on the back. What did you conclude from this? That the body had been moved after death, that the woman had been positioned on her back as part of the setup to make her death look like an autoerotic asphyxiation. What did you think was the cause of death? At that point I wasn't sure. I just didn't think it was as presented. The bruising on the neck beneath the ligature led me to believe we were looking at a strangulation, just not at her own hands. At what point did your partners arrive on the scene? While I was making the initial observations of the body and crime scene. Did they come to the same conclusions as you? Folks objected, saying the question called for an answer that would be hearsay. The judge sustained the objection. Bosch knew it was a minor point. If Langweiser wanted the conclusions of Edgar and Ryder on the record, she could just call them to testify. Did you attend the autopsy of Jody Kremens's body? Yes, I did. 
He flipped through the binder until he found the autopsy protocol. On October 17th, it was conducted by Dr. Claudia Corazon, chief of the medical examiner's office. Was a cause of death determined by Dr. Corazon during autopsy? Yes. The cause of death was asphyxiation. She was strangled. By ligature? Yes. Now, doesn't this contradict your theory that the death was not caused by autoerotic asphyxiation? No, it confirmed it. The pose of autoerotic asphyxiation was used to cover the strangulation murder of the victim. The interior damage to both carotid arteries, to the muscular tissue of the neck and the hyoid bone, which was crushed, led Dr. Corazon to confirm that death was at the hand of another. The damage was too great to be knowingly self-inflicted. Bosch realized he was holding a hand to his neck as he described the injuries. He dropped it back down to his lap. Did the medical examiner find any independent evidence of homicide? He nodded. Yes. Examination of the victim's mouth determined that there was a deep laceration caused by biting on the tongue. Such injury is common in cases of strangulation. Langweiser flipped a page over on her tablet. Okay, Detective Bosch, let's go back to the crime scene. Did you or your partners interview Jane Gilly? Yes, I did, along with Detective Ryder. From that interview, were you able to ascertain where the victim had been in the 24 hours prior to the discovery of her death? Yes. We first determined that she had met the defendant several days earlier at a coffee shop. He invited her to attend a premiere of a movie as his date on the night of October 12th at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood. He picked her up between 7 and 7.30 that night. Ms. Gilly watched from a window in the house and identified the defendant. Did Ms. Gilly know when Ms. Cremens returned that night? No. Ms. Gilly left the house shortly after Ms. Cremens went on her date and spent the night elsewhere. Consequently, she didn't know when her roommate returned home. It was when Ms. Gilly returned to the house at 11 a.m. on October 13th that she discovered Ms. Cremens' body. What was the name of the movie which was premiered the night before? It was called Dead Point. And who directed it? David Story. Langweiser waited through a long pause before looking at her watch, and then up at the judge. Your Honor, she said, I am going to move into a new line of questioning now with Detective Bosch, if appropriate, this might be the best time to break for the day. Houghton pulled back the baggy black sleeve of his robe and looked at his watch. Bosch looked at his. It was a quarter to four. Okay, Ms. Langweiser, we'll adjourn until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Houghton told Bosch he could step down from the witness stand. He then admonished the jurors not to read newspaper accounts or watch TV reports on the trial. Everyone stood as the jurors filed out. Bosch, who was now standing next to Langweiser at the prosecution table, glanced over at the defense side. David Story was looking at him. His face betrayed no emotion at all. But Bosch thought he saw something in his pale blue eyes. He wasn't sure but he thought it was mirth. Bosch was the first to look away. Chapter 20 After the courtroom emptied, Bosch conferred with Langweiser and Kretzler about their missing witness. Anything yet? Kretzler asked. Depending on how long John Reason keeps you up there, 
We're going to need her tomorrow afternoon or the next morning. Nothing yet, Bosch said. But I've got something in the works. In fact, I'd better get going. I don't like this, Kretzler said. This could blow up. If she's not coming in, there's a reason. I've never been a hundred percent on her story. Story could have gotten to her, Bosch offered. We need her, Langweiser said. It shows pattern. You have to find her. I'm on it. He got up from the table to leave. Good luck, Harry, Langweiser said. And, by the way, so far I think you're doing very well up there. Bosch nodded. The calm before the storm. On his way down the hall to the elevators, Bosch was approached by one of the reporters. He didn't know his name, but he recognized him from the press seats in the courtroom. Detective Bosch! Bosch kept walking. Look, I've told everybody I'm not commenting until the trial's over. I'm sorry. You'll have to get... No, that's okay. I just wanted to see if you hooked up with Terry McCaleb. Bosch stopped and looked at the reporter. What do you mean? Yesterday. He was looking for you here. Oh, yeah, I saw him. You know Terry? Yeah, I wrote a book a few years ago about the Bureau. I met him then, before he got the transplant. Bosch nodded and was about to move on when the reporter put out his hand. Jack McAvoy! Bosch reluctantly shook his hand. He recognized the name. Five years earlier, the Bureau had tracked a serial cop killer to L.A., where it was believed he was about to strike his next victim, a Hollywood homicide detective named Ed Thomas. The Bureau had used information from McAvoy, a reporter for the Rocky Mountain News in Denver, to track the so-called poet, and Thomas's life was never threatened. He was retired from the force now and running a bookshop down in Orange County. Hey, I remember you, Bosch said. Ed Thomas is a friend of mine. Both men appraised each other. You're covering this thing? Bosch asked an obvious question. Yeah, for the New Times and Vanity Fair. I'm thinking about a book, too. So when it's all over, maybe we can talk. Yeah, maybe. Unless you're doing something with Terry on it. With Terry? No, that was something else yesterday. No book. Okay, then keep me in mind. McAvoy dug into his pocket for his wallet and then removed a business card. I work mostly out of my home in Laurel Canyon. Feel free to give me a call if you want. Bosch held the card up. Okay. I gotta go. See you around, I guess. Yeah. Bosch walked over and pushed the button for an elevator. He looked at the card again while he waited and thought about Ed Thomas. He then put the card into the pocket of his suit jacket. Before the elevator came, he looked down the hallway and saw McAvoy was still in the hallway, now talking to Rudy Teferro, the defense's investigator. Teferro was a big man, and he was leaning forward, close to McAvoy, as if it was some sort of conspiratorial rendezvous. McAvoy was writing in a notebook. The elevator opened and Bosch stepped on. He watched them until the doors closed. Bosch took Laurel Canyon Boulevard over the hill and dropped down into Hollywood ahead of the evening traffic. At sunset, he took a right and pulled to the curb a few blocks into West Hollywood. He fed the meter and went into the small, drab white office building across sunset from a strip bar. The two-story courtyard building catered to small production companies. They were small offices with small overheads. The companies lived from movie to movie. In between, there was no need for opulent offices and space. Bosch checked his watch and saw that he was right on time. It was quarter to five, and the audition was set for five. He took the stairs up to the second floor and went through a door with a sign that said, Nuff Said Productions on it. It was a three-room suite, one of the biggest in the building. Bosch had been there before and knew the layout. A waiting room with a secretary's desk, the office of Bosch's friend, Albert, Nuff said, and then a conference room. A woman behind the secretary's desk looked up at Bosch as he stepped in. I'm here to see Mr. Said. My name's Harry Bosch. She nodded and picked up the phone and punched a number. 
Bosch could hear it beep in the other room and recognize Sed's voice answering. It's Harry Bosch, the secretary said. Bosch heard Sed order her to send him in. He headed that way before she was off the phone. Go on in, she said to his back. Bosch stepped into an office that was furnished simply with a desk, two chairs, a black leather couch, and a television video console. The walls were crowded with framed one-sheet posters advertising Sed's movies, and other mementos, such as the back panels of the producer's chairs, with the names of the movies printed on them. Bosch had known Sed at least fifteen years, ever since the older man had hired him as a technical advisor on a movie thinly based on one of Bosch's cases. They had kept in touch sporadically over the ensuing decade, Said usually calling Bosch when he had a technical question about a police procedure he was using in a movie. Most of Said's productions were never seen on the silver screen. They were television and cable productions. Albert Said stood up behind the desk and Bosch extended his hand. Hey, enough. How's it going? Going fine, my friend. He pointed to the television. I watched your fine performance on court TV today. Bravo. He politely clapped his hands. Bosch waved the demonstration off and looked at his watch again. Thanks. So are we all set here? I believe so. Marjorie will have her wait for me in the conference room. You can take it from there. I appreciate this, Nuff. Let me know what I can do to square it. You can be in my next movie. You have a real presence, my friend. I watched the whole thing today. I taped it, if you would like to see for yourself. Nah, I don't think so. I don't think we'll have the time anyway. What have you got going these days? No, oh, you know, waiting for the light to turn green. I have a project I think is about to go with overseas financing. It's about this cop who gets sent to prison, and the trauma of being stripped of his badge and his respect and everything gives him amnesia. And so there he is in prison, and he can't remember which guys he's put there and which ones he didn't. He's in a constant fight to survive. The one convict who befriends him turns out to be a serial killer he sent there in the first place. It's a thriller, Harry. What do you think? Steven Seagal is reading the script. Sed's bushy black eyebrows were arched into sharp points on his forehead. He was clearly excited by the premise of the movie. I don't know enough, Bosch said. I think it's been done before. Everything's been done before. But what do you think? Bosch was saved by the bell. In the silence after Sed's question, they both could hear the secretary talking to someone in the next room. Then the speakerphone on Sed's desk beeped, and the secretary said, Miss Crow is here. She will be waiting in the conference room. Bosch nodded at Sed. Thanks, Snuff he whispered. I'll take it from here. Are you sure? I'll let you know if I need any help. He turned to the office door, but then went back to the desk and put out his hand. I may have to split kind of fast, so I'll say goodbye. Good luck with that project. Sounds like another winner. They shook hands. Yes, we shall see, said, said. Bosch left the office and crossed a small hallway and entered the conference room. There was a square, glass-top table at center with a chair on each side. Annabelle Crow sat in the chair on the side opposite the door. She was studying a black-and-white photograph of herself as Bosch entered. She looked up with a bright smile and perfect teeth. The smile held for a little longer than a second and then crashed off of her face like a Malibu mudslide. What? What are you doing here? Hello, Annabelle. How have you been? This is an audition. You can't just... You're right. This is an audition. I'm auditioning you for the role of a witness in a murder trial. The woman stood up. Her headshot and resume slipped off the table to the floor. You can't just... What is going on here? You know what's going on. You moved and left no forwarding. Your parents wouldn't help. Your agent wouldn't help me. The only way I could get to you was to set up an audition. Now sit down, and we're going to talk about where you've been and why you're ducking the trial. So there is no part? 
Bosch almost laughed. She still didn't get it. No, no part. And they're not remaking Chinatown? This time he did laugh, but quickly covered. One of these days they'll get around to it. But you're too young for the part, and I'm no Jake Giddies. Sit down, please. Bosch started to pull out the chair opposite hers, but she refused to sit down. She looked very put out. She was a beautiful young woman with a face that often got her what she wanted, but not this time. I said sit down, Bosch said sternly. You have to understand something here, Miss Crow. You broke the law when you did not respond to a court-issued subpoena to appear today. That means if I want, I can just place you under arrest and we can talk about this in lockup. Or the alternative is that we sit down here because they're letting us use the nice room and talk about this in a civilized manner. Your choice, Annabelle. She dropped back into her chair. Her mouth was a thin, tight line. The lipstick she had carefully painted on for a casting session was already starting to crack and wear. Bosch studied her for a long moment before beginning. Who got to you, Annabelle? She looked at him sharply. Look, she said, I was scared, okay? I still am. David Story is a powerful man. He has some scary people behind him. Bosch leaned across the table. Are you saying you were threatened by him? By them? No, I am not saying that. They didn't need to threaten me. I know the picture. Bosch leaned back away from her and quietly studied her. Her eyes moved everywhere around the room but to him. The traffic noise from out on sunset filtered through the room's one closed window. Somewhere in the building a toilet was flushed. Finally she looked at Bosch. What? What do you want? I want you to testify. I want you to make a stand against this guy. For what he tried to do to you. For Jody Kremens and Alicia Lopez. Who is Alicia Lopez? Another one we found. She wasn't lucky like you. Bosch could read the turmoil on her face. She clearly viewed testifying as some sort of danger. If I testify, I'll never work again, and maybe worse. Who told you that? She didn't answer. Come on, who? Did that come from them, your agent, who? She hesitated, and then shook her head like she couldn't believe she was talking to him. I was working out at Crunch, and I was on a Stairmaster, and this guy got on the machine next to me. He was reading the newspaper. It was folded to the story he was reading, and I was minding my own business when suddenly he just started talking. He never looked at me. He just talked while he was looking down at the newspaper. He said the story he was reading was about the David Story trial and how he'd hate to be a witness who went against him. He said that person would never work in this town again. She stopped, but Bosch waited. He studied her. Her anguish in recounting the story seemed genuine. She was on the verge of tears. And I... I got so panicked with him right there next to me, I just got off the machine and ran into the locker room. I stayed in there for an hour... And even then I was scared that he might still be out there waiting for me, watching me. She started crying. Bosch got up and left the room and looked into the bathroom in the hallway. There was a box of tissues. He took it back with him to the conference room and handed it to Annabelle Crow. He sat back down. Where is Crunch? Just down the street from here. Sunset and Crescent Heights. Bosch nodded. He knew where it was now the same shopping and entertainment complex where Jody Kremens had met David Story in a coffee shop. He wondered if there was a connection. Maybe Story belonged to Crunch. Maybe he got a workout pal to threaten Annabelle Crow. Did you get a look at the guy? Yes, but it doesn't matter. I don't know who he was. I never saw him before or since. Bosch thought about Rudy Tefero. Do you know... Who the defense team's investigator is? A guy named Rudy Tefero? He's tall, black hair, and a nice tan. Good-looking guy? I don't know who that is, but he's not the man who was there that day. This man was short and bald. He had glasses. 
The description didn't register with Bosch. He decided to let it go for the time being. He'd have to let Langweiser and Kretzler know about the threat. They might want to take it to Judge Houghton. They might want to have Bosch go to Crunch and start asking questions, see if he could confirm anything. So what are you going to do? she asked. Are you going to make me testify? It's not up to me. The prosecutors will decide after I tell them your story. Do you believe it? Bosch hesitated and then nodded. You still have to show up. You're under subpoena. Be there between 12 and 1 tomorrow, and they'll let you know what they want to do. Bosch knew that they would make her testify. They wouldn't care if the threat was real or not. They had the case to worry about. Annabelle Crow would be sacrificed to get David's story. A small fish to get a big fish. The name of the game. Bosch made her empty her purse. He looked through her things and found an address and phone number written down. It was a temp apartment in Burbank. She admitted that she had put her belongings in storage and was living in the temp, waiting for the trial to be over. I'm going to give you a break, Annabelle, and not hold you in lockup overnight. But I found you this time, and I can find you again. You don't show up tomorrow, and I'll come looking for you. And you'll go right to lockup at Sybil Brand. You understand that? She nodded her head. You're going to be there? She nodded again. I should have never come to you people. Bosch nodded. She was right. It's too late for that, he said. You did the right thing. Now you have to live with it. That's the funny thing about the courts. You decide to be brave and stick your neck out, and they don't let you back down from it. Chapter 21 Art Pepper was on the stereo and Bosch was on the telephone with Janice Langweiser when there was a knock on his screen door. He stepped into the hallway from the kitchen and saw a figure looking in through the mesh. Annoyed by the intrusion of a solicitor, he walked to the door and was about to simply close it without a word when he recognized the visitor as Terry McCaleb. Still on the phone and listening to Langweiser fume about possible witness tampering, he flicked on the outside light, opened the screen door, and signaled McCaleb in. McCaleb made a signal that he would be quiet until Bosch was off the call. Bosch watched him walk through the living room and step out onto the rear deck to look down at the lights of the Coenga Pass. He tried to concentrate on what Langweiser was saying, but he was curious as to why McCaleb would drive all the way up into the hills to see him. Harry, are you listening? Yeah, uh, what was that last part? I said, do you think shootin' hootin' will delay the trial if we open up an investigation? Bosch didn't have to think long to answer that. No way. The show must go on. Yeah, that's what I figure. I'm going to call Roger and see what he wants to do. Anyway, it's the least of our worries. As soon as you mention Alicia Lopez on the stand, there's going to be a brutal fight. I thought we already won that. Houghton ruled. It doesn't mean folks won't try a new attack. We're not clear yet. There was a pause. There hadn't been much confidence in her voice. I guess I'll see you tomorrow, Harry. All right, Janice, I'll see you. Bosch clicked the phone off and put it back at its cradle in the kitchen. When he stepped back out, McCaleb was standing in the living room, looking at the shelves over the stereo, at a framed photograph of Bosch's wife in particular. Terry, what's up? Hey, Harry, sorry to drop in unannounced like this. I didn't have your home number to call first. How'd you find the place? You want a beer or something? Bosch pointed to his chest. Can you have a beer? I can now. Just got clearance, in fact. I can drink again. With moderation. A beer sounds good. Bosch went into the kitchen. McCaleb continued talking from the living room. I've been here before. You don't remember? Bosch came out with two open bottles of anchor steam. He handed one to McCaleb. You need a glass? When were you here? McCaleb took the bottle. Cielo Azul. He took a long pull from the bottle, answering Bosch's question about the glass. Cielo Azul, Bosch thought, and then he remembered. 
They had gotten drunk on the back porch once, both of them dulling the edges of a case that was too terrible to think deeply about with a sober mind. He remembered being embarrassed about it the next day, about how he had lost control and kept rhetorically asking in an alcohol-slowed voice, Where is God's hand? Where is God's hand? Oh, yeah, Barsh said. One of my finer existential moments. Yeah, except the place is different now. The old ones slide down the hill in the quake? Just about. Red tag, the whole bit. Started over from the ground up. Yeah, I didn't recognize it. I drove up here looking for the old place. But then I saw the Shamu and figured there couldn't be another cop in the neighborhood. Bosch thought about the black and white parked in the carport. He hadn't bothered to take it to the station to exchange for his personal car. It would save him time in the morning by allowing him to drive straight to court. The car was a slickback, a black and white without the emergency lights on top. Detectives from the divisions used them as part of a program designed to make it look like there were more cops on the street than there really were. Michaela reached over and clicked Bosch's bottle with his own. To Cielo Azul, he said. Yeah, Bosch said. He drank from the bottle. It was ice cold and good, his first beer since the start of the trial. He decided he would keep it to one, even if McCaleb pressed on. This your ex, McCaleb said, pointing to the photo on the shelves. My wife, not my ex, yet, at least as far as I know, but I guess it's heading that way. Bosch stared at the photo of Eleanor Wish. It was the only picture of her he had. That's too bad, man. Yeah. So what's up, Terry? I've got some stuff I have to go over for. I know, the trial. I'm sorry to intrude, man. I know that's got to be all-consuming. I just had a couple of things on the gun case I wanted to clear up. But I also wanted to tell you something. I mean, show you, too. He pulled his wallet out of his back pocket, opened it, and took out a photo. He handed it to Bosch. The photo had taken on the contour line of the wallet. It showed a dark-haired baby in the arms of a dark-haired woman. That's my daughter, Harry, and my wife. Bosch nodded and studied the photo. Both mother and child had dark hair and skin and were quite beautiful. He knew they were probably even more so to McCaleb. Beautiful he said. The baby looks brand new, so tiny. She's about four months now. That picture's a month old, though. Anyway, I forgot to tell you yesterday at lunch. We named her Cielo Azul. Bosch's eyes came up from the photo to McCaleb's. They held for a moment, and then he nodded. Nice. Yeah. I told Graciela I wanted to do it, and I told her why. She thought it was a good idea. Bosch handed the photo back. I hope someday the kid does, too. Me, too. We call her Cece most of the time. Anyway, remember that night up here? How you kept asking that question about the hand of God and how you couldn't find it in anything anymore? That happened to me, too. I lost it. This kind of job. It's hard not to. Then... He held up the photo. Here it is, right here. I found it again. The hand of God. I see it in her eyes. Bosch looked at him for a long moment and then nodded. Good for you, Terry. I mean, I'm not trying to come off like... I mean, I'm not trying to convert you or anything. I'm just saying I found that thing that was missing. And I don't know if you're still looking for it. I just wanted to say, you know, that it's out there. Don't give up. Bosch glanced away from McCaleb and out the glass doors to the darkness. For some people, I'm sure it is. He drained his bottle and went into the kitchen to break his promise to himself to only have one. He called back to McCaleb to see if he was ready for a second, but his visitor passed. As he bent into the open refrigerator, he paused and closed his eyes as the cool air caressed his face. He thought about what McCaleb had just told him. You don't think you are one of them? 
Bosch jerked up at the sound of McCaleb's voice. He was standing in the kitchen's doorway. What? You said it was out there for some people. You don't think you're one of them? Bosch took a beer out of the refrigerator and slid it into the bottle opener mounted on the wall. He snapped the bottle open and drank deeply from it before answering. What is this, Terry? Twenty questions? You thinking of becoming a priest or something? McCaleb smiled and shook his head. Sorry, Harry. A new father, you know? I guess I want to tell the world, that's all. That's nice. You want to talk about gun now? Sure. Let's go out and look at the night. They walked out to the back deck and both looked at the view. The 101 was its usual ribbon of light, a glowing vein cutting through the mountains. The sky was clear, the smog having been washed out by rain the week before. Bosch could see the lights on the floor of the valley seemingly extending into infinity. Closer to the house, there was only darkness held in the brush on the hillside below. He could smell the eucalyptus from below. It was always strongest after the rain. McCaleb was the first to speak. You've got a nice place here, Harry. Nice spot. You must hate having to ride down into the plague every morning. Bosch looked over at him. Not as long as I get a shot at the carriers every now and then. People like David's story, I don't mind that. And what about the ones who walk away? Like Gunn? Nobody walks away, Terry. If I believed that they did, then I couldn't do this. Sure, we might not get every one of them, but I believe in the circle, the big wheel. What goes around comes around. Eventually. I might not see the hand of God too often like you do, but I believe in that. Bosch put his bottle down on the railing. It was empty, and he wanted another, but knew he had to put on the brakes. He'd need every brain cell he could muster in court the next day. He thought about a cigarette and knew there was a fresh pack in a kitchen cabinet, but he decided to hold off on that, too. Then I guess what happened with Gunn must be a confirmation of your faith in the big wheel theory. Bosch didn't say anything for a long time. He just stared out across the valley of light. Yeah, he finally said, I guess it does. He broke his stare away and turned his back on the view. He leaned against the railing and looked at McCaleb again. So what about Gunn? I thought I told you everything there was to tell yesterday. You've got the file, right? McCaleb nodded. You probably did, and I do have the file. But I was just wondering if anything else came up. You know, if maybe our conversation jump-started your thinking on it. Bosch sort of laughed and picked up the bottle before remembering it was empty. Terry, come on, man. I'm in the middle of a trial. I'm on the stand. I've been chasing down an AWOL wit. I mean, I stopped thinking about your investigation the minute I got up from the table at Cupid's. What exactly do you want from me? Nothing, Harry. I don't want anything from you that you don't have. I just thought it might be worth a shot, is all. I'm working on this thing and scratching around for anything. I thought maybe... Don't worry about it. You're a weird guy, McCaleb. I'm remembering that now. The way you used to stare at crime scene photos. You want another beer? Yeah, why not? Bosch pushed off the railing and reached over for his bottle and then McCaleb's. It was still at least a third full. He put it back down. Well... Finish that. He went into the house and got two more beers out of the refrigerator. This time, McCaleb was standing in the living room when he came back from the kitchen. He handed Bosch his empty bottle, and Bosch wondered for a moment if he had finished it or poured the beer over the side of the deck. He took the empty into the kitchen, and when he came back, McCaleb was standing at the stereo studying a CD case. This what's playing? he asked. Art Pepper meets the rhythm section? Bosch stepped over. Yeah. Art Pepper and Miles' sidemen. Red Garland on piano, Paul Chambers on bass, Philly Joe Jones on drums. Recorded here in L.A., January 19th, 1957. One day. The cork in the neck of Pepper's sax was supposedly cracked, but it didn't matter. He had one shot with these guys. He made the most of it. 
One day, one shot, one classic. That's the way to do it. These guys were in Miles Davis' band? At the time. McCaleb nodded. Bosch leaned close to look at the CD cover in McCaleb's hands. Yeah, Art Pepper, he said. When I was growing up, I never knew who my father was. My mother, she used to have a lot of this guy's records. She hung out at some of the jazz clubs where he'd play. Handsome devil Art was, for a hype. Just look at that picture. Too cool to fool. I made up this whole story about how he was my old man and he wasn't around because he was always on the road and making records. Almost got to the point I believed it. Later on, I mean years later, I read a book about him. It said he was junk sick when they took that picture. He puked as soon as it was over and went back to bed. McCaleb studied the photograph on the CD, a handsome man leaning against a tree, his sax cradled in his right arm. Well, he could play, McCaleb said. Yeah, he could. Bosch agreed. Genius with a needle in his arm. Bosch stepped over and turned the volume up slightly. The song was Straight Life, Pepper's signature composition. Do you believe that? McCaleb asked. What? That he was a genius? Yeah, he was with the sax. No. I mean, do you think that every genius, musician, artist, even a detective, has a fatal flaw like that? The needle in the arm? I think everybody's got a fatal flaw, whether they're a genius or not. Bosch turned it up louder. McCaleb put his beer down on top of one of the floor speakers. Bosch picked it up and handed it back. He used his palm to wipe the wet ring off the wood's surface. McCaleb turned the music down. Come on, Harry, give me something. What are you talking about? I made the journey up here. Give me something on gun. I know you don't care about him. The wheel turned and he didn't walk away. But I don't like the way this one looked. This guy, whoever he is, is still out there. And he's going to do this again. I can tell. Bosch shook his shoulders like he still didn't care. All right, here's something. It's thin, but it might be worth a try. When he was in the tank, the night before he got put down and I checked in on him, I also talked with the Metro guys who brought him in on the deuce. They said they asked him where he'd been drinking, and he said he'd come out of a place called Nats. It's on the boulevard about a block from Musso's and on the south side. Okay, I can find it, McCaleb said, a what about a tone in his voice. What's the connection? Well, see, Nats was the same place he'd been drinking that night six years ago when I first made his acquaintance. It's where he picked up that woman, the one he killed. So he's a regular. Looks it. Thanks, Harry. I'll check it out. How come you didn't tell this to Jay Winston? Bosch shrugged his shoulders. I guess I didn't think about it, and she didn't ask. McCaleb almost put his beer down on the speaker again, but instead handed it to Bosch. I might go check down there tonight. Don't forget. Forget what? You hook the guy who did it. You shake his hand for me. McCaleb didn't respond. He looked around the place as if he had just walked in. Can I use the bathroom? Down the hall, on the left. McCaleb headed that way while Bosch took the bottles into the kitchen and put them in the recycle bin with the others. He opened the refrigerator and saw he was down to one soldier left in the six-pack he'd bought on the way home from tricking Annabelle Crow. He closed the refrigerator when McCaleb stepped into the room. That's a crazy fucking picture you got hanging in the hallway, he said. What? Oh, yeah. I like that picture. What's it supposed to mean? I don't know. I guess it means the big wheel keeps turning. Nobody walks away. McCaleb nodded. I suppose. You heading down there to Nats? Thinking about it, you want to go? Bosch considered it even though he knew it would be foolish. He had to review half of the murder book in preparation for his continuing testimony the next morning. Nah, I better do some work here. Get ready for tomorrow. Okay. How'd it go today, anyway? So far, so good. 
but we're playing softball right now, direct. Tomorrow the ball goes to John Reason, and he throws it back, inside and fast. I'll watch the news. McCaleb stepped over and stuck his hand out. Boss shook it. Be careful out there. You too, Harry. Thanks for the beers. No problem. He walked McCaleb to the door and then watched him get into a black Cherokee parked on the street. It started up right away and pulled away, leaving Bosch standing in the lighted doorway. Bosch locked up and turned off the living room lights. He left the stereo on. It would automatically turn off at the end of Art Pepper's classic moment in time. It was early, but Bosch was tired from the pressures of the day and the alcohol moving in his blood. He decided he would sleep now and wake up early to prepare for his testimony. He went into the kitchen and got the last bottle of beer out of the refrigerator. On the way down the hall to his bedroom, he stopped and looked at the framed picture McCaleb had referred to. It was a print of the Hieronymus Bosch painting called The Garden of Earthly Delights. He'd had it for a long time, since he was a kid. The surface of the print was warped and scratched. It was in bad shape. It had been Eleanor who had moved it from the living room to the hallway. She didn't like it being in the place where they sat every night. Bosch never understood whether that was because of what was in the painting or because the print was old and deteriorated. As he looked at the human landscape of debauchery and torment depicted in the painting, Bosch thought about maybe moving it back to its spot in the living room. In Bosch's dream... He was moving through dark water, unable to see his hands in front of his own face. There was a ringing sound, and he pushed upward through the darkness. He came awake. The light was on, but all was silent. The stereo was off. He started to look at his watch when the phone rang again, and he quickly grabbed it off the bedside table. Yeah? Hey, Harry, it's Kiz, his old partner. Kiz. What's up? You okay? You sound out of it. I'm fine. I was just, I was asleep. He looked at his watch. It was just after ten. Sorry, Harry. I thought you'd be burning the oil, getting ready for tomorrow. I'm going to get up early and do it. Well, you did good today. We had the box on in the squad today. Everybody was pulling for you. I'll bet. How's it going down there? It's going. In a way, I'm starting over. I've got to prove myself to them. Don't worry about it. You'll be passing those guys like they're standing still, just like you did with me. Harry, you're the best. I learn more from you than you'll ever know. Bosch hesitated. He was genuinely touched by what she had said. That's nice of you to say, Kiss. You should call me more often. She laughed. Well... That's not why I'm calling. I told a friend I'd do this. It reminds me of high school, but here goes. There's somebody that's interested in you. I said I'd check to see if you were back out in the field, if you know what I mean. Bosch didn't even have to think before answering. Nah, kids, I'm not. I... I'm not giving up on Eleanor yet. I'm still hoping she'll call or show up, and maybe we can work it out. You know how it is. I do, and that's cool, Harry. I just said I'd ask. But if you change your mind, she's a neat lady. I know her. Yeah, you know her. Jay Winston, over at the Sheriff's. We're in a women's group together. Dicks without dicks. We got to talking about you tonight. Bosch didn't say anything. A strange, constricting feeling filled his gut. He didn't believe in coincidences. Harry! You there? Yeah, I'm here. I was just thinking about something. Well, I'll let you go. And listen, Jay asked me not to give you her name. You know, she just wanted to ask about you and put an anonymous feeler out. So next time you both run across each other on the job, it wouldn't be embarrassing. So you didn't get it from me, right? Right. She asked you questions about me? A few. Nothing big. I hope you don't mind. I told her she made a good choice. I said if I wasn't, you know, the way I was, I'd be interested too. Thanks, Kiss. Bosch said, but his mind was flying. 
Well, look, I'm gonna go. I'll see you. Knock him dead tomorrow, okay? I'll try. She hung up, and Bosch slowly put the phone back in its cradle. The tightening in his gut got more intense. He started thinking about McCaleb's visit and what he had asked and what Harry had said. Now Winston was asking questions about him. He didn't believe it was a coincidence. It was clear to Bosch that they had a bead on him. They were looking at him for the Edward Gunn killing, and he knew he'd probably given McCaleb the right amount of psychological insight to believe he was on the right course. Bosch drained the bottle of beer that was on the nightstand. The last swallow was room temperature and sour. He knew there were no more bottles in the refrigerator. He got up to get a cigarette instead. <laughs>